Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our 10 a.m. public portion of the closed session of the October 8th, 2019 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. In this part of the meeting, the council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the council members will move to the courtyard conference room for closed session. I'd like to ask our clerks to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Crone? Here. Glover? Here. Meyer? Here. Brown? Here. Matthews is currently absent. Uh, Vice Mayor Cummings? Here. And Mayor Watkins? Here. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak to us on our closed session agenda items? Please come forward. And you'll have two minutes. My name's Eric Nelson. I'm an attorney here in town. I uh, represent Deborah Workman. She has submitted a tort claim that I understand you guys are reviewing today. Uh, I'm not here to argue that this was the most egregious police act ever, and I'm not a zealot against the police force. I do conflict work for the county. I believe in government, believe in police, and I understand that they have a job to do, and that's to protect us. In this specific instance, they were called out to Ms. Workman's home because her son had said that she was depressed and had a handgun, and the police went to, the, went to her house. They secured the area, they secured Miss Workman, they determined that there was a firearm in the house and they had her sitting safely on the couch, I mean on the curb. And then uh, they determined they were gonna take her in for 5150 to make sure she was safe. And she was sitting on the curb and they grabbed her and were about to lift her up to handcuff her. And she kind of yelled out, please don't hurt me, I have an injury. And they didn't, they didn't stop to see what was going on. They just grabbed her and twisted her arm. And as it turned out, they broke her arm. And they broke it pretty badly. It was in a cast for a while. She didn't receive immediate treatment because she was in the 5150. But then immediately after getting out of the 5150 hold, she got a cast on her arm through her local physicians. And then they looked, I guess a month later, they opened up, took the cast off. And it turned out she needed surgery. I mean, her arm is really broken. There's video that shows that the police broke it. So at this point, we're not arguing it's the most egregious thing and they beat her and abused her. And I understand they have to be able to handcuff people, but they did break her arm. And she's injured by it and she's gonna be permanently injured by it. Your time is and up. You're, but you're welcome to leave any documentation you'd like with us if you'd like. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. I appreciate thank your time. You. Are there any other members of the community who would like to address us on this? Uh, closed session agenda items. Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and adjourn to our closed session. Well, before we begin our regular council meeting, we need to have the annual meeting of the Board of Directors of the Industrial Development Authority, IDA, and the Santa Cruz Public Improvement Financing Corporation. Corporation. City council members serve as board members on these boards, which were created for the purpose of providing the city an instrument to issue bonds. Annually, while the bonds are in existence, the board members are legally required to hold a meeting of the IDA and the... SCPIFC, which is the Santa Cruz Public Improvement Financing Corporation. The meetings are procedural and for the purpose of approving minutes and electing new board members. Before we begin, I'd like to um, call to order the October 8th, 2019 annual meeting of the Board of Directors of the Industrial Development Authority, and I'd like to ask our clerk to please call the roll. Thank you. Uh, Directors Crone? Here. Glover? Here. Myers? Here. Brown? Here. Matthews? Here. Vice Chief, Fight, Vice Chair Cummings? Here. And Chair Watkins? Here. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item? Okay. I'm now looking for a motion on item number one. I'll move uh, item number one. Okay. Second. We have a motion by Councilmember Myers, seconded by Councilmember Matthews. Um, 
All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. So we'll move on to the second item. And I'm now looking for a motion for the second item to elect new officers of the Industrial Development Authority bylaws as follows. I will move the slate of officers as, as described in the agenda. Okay. Right. So there's a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings. Any further discussion? Any public comment? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. I'd like to call to order <laughs> the next one, which is the um, October 8th, 2019 annual meeting of the Board of Directors of the Santa Cruz Public Improvement Financing Corporation. And I'd like to ask our clerk to please call the roll again. Thank you. Directors Crone. Here. Glover. Here. Myers. Here. Brown. Here. Matthews. Here. Vice Chair Cummings. Here. Chair Watkin. Here. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak to us on this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and see if there's a motion for item number one, which is to approve the minutes of the Santa Cruz Public Improvement Financing Corporation. Okay, motion by Councilmember Brown, seconded by Councilmember Matthews. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That two passes unanimously. I'll go ahead and now if we have the election of officers as presented in our packets. Um, I'll go ahead and see if there's a motion to uh, bring those officers forward. I'll move the uh, election of officers. Okay. Motion by Councilmember uh, Myers, seconded by Councilmember Matthews. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That too passes unanimously. We'll go ahead and adjourn that meeting. Okay. So we're now at our regular meeting. Hey, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our 11.40 a.m. session of the October 8th, 2019 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. And I'd like to ask our clerk to please call the roll again. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Crone. Here. Glover. Here. Myers. Here. Brown. Here. Matthews. Here. Vice Mayor Cummings. Here. And Mayor Watkins. Here. Before we begin, I'd like to let the community know that we will have overflow seating at the Tony Hill Room over at the Civic Auditorium for our 4.30 p.m. meeting agenda. Um, it will be the final agenda item before we have to adjourn by 6.30 p.m. this evening. So if I could ask our clerk to please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Oh, nation. So um, we are at the point of our agenda where we get to meet our new employees. And we have our risk and safety manager, Patty Heyman, who's here to introduce uh, some new employees, I believe. Is Patty here? Yeah, Patty's here. She's waiting. The boy's not here. Okay. Yeah, it's, you're, right. you're a couple of minutes early. The, we're, we're 11, early. 40 starting. Oh, oh, okay. We'll go ahead. Maybe if there are other employees. Oh, okay. So um, when when the new employee that Patty will be introducing arrives, we'll go ahead and have that heard. But if not, and we have the other employees, we'll go ahead and um, invite up our director of libraries, Susan Nimitz, uh, to introduce her new employees. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, we're like, it's not quite we're 11 like three yet. minutes yeah. before 1140. <laughs> so why don't we go ahead and pause for like three minutes until um, we are letting our new employees in. <laughs> This is like yeah. unusual. Yeah, because it, yeah. it's, it's a Genesis 1140. Okay, perfect. So technically we're at 1139 right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're good? We have, okay. We're in, all in, okay. And I think we're right here, yep, we're, seconds away from hitting 1140. <laughs> so um, it looks like maybe we have, is uh, Patty uh, ready with her new employee here? Okay, why don't we go ahead and Patty come on up and we'll go ahead and introduce uh, your new employee, please. Oh, of course. Hi. <laughs> Thank you, sorry. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Annie Martin, who is finance's new accounting assistant too. 
Annie's a longtime local. She was born and reared in San Jose. It's called Santa Cruz Home for many years. She enjoys frequent walks on West Clifton and Henry Cowell and likes to travel to Hawaii. Um, we'd also like to note that she's a huge Cher fan. Uh, before coming to work for the city, Annie worked for the city of Mountain View and for several years had her own business, which was a pet store in San Jose. She's been working in finance as a temp during this last year and we are delighted to now have her in the accounting assistant position. Wonderful. Well, welcome. Welcome. Annie. welcome. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Welcome, Annie. Um, I'll go ahead and see if we have Susan Nimitz here for libraries to introduce her new employees. What a beautiful day. Um, hi, I'm Susan Nimitz. I'm the director of the Santa Cruz Public Libraries. And I have the honor of welcoming Riley Garduno and Kyle Plasse. Where's Riley? Oh, um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure you're aware, but the library relies really heavily on using a lot of temporary employees. And I think these are both great examples of people who've worked in the library for a while and now are going into permanent <coughs> employment. And we're really happy to give them this uh, long-term opportunity. They've both proven to be great. Riley has been here a while and has been doing some amazing things working at Capitola. He worked um, on our jail programs, um, which we're very grateful for. He's worked with children's programs, um, and now he's being hired permanently for a position in the to-be-opened Capitola Library. So we're really excited to have him. And Kyle grew up in Sacramento and has been working for the State Controller's Office, um, working in the legal department, a law library. And about two years ago, started working for us um, part-time too and is moving into a permanent position in the library. And we're just really grateful to be able to attract um, such amazing young people and keep them. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, here, here, great, thank you, welcome. Welcome, Riley and Kyle. I'll go ahead and see if our parks um, director is here, Tony Elliott, to come on up and introduce uh, his new employee. All right, good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. It's my honor to introduce Lindsay Bass. Uh, excuse me. Lindsay is our new principal management analyst. Uh, for Parks and Recreation, so she's a key uh, key player, a key leadership uh, member of the Parks and Recreation team. In fact, her first day, um, she very eagerly jumped in and drafted a council agenda report uh, that you all read, so uh, her first day she sprung right into action. Uh, Lindsay uh, came to Santa Cruz, uh, originally from Indiana, uh, for UCSC to study marine sciences. Uh, she worked at UCSC for 10 years um, as a project manager um, in, in IT and on strategic planning. Uh, she worked at the World Wildlife Fund for 10 years uh, in corporate water stewardship. Uh, and she worked on six different continents, so we're glad to have her uh, here now uh, settled in, in Santa Cruz. Uh, Lindsay's husband's name is John. They have two dogs. She is an avid uh, open water ocean swimmer. Um, so yeah, that's really it. Um, you can find Lindsay across the street, uh, 323 Church Street at the Parks and Rec HQ. So please join me in welcoming Lindsay. Welcome, Lindsay. Wonderful, welcome Lindsay. And last but certainly not least, we'll invite up Mark Dettel of Public Works to introduce his new employee. Afternoon, almost afternoon, um, Mayor and members of the council. It's my pleasure to introduce Abel Campos. He's our new service maintenance worker for the Streets Department. Um, he was uh, born and he grew up in Colima, Mexico, currently lives in Soquel. He, he has a wife, uh, four boys, and a girl and a dog. Just keeps him busy when he's not working. Um, past experience, he's, he worked with Ralston Concrete for five years, so we really appreciate the concrete experience. And when he's not working or spending time with his, his kids, he plays soccer, so that's his interest. So please join me in welcoming Abel. Welcome, Welcome Abel. 
So I have a brief announcement. The Public Works Department and the Transportation of Public Works Commission invites the community to a project open house on Monday, October 21st from 5.30 to 7 p.m. in Galt Elementary School's multi-purpose room. This special meeting of the commission offers an opportunity for the community to dialogue with commissioners and public works staff on 10 projects, including the Murray Street Bridge seismic retrofit, state mandated food waste collection, and much more. All the details are at thecityofsantacruz.com <laughs> and we hope to see you all there. The city is also proud to be a sponsor of Open Streets, which takes place on a car-free West Cliff, Cliff Drive, Sunday, October 13th. We're going to have five different city booths there. Um, Resilient Coast Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz Public Libraries, Parks and Rec, Santa Cruz Police Department, and Street Smarts. And if you're able to get your passport stamped at all five of our tables, you'll be eligible for a raffle ticket with a chance to win an adult hybrid bicycle and youth bicycle. So details are on the city's website and we hope that you and your family will enjoy this once a year opportunity to walk, bike and play on West Cliff Drive, free from vehicle traffic. I have one other um, announcement that I'd like to um, take an opportunity at this time to have. And so um, for those who don't know, the Diversity Center of Santa Cruz is celebrating their 30th anniversary on October 12th. And I know we have Sharon Popo here from the, uh, the Diversity Center. And while we won't be doing a formal presentation, I will just like to do an to have an opportunity to share the proclamation with her and invite her up, um, although it's not formally agendized. Is Sharon here? Oh, good. Three board oh, and three of your board members. Wonderful. Well, welcome, welcome up. Thank you for uh, being flexible here today. So um, I, uh, I'm happy if you'd like to introduce yourself and the board members, then I'll go ahead and, and, and give you the proclamation. Sharon Papo, Executive Director. Mark Samet, Board President. Angel Cruz, Board Member. On Indra, treasurer. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being here. It's really an honor to have this opportunity just briefly today to be able to present the proclamation. I'd like to just read a little bit of it and then I'll come down and hand it to you if that feels appropriate. Okay. So whereas the Diversity Center was founded in 1989 as the Santa Cruz Lesbian and Gay Community Center to advance the causes and priorities of the lesbian and gay community in Santa Cruz County. And whereas the Diversity Center's mission is to advocate for, to support, and to celebrate the LGBTQ plus community. And whereas the Diversity Center thrives uh, to th and thanks to the generosity of hundreds of volunteers and donors who give their money and their time to help support the programs and the services offered. And whereas during its tenure, the Diversity Center has received countless awards and accolades. And whereas on Saturday, October 12th, 2019, the diversity is celebrating 30 years of their services to our community. So it's my pleasure as mayor of the city of Santa Cruz to hereby proclaim Saturday, October 12th, 2019 as the Diversity Center Day. And I encourage all citizens to join me in con congratulating it on its 30th anniversary and expressing our heartfelt appreciation for the numerous contributions to the Santa Cruz community.
I'm glad we were able to make that happen today. So um, we'll go ahead and move on to our presentations. And we have a, a presentation of a 25 year service print pen <coughs> and it's a recognition. Mm -hmm. And I'll go ahead and invite up Rosemary Menard to go ahead and take us there. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here in front of you today to recognize Chris Berry for 25 years of exemplary service to the city of Santa Cruz. Chris started at the water department in October 94 as an entry level temporary, this sort of story you hear all the time, <coughs> uh, water quality lab assistant. And 25 years later, he now manages some of the most potentially impactful programs for our community and for the department. Currently holding the watershed compliance manager position that oversees Loch Lomond Recreation Area, all of the department's land holdings, and our water rights, endangered species, and environmental compliance programs. He also is 100% committed to the department's mission of delivering clean, reliable water to our um, 100,000 customers. And there are times when these two sort of uh, issues have some tension between them. And he has uh, shown us every day how we can work together and with the community and regulators and other water agency partners to accomplish um, both goals, the environmental compliance and resource stewardship as well as water supply. <clears throat> In addition to his day job of ensuring active stewardship of our water resources and environmental resources, <coughs> uh, Chris sits on a number of local volunteer boards and commissions including the County Water Commission, Fish and Wildlife Commission, local fire safe council, and has also served as a member of the Gavilan College's Water Resources Management Advisory Committee. Last, as if uh, he had any time left over, um, he's, he is uh, able to make time to shred at Steamers Lane, backpack the Pacific Northwest Trail and other um, sort of areas in our state and out of state and to attend <coughs> any Grateful Dead uh, con tribute concert that he can think of. And before I present his pin, I'd like to ask uh, another sort of really exemplary water resources leader in our community and our state to come and make a few comments and then I'll present the pin. John Laird. Madam Mayor and Council Members, my name's John Laird. I'm a pensioner from Santa Cruz. <laughs> and, and, and if you haven't cleaned up the graffiti, uh, I've written my name in at least five of your drawers. <laughs> um, I, it was very important for me to be here to honor Chris today. I, in my role as Secretary for Natural Resources, I crossed the state going to watershed conferences, fish conferences, and frequently I would run into Chris. Uh, because he was representing the interests of the city and making sure he was up to speed on money that was avail available, laws that might be enforced against the city, making sure that that, that tension that Roseberry mentioned between sort of water supply and watershed restoration and protection were things that could be managed. And he made relationships in the different departments. He made relationships with different people around the uh, uh, state. It's something you might not have seen, but he represented the city really well and really ably in doing that. And the other thing to just mention is that these days, it is not totally popular to be a public employee. Uh, and, and it is not something that is widely recognized. And yet, when people spend 25 years looking out for the interest of the people of Santa Cruz, just making sure that while other people are doing other things, they're watching the store, they're making sure things happen, uh, it is some of the finest public service that goes on. And he is one of those people that is just an exemplary public servant. So it's very important for me to come here today and recognize him because you've been getting great service and he deserves the recognition for 25 good years. Thank you. I'd like to call Chris up, but before I do that, I'd like to ask those people in the audience who might be here to also send their good wishes to him on this uh, good occasion to maybe just stand. Okay. People in the back. So we have a, um, as Chris, Chris has had Chris has had a really strong, amazing effect on our community, and it's my honor to present him with his 25-year pin.
Thanks everyone. I am totally unprepared and overwhelmed. <laughs> um, coming from a long line of public servants, I've just felt honored to be able to serve the city. I, I'll just tell you, I was homeless in Santa Cruz. Um, I was a grad student. I was living in my van out at Steamer Lane. I pursued that lifestyle in order to develop, to put down roots here, um, to be able to surf the lane and have a job in a city I love doing what I studied to do. So I feel like uh, it's been a long and windy road, but I, I am blessed and grateful. And uh, I've seen the city go through a lot of changes. And I, I, this morning I was thinking, what happens if I get asked to say something? <laughs> um, so I thought, well, you know, I've seen uh, the, the city is faced with great peril and great promise. And I hope that uh, understanding that you all will proceed in that spirit, understanding that while the whole world faces great peril right now, we do have promise ahead of us. And these in seemingly insurmountable challenges and tension can be worked through if we work together and we work hard and we maintain a long-term commitment to our people, the people that we serve. So anyway, thank you. you move on, Chris, uh, we'll go ahead and see if, uh, I know a couple of the council members wanted to say a, a brief word, sorry. You're not quite done yet, uh, Chris. <laughs> um, but I'll just, I'll just start by saying thank you so much for your 25 years of service. I don't think you could have said it, you said it perfectly, that it is a commitment and we're here to serve our people and we're really lucky to have had you and to have you in our community for these past 25 years. I enjoyed our time together at the Sechi Dip, that was nice. <laughs> oh. And um, and I know Councilmember Myers also wanted to say a few I words. Thanks so wanted, much, Mayor. Yeah. Uh, Chris, you and I, I think, met right after you started working for the city, so we've been long time colleagues, but most importantly, longtime friends. And I just wanted to congratulate you. You've brought a tremendous commitment to our um, watersheds and maintaining our native fish and wildlife. And uh, I've spent many hours sloshing around in creeks with you. And um, I don't think I know anyone that meets your commitment to really trying to meet both the goals of providing water for people and water for fish. So thanks, and frogs. So thanks for everything you do. <laughs> well, thank you. And I know Councilmember Brown also had something. Yeah, I would just really quickly say, uh, add my congratulations and say that I have been so amazed at your ability to navigate the challenging regulatory environment. Um, but what really struck me was the day that we went out on tour and uh, just to be out with you in the watershed and kind of how excited and enthused you are about being out there and, and your understanding of the watershed ecology and habitat and commitment to its protection. So thank you for thank everything. You. Thank you very much, thank you. Thank you all for your hard work. Right, and thanks to the supporters for being here as well. Um, so I have a few announcements before we get uh, on with the regular agenda. Um, so today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television <coughs> channel 25 and is streaming on the city's website at cityofsantacruz.com. Our rules of decorum are on the windowsill um, to my left, and it's my job to keep the meeting running without disruption, and we ask that you respect your fellow citizens when you are inside and outside of our council chambers. Um, I'd like to ask now if there are any council members who have a statement of disqualification today. Okay, seeing none. I'll go ahead and see if our city clerk administrator has any additions mm -hmm. or deletions to the agenda. No, we don't. Okay, seeing none. I have a brief announcement about oral communications. So oral communications is an opportunity for the members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda. Oral communications will occur immediately following this afternoon's agenda items and will end no later than 6.30 p.m. in observance of Yom Kippur um, per our council policy 14.6. I'll go ahead and turn it over to our city attorney at this time to provide a report on closed session. Thank you, Mayor Watkins, members of the city council. 
Uh, this morning, the council convened in the courtyard conference room at 10 a.m. to consider the following items. <coughs> Item A was liability claims. Um, first claim was of Ruth and Michael Mayer. Second claim was of Deborah L. Workman. Uh, those items are also listed on your consent calendar this afternoon as uh, agenda item five. There were two items of pending litigation. Uh, the council received a report from and gave direction to the city attorney uh, on those items. First is the case of Robert Gomez Sr. and Robert Gomez Jr. versus the city and county of Santa Cruz. Second item is Save Our Big Trees versus the city of Santa Cruz. Um, there was no reportable action on those items. I will note for the record, however, that council member Crone recused, recused himself from the Save Our Big Trees uh, item and was not present for that portion of the discussion. There's one item of uh, initiation of litigation. In that item, uh, the city council uh, unanimously voted to join a, a coalition of cities and counties in petitions, uh, in opposing petitions filed in late August by the Wireless Industry Association before the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, the petitions that the Wireless Industry Association filed seek to alter the 2014 infrastructure order, uh, which is an uh, FCC regulation that interprets key terms of the Federal Telecommunications Act. Um, the petitions filed by the industry would further erode the, the ability of cities and other local government agencies to regulate the placement of wireless telecommunications facilities in our community. And on that basis, the council um, voted to uh, join in that effort. Um, it's a regulatory proceeding before the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, lastly, there was one item of real property negotiations and the council received a report from uh, its uh, real property negotiator uh, which is the uh, executive director of the Economic Development Department uh, concerning the property at 125 Coral Street. Owners James P. Gillespie and uh, Jean Gillespie, trustees, <coughs> and Harley F. and Sandra I. Gillespie, co-trustees. Uh, there's no reportable action on that item. Thank you, Mr. Condotti. We'll go ahead and turn it over to our city manager for his report. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just wanted to do a brief uh, update on some happenings this month of October. Start with, uh, let's see, the major uh, activities that are happening around the earthquake. Uh, this year marks the 30th uh, anniversary of, our, of the earthquake, which is a 7.1 quake that struck at 5.04 on October 17th of 1989, and essentially you know, really changed the course of history for the city of Santa Cruz in, in many ways. And uh, of course, many, many members of the community, employees and others have dedicated a lot of work and efforts to re rebuilding the city, um, which has largely been uh, rebuilt. Uh, I think the last the hole is still under construction, but almost completed. Um, and so throughout the month of October, the city has partnered with several groups and organizations to present a wide range of local events, exhibits, displays and discussions to mark the 30th anniversary. Uh, one of the featured uh, events will be happening this Sunday, October 13th from 12 to 4, where our fire department will be hosting an emergency preparedness and safety event here at the Civic Auditorium. Uh, several resource booths and historical photos will be available to the public. Um, and then uh, I believe the fire department's gonna do a presentation on that at the next meeting as well. Uh, and then with respect to um, uh, another item that's going to be happening with respect to the earthquake is uh, uh, our long-term long long-term uh, economic uh, development and redevelopment manager Joe Hall has shared a collection of photos taken from October 18, 1989, uh, the morning after the earthquake, uh, through December of 1996. He has this uh, collection of photos, and they are dedicated to the residents of the city of Santa Cruz uh, and participants in the Vision Santa Cruz process, and city staff members who worked. Uh, to ensure Santa Cruz emerge from the earthquake as a vibrant and prosperous community. The uh, full, full list of events is uh, available on the city's webpage, so just go to webpage and just uh, uh, on the search page type earthquake and you'll get the full list of, of, of uh, events that are happening. Also this month is um, October is Affordable Housing Month and our Economic Development Department has put together a series of events 
uh, to answer some questions and to provide information about how affordable housing in our community. Uh, the events include an affordable housing finance class and an affordable housing bike tour, well, which, which will conclude at the grand opening of the Water Street Apartments, which are currently under construction and they look very, very, very nice. Um, and here are some of the details around that. So um, like I said, Monday, October 21st from 6 to a.m. is the class and uh, it includes uh, looking at the factors that need to be considered when developing affordable housing, how does financing work, uh, space is limited to 50 participants, so you could RSVP on Eventbrite to reserve your spot. Uh, the bike tour is Saturday, October 19th from 1 to 3, uh, and it will go around looking at a variety of affordable housing apartments in the downtown, uh, and it will highlight some of the most recently built properties uh, and give you a preview of those that are on, in the horizon because there are some major projects that are, we're working on, particularly in downtown to provide additional affordable housing units. Uh, space is limited, so you can RSVP to Jessica uh, Miller over at the uh, Economic Development Department to reserve your spot. And then with respect to the grand opening at the, the Water Street Apartments, uh, that's Saturday, October 19th from three to four, and you can join the developer uh, the future of housing, uh, for, for the future of housing at the grand opening. It's at 708 Water Street and take a tour of the grounds and see the apartments inside. Again, they look very, very nice. Uh, and you can uh, RSVP to communications at eahhousing.org to confirm your attendance. So if you have any questions, you can also reach out to the Economic Development Department and they can give you all the information and details as well. And then finally, uh, the other th the happenings uh, are this, this <coughs> month relate to our Go Santa Cruz program, which uh, on October 4, 1st launched the expanded Go Santa Cruz program. Uh, based on the council's approval to expand uh, funding for a variety of alternative uh, programs, uh, alternative transportation programs. And there are a number of uh, incentives to help downtown employees choose options rather than driving to get to work. Uh, these includes free transit passes, which are being distributed, free bike locker cards, preloaded with uh, $20, discounted jump uh, bike memberships, uh, carpool incentives, commute information, and carpool ride matching as well as bike safety training. So the, <clears throat> this will all be kicking off uh, this month uh, with uh, uh, a variety of, of, of events and uh, presentations throughout the, the downtown and, and the community. Um, so that's, there's a lot more things going on, but these are some, some of the highlights for this month that I just wanted to present. Great, thank you for that. Okay, wonderful. So we'll go ahead now and move on to uh, the meeting calendar, which is attached to ag the agenda. And I'll look to our city clerk to see if we have any changes to that. We have no addition. Okay. okay, so we're moving right along to our consent agenda. Um, and that's items number three through 14 on our agenda. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who are interested in pulling an item today? Council Member Grant. I don't want to pull an item. I just want to make a comment on item number eight. Okay. Council Member Glover. Is there a question on number 10? Okay. I have a comment on 10. Okay, Council Member Matthews, comment on 10. Okay. So we'll go ahead and um, see if we want to uh, go ahead and have Council Member Crone speak to item number eight and then we'll move on to item number 10 and then we'll look to the community and make a motion. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just want to say this is executive uh, employees compensation and um, for the record, I am voting no on this item because I believe we could have handled this in a better way. I support our department heads. I converse with most quite often on issues of city business. I find their counsel quite useful informed and at times erudite. Knowing this, knowing that there is great need in our city and with needs outstripping resources, my approach this year with respect to salary negotiations was to channel the most city resources to the lowest paid employees. I only have the most respect for our department heads, but the resources to raise those at the bottom have to come from somewhere. And it makes sense to me given our budget constraints and also after consulting with numerous community members that those at the top might better be able, to be able to weather the difficulties of the Santa Cruz cost of living. This is why I stand by my decision to vote no at this time on an executive pay raise, although my vote could change in the future depending upon the economic fortunes of our city. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. 
Okay, so we'll go ahead and log that as a no vote for eight. Okay, for Council Member Cohn. Vice Mayor, did you have a comment? Okay, any other comments? Okay, we'll go ahead and move on to item number 10. And there was a comment by Councilmember Glover and then by Councilmember Matthews. Thank you. Um, so just there were some, as a more question, there were some community members that had contacted and were curious about the differences because in the language it's a friendship city. So just wondering if there was someone that could uh, clarify the difference between a friendship city and a sister city for anyone watching on TV or? Or it looks like our city clerk can maybe speak yeah. to that. Only because we had the, I had the question also, a friendship city, you're a friendship city for two years, and then you then move on to be a sister city. Okay. And what's the benefit of it, if any? I, I can okay. maybe speak to it a bit. Okay, Councilmember Matthews. Um, friendship city is kind of a probationary exploratory process. A sister city relationship is intended as a more long-term continuous process. And we, before you go, does that answer your question? Or did you have additional questions? Uh, it was just um, with regards to just uh, if people could hear how sister cities and friendship cities are chosen. Um, I think we might have to have our um, commission come back and speak to that at a certain point and to hum, uh, beyond what they described here in our agenda report. Okay. Okay, Council Member Matthews and then Council Member Vice Mayor Cumming. Or did you wanna speak to that city clerk? Did you have a response? I think there was something in your agenda packet there is, that I'll speak to that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Councilmember Matthews. Yeah, we do have in our packet. It starts at page 10.17, the Santa Cruz <coughs> Friendship and Sister City Adoption Policy, and um, it's it's a fairly detailed um, process, and it's very much uh, volunteer and community driven. So, I would just suggest for details, talk to the staff and learn more about the background on that. Um, I did look at this and noticed that it's somewhat out of date. I talked to staff, so I'm not springing any surprise on them. So um, a couple of the um, uh, friendship cities have expired and are not being pursued. Um, another of our named sister cities is inactive. And there, um, the committee went through quite a process, I'm gonna say plus or minus five years ago in developing this, just how to keep the, the various relationships fresh and um, provide a mechanism for new ones. And so uh, I'm quite happy to support the recommendation, but I would ask that the, that the Sister Cities Committee um, update their, their policy, re refresh it. Okay, so we'll go ahead and add that as potential direction association. Or it can just be casual, we've talked. Okay, yeah. consensus upon consensus. Councilmember, uh, We'll, we'll go ahead and have, did you have additional questions? Oh, it was just one, it was just more of a comment but followed along with that line of, qu of questions was just to make sure that as we're uh, moving forward with identifying additional friendship and sister cities, just being conscious and, and intentional with regards to emphasizing the diversity of engagement and the diversity of location. Um, one of the concerns that I heard from different community members was a severe lack of black and brown cities incorporated in the sister cities programs, so uh, as well as friendship cities. So just something to look into and I would encourage the sister cities commission or the, the those involved with the selection process, uh, I'll, I'll definitely reach out to them, but also to be cognizant of that uh, when making decisions and exploring potential friendship in sister cities. Okay, Vice Mayor Cummings and then one more, one more comment by Councilor Matthews and we're gonna open it up. And I just had a brief comment because similarly learning that some of the relationships that we have with certain sister cities already on the books aren't being maintained as much. I was kind of curious why we were bringing a new sister city on board because I know there are costs associated with that. And then similarly, I know that there's been folks who have expressed potentially having a sister city relationship with Oaxaca, Mexico or other places in Latin America where we have people from our population who are representative. And so just trying to understand, you know, kind of a little bit more what goes into this process and seeing if we can, you know, um, make sure that when we establish these relationships, we're maintaining them. And if there are new ones that we need to explore, we can do that. And if there's ones that we need to maybe not maintain anymore for a variety of reasons, then we can look into that as well. Yeah. Great. Councilmember Matthews, then we're gonna go ahead. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, uh, I'll just say the committee itself is very well aware of that. All of these sister cities have been formed based on different relationships over time. Um, the, in order to be active, they do have to be maintained on both sides. So if that doesn't happen, then they become, they expire. Um, I will say I felt, very, I've been quite involved with the sister city program for years. Um, it is very much volunteer driven. We don't have the staff's time to support it actively with staff. And so um, we really have to, I think, 
um, not have an abundance of enthusiasm in adding sister cities that we can't maintain over a period of time. The whole idea is to have this be an ongoing relationship. And uh, over the years, there have been many people come forward, oh, I want a sister city in China, I want a sister city in India, I want a sister city here, there. So I think we should be open to new ones, but also um, really do a good job on the ones we have. I, I agree with the point you've raised. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Is there any member of the community who wants to address the council on our consent agenda? This is items number three through 14. Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and return it back to council for action. Anybody want to move the consent move. agenda? Okay. Um, I move the consent agenda. I'll, I'll second that. So vice mayor move consent agenda, seconded by myself, logged no vote on item number eight by council member Crone, further com comment and uh, direction on item number 10. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. So we're gonna go ahead and move right along here to our general business item. And first on um, the agenda is item number 15. And that item is the resolution declaring October co-op month in the city of Santa Cruz and providing city support for development and growth of local work worker cooperatives. And the process is uh, general for general business items to have a presentation by either council members or staff, um, then opening it up for questions amongst the council, public comment, and then returning back for um, action. So we'll go ahead and see if the council members who brought this forward want to introduce the item. And we have, I see here, Economic Development Director, who I'm assuming worked with you on the item. So council member Matthews? Maybe I'll just say on behalf of all of us, uh, it was a really enjoyable process working with the community group. Um, they're coming to us with a concern, learning what services the city already has for small and encouraging small local businesses, working with our department. It was thoroughly enjoyable. <laughs> so I think with that comment, we'll just turn it over. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Did you have something yeah. you wanted to add? I would just add, and I look forward to this being a first step in an ongoing uh, relationship and, and work together with Co-op Santa Cruz and other organizations. Thanks for bringing it forward and welcome Bonnie. Thanks, Bonnie Lipscomb, Director of Economic Development. And I'm just gonna add a couple of brief comments. Um, we've met a couple times with Co-op Santa Cruz. Um, they've been great meetings. Um, I think we're all on the same page and we support um, the concept of worker cooperatives in Santa Cruz. So I, we were all aligned. So I'm excited to be part of this. I think my, you know, my team's excited for um, so these recommendations today. And with that, I'd like to actually turn it over um, to Faz from Co-op Santa Cruz, who has a brief presentation. Great, welcome, Faz. Faz, I know that you um, originally wanted some more additional time. We're ahead of schedule. If you want to take the, you know, up to eight, eight minutes, 10 minutes, you're welcome to do that. Um, yeah, I think for the second time, I can keep it brief. Um, oh. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I appreciate it. No Thanks. problem, yeah. We have a tight meeting today that we have to get through yeah. by time <laughs> certain, so. All right, hello council members. Uh, yeah, you probably know me by now. Uh, my name is Faz. Um, I really appreciate the, um, the reception from council members, um, the positive reception from, uh, from Bonnie, from the economic development department. Um, and uh, you know, Co-op Santa Cruz, we've been around, we've been active for about a year, year and a half now. Um, and so we've decided that maybe it's time to pursue a uh, potential long-term partnership with the city in developing our workforce of the future. Um, so I really appreciate um, your, uh, your, converse, your conversation around this issue and moving forward with it, so thank you. Um, so I'll just go ahead and start talking. I mean, you know, a lot of y'all probably already know. Um, I think this is also in part for the community as well, for folks watching. We wanna um, kinda just go over this real quick. Um, so basically, um, yeah, so what we're introducing is a resolution. Um, we feel like in a, in a time right now in our country where, you know, we're almost heading towards a recession, right? Working class people have to work longer jobs, lower wages, right? Um, wealth inequality is, is ramping up at, more t at, at, more, at a higher, higher point than any time in his recent history, right? So I think that worker, co we feel like worker cooperatives, you know, as Co-op Santa Cruz, is, is one of the many solutions that we can do towards, um, towards closing the, the inequality gap um, in our community. So um, the National Coalition of Cooperatives uh, is kind of, um, you know, uh, 
unofficially declared October Cooperative Month, but we really want to have that in paper and really make that a trend moving forward. So um, we are pushing to have it as Worker Cooperative Month, and there's about 140 million uh, employees across the country who are worker who are doing worker cooperatives. Um, we'd say the highest density of worker cooperatives is probably in Spain, and um, so we hope to get to that level at some point in the future. So. Um, so some of y'all may have heard about the silver tsunami. Um, I'm not, probably Bonnie, I imagine may touch on it again, but um, you know, in Santa Cruz County, right, we have 24, um, 2,410 business owner, uh, businesses owned by baby boomers. That's a statistic from the project, from Project Equity. Um, and so 17,360 employees are covered under that. Um, but I think the, the, the big challenge, right, with the silver tsunami is the idea is that you know, baby boomers who do know businesses are, um, you know, and eventually at some point will retire, right? Whether it's now or whether it's later. But the idea is that we wanna make sure that they have a succession plan, right? Because we've seen a lot of corporations kind of pop up in Santa Cruz and a lot of local businesses, unfortunately, struggling. I know that's one of the things we pride ourselves in Santa Cruz is being able to, you know, um, to support our local businesses, right? And we wanna be able to maintain them. So I think it's really, we feel like it's really important that those business owners have a succession plan, but over 85% of those owners lack a succession plan, right? Uh, we wanna keep those jobs local. We wanna, you know, cause local jobs, you know, ultimately contribute to the local economy more than, um, more than corporations who, you know, their money goes out of town and all that stuff, so. Um, so yeah, so we wanna make sure we can keep locally owned uh, businesses and retain that her those heritage businesses that we all value, right? Um, one, of the th one of the suggestions, right, is by transitioning to employee ownership, so we hope that moving forward, right, not just in this resolution and future ordinance, but moving forward that we can kind of support our community in being able to do that. A lot of local businesses have actually approached us um, wanting to figure out a way of how they can transition their business into worker cooperatives, but they lack the resources, um, they lack the technical assistance, and there are some community groups that are doing work, but we feel like it's really important that the city get involved in this process, given the resources that you have, the staff that you have, um, and it sounds like there's already some buy-in, which we're really thankful for, but we really wanna be able to help those businesses in whatever way we can by transitioning them into worker ownership. Um, and so, you know, local businesses contributing three times more money back into the local economy um, than national chains. Um, so we feel like that's really important. Um, there was a uh, federal bill, which was really great. It was, was actually a bipartisan bill. Um, this was introduced in the House of Representatives and ended up passing, which um, would expand opportunities for employee-owned businesses um, through loans and through other services as well. Um, so some of the things, right, financing transition of existing businesses to worker ownership, training, education, <laughs> tracking, right, all the things that a lot of local businesses really need. Um, and one of the things that we, we did kind of outline some of these stuff in the resolution. Um, there are some other things that we were proposing. It looks like kind of at this moment, you know, staff is not really exploring that right now, which we understand. We hope that we can have ongoing conversations about some of those things. But, you know, some of the things that I think we, we, we think would be really great to start off, right, is providing those business tax and land use incentives, right? A lot of local business owners that we talk to, not even worker cooperatives, just local businesses, struggle with being able to afford to, to rent in Santa Cruz in terms of their business, right? Not just in terms of living here, but being able to continue paying the commercial rent that a lot of corporations have absolutely no challenge doing. Um, so the tax use, bu uh, business tax, land use incentives are, would be really great effective city tools. Services and technical assistance, right, are really huge. People, you know, business owners cannot really think about like, how do we technically do that? Where we put in the ownership, you know, how is the filing work, right? There's a lot of technical challenges that exist and we hope that the city can um, kind of support and move forward with that. Education and awareness, you know, um, not a lot, this is a growing movement, right? Um, but not a whole lot of folks know what worker cooperatives are and know kind of what they look like or what the benefits of what it could be. Education and awareness are a very easy thing that the city could do um, in, in collaboration with the community. Um, and then grants, um, you know, it costs a lot of money to start a business, let alone a worker-owned business, right? And learning how to navigate that and all that stuff is really, um, it can be a challenge, but I think funding, having um, some sort of funding source, whether it be fully funded from the city or whether it be a collaboration with local community groups is something that we hope um, the city can explore moving forward. Um, as I mentioned before, there are some local groups that do the, do, do this kind of work. So Santa Cruz Community Ventures, um, some of y'all may have heard about it. Um, they do some work with cooperatives and providing that technical assistance. Uh, Project Equity, which is like a national nonprofit, they specialize a lot in, um, in that, uh, when we were talking about business conversion, converting local business uh, businesses into employee ownership. 
um, Democracy at Work Institute, which is kind of this national uh, nonprofit that's doing this kind of work. Um, Sustainable Economies Law Center, which actually worked with the cities of Berkeley and Oakland to pass similar resolutions like this and working with them and their city staff to um, kind of develop ongoing support. Um, the Hub for Sustainable Living, um, there's you know some folks there who are, they're worker cooperatives, right? They're, they're looking to develop and be able to expand. Um, and then the, of course the county, right? The county is always a uh, county and city partnership, something like that would be really great. Um, exploring that, um, the, the Workforce Development Board. And we actually have a member of Co-op Santa Cruz who is involved with the county, so there's a really great connection there. Um, and of course, the city of Santa Cruz moving forward. So we hope that we can build that ongoing relationship and do really cool stuff like this moving forward. Um, so yeah, so I think with all these groups, you know, we're, we are, there are community groups doing work, Co-op Santa Cruz, we're doing advocacy work, right? But I think that this is a really great first step. We're really thankful for the city for, um, working with us on this and we're really excited about it. This is a great first step. I'm not sure if y'all understand how historic this is, right? But this is the beginning of a potential long-term partnership and being able to really transition our economy to a more democratically owned, democratically operated society. So uh, we're really thankful that the city has uh, taken this up and um, thank you. Thank you. So. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So unless we have any questions, I'll go ahead and open it up to public comment at this time. Any members of the community want to address us on this item, please come, in, come forward and you'll have up to two minutes. Okay, Garrett Phillips, Santa Cruz. Once again, I see the council is preoccupied with yet another resolution that is too far left of American values. The litany of whereas's justifications are just statements which give no credible evidence, such as stating worker-owned cooperatives are more efficient than other kinds of businesses. Really, it reads like you're just making that stuff up. You assign no fisc fiscal impact to the directives, but the staff time and certainly the development of expansion of a grant loan program or other related resources is a cost. I would love the idea if the council intends to make it easier to start a business in Santa Cruz generally, but if the council wants to put its considerable big toe in the water to prioritize collectives over non-collective business entities, it has fallen in and off the mainland drifting leftwards. It is similar to the often heard unequal praises of unions, labor, and numerous resolutions favoring globalist ideas I've heard here. I want you to hear one thing, and this one thing very clearly, membership in a collective is always voluntary in the United States. It better be. Collectives have advantages and disadvantages. Personally own a condo and an association with amenities I would never have been able to afford. I pay a price though by losing my control or decisions made or liabilities assumed. It is the same with unions. Uh, these worker-owned businesses would be the same and I doubt ownership or control would ever really be equal as if that really means anything anyway in a country based on individual liberty. The government should always neutrally stay out of the business of taking sides, favoring collectives over individuals, partnerships, and corporations, <coughs> but encourage instead prosperity, a word I never have heard here. Therefore, including <coughs> worker cooperatives and the city's local preference policy for city contracts and procurement of goods and services, it quite explicitly would now favor such over other forms of business, tilting this voluntary mechanism at a public cost. This is quite un-American and wrong. Therefore, also considering the creation of business tax and land use incentives. Thank you. Any other members of the community want to address us on this item, item number 15? Please come forward and you'll have up to two minutes. Hi, uh, my name is Michael and I just completed a build out, uh, just filed for my DBA. Um, I'm a downtown Santa Cruz business owner. Um, and I just wanna say at the, having completed my full project from beginning to end, it took about a year and a half. Um, the cost was anywhere from f it's about five hundred thousand uh, dollars just to open up a food prep place, and so uh, costs are astronomical. And a silver silver wave is like a really interesting term for what's about to happen. Uh, majority of boomers are sixty four right now, having been born in nineteen fifty five. That was the highest uh, uh, peak of birth rate uh, during the boomer uh, period. And um, so 64, so in the next five years, we're gonna see an enormous amount of boomers retiring. 29% of the population holds about 40% of the wealth. Um, and there's a lot of boomers in Santa Cruz County. Um, and so that's gonna beg the question, are they gonna spend more because they have more time or less uh, because they don't have that uh, expendable income from their previous employment? 
Um, and so this could be pose as a potential recession um, for a tourist economy like ours. Um, and so, uh, it, it, yeah, that's pretty much my only point, point is that a, a recession may be coming to our tourist economy. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, Pat Malo. Um, for the last uh, couple years, I've had the pleasure of working uh, on and off with Co-op Santa Cruz on this issue, and I'm really excited to see it up here today. Um, I also serve on the board of directors of WAM, the oldest medical marijuana collective in uh, the country, and um, you know, with we are looking at transitioning from a medical collective into some sort of multi-stakeholder worker co-op entity um, to fit into the new state regulations. So this is really encouraging at least um, for that project. And um, you know, just a comment on the last um, statement, I think that the burden of entry to any business is so high that you know, normal folks can't get there usually. And so any way that you can lift you know, those burdens of entry for the type of businesses or type of work that we need to see in the community, I think is a really good idea. I think this co-op thing is a beautiful start to that. Um, and then also just as a community member, I think that this is, you know, in a sense, the uh, it touches on the deepest issue that we have and that's equity in our community. And by equity, I mean ownership. And um, if we could have a different ownership model within this community, I think we'd have a lot of different discussions than we've been having. Um, so I think that this is a wonderful positive step forward and thank you guys all for your work and everything you're doing. Thank you. My name is Rob Yanagida. Um, I'm a Santa Cruz resident and a volunteer lawyer with the Sustainable Economies Law Center. Um, I'd actually like to read a statement from Maria Cadenas, executive director of the Santa Cruz Community Ventures, who unfortunately couldn't attend because she's in a conference uh, on asset building in Los Angeles. Businesses are an integral part of our daily lives. They are pathways to economic mobility and the backbone of our local economies through jobs, services, and goods they offer. This makes our local businesses critical to addressing the income and wealth gaps, putting our economy's diversity, identity, and ability to thrive at risk. Santa Cruz Community Ventures believes worker cooperatives are a way to build democratic ownership and vehicles for community members to participate in the economy and build wealth. Um, as baby boomer owners retire, local businesses will go through shifts. Converting lo those businesses to employee-owned cooperatives will be critical to keep many of those businesses locally owned and benefit workers by ensuring better pay, benefits, asset building, and that profits stay in the community. Education, financial literacy, employment, and even home ownership do not eliminate the wealth gaps we see in our communities. But cooperatives do allow community to move away from addressing, addressing uh, access to existing financial systems that is not working toward creating an economy that works for workers. This resolution is part of helping build a strong and vibrant local economy. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi there, uh, my name is Ben Pearl, and um, I'm a relatively new transplant to the Santa Cruz community. Um, uh, resident of about a year, I moved from Davis, California. Um, similar in a lot of ways in terms of our um, proximity to a, a large uh, state employer, and a lot of the, uh, subject to a lot of the similar forces in terms of the, the squeezed economy, affordable housing, et cetera. And I just wanna commend the council for taking up this issue and looking at cooperatives, um, I know there's been a lot of emphasis on worker co-ops, housing co-ops as well. Um, these are just uh, sort of basic tools that we can add to the city toolbox in addressing a lot of the growing wealth inequity and creating opportunities for buy-in from local residents. Um, so yeah, just wanted to appreciate you all and appreciate city staff for I know it will be good work on this issue. Hello, hello, my name is Byers. 
I am definitely in support of this resolution. Um, and I also just wanted to, one thing that wasn't mentioned that I didn't see, but maybe I was a little bit late, was that California also packed the, passed the uh, California Worker Cooperative AB 816 in 2016. So we're not totally pushing the envelope on anything crazy new. Um, and then the other thing was mentioned about like how far left this was, which I thought was kind of fascinating because um, the first co-ops were for electricity going into the rural areas of the United States. So in the 1930s, President Roosevelt and the Tennessee Valley Authority Act also did this whole cooperative movement for to get electric electricity out to rural farms. Um, so this isn't insane. I think it's very reasonable and I really hope you support it. Thank you. So uh, we'll go ahead and bring it back to council uh, for action. Uh, Councilman yeah. Matthews. I, I would like to make the motion um, de which declares October um, co-op month in the city of Santa Cruz and provides city support for development and growth of local worker cooperatives. And Second. I'd like to make a couple of comments. Okay, so that. we have a motion by Council Member Matthews, seconded by Council Member Crone, comments by Council Member Matthews. Yeah, very brief. I'm sorry, seconded by Council Member Glover. Yeah. And then comments by Council Member Crone. I did see something go up. And then uh, comments by Council Member Brown, uh, Vice, uh, Matthews Brown, Vice Mayor. Whew, all okay. on board. <laughs> Yeah, okay, why don't we go ahead and have uh, comments by Council Yeah, th thanks for bringing this to the council, really. Um, I'm just wondering, a lot of times when things are brought to the council and there's no fiscal impact or no nothing attached to it or um, what's, what's the future look like, I'm just wondering from both of you, what do you see, is this gonna die on a shelf somewhere or are we gonna continue? Or I'm, I'm sure it's up partly up to the group that has presented today too, but how is the city, that's what I'd like to know, how is the city of Berkeley, for example, involved in worker co-ops and is there a financial, uh, some kind of loan program or what, what, what is it? I'd like to speak to that. Okay, Councilman Matthews. Because that was part of what we discussed and different communities do it differently, different size communities. Um, I think we were very clear in our discussions with the group um, and uh, in the language of the resolution as presented um, that uh, we are very uh, committed as a city to supporting, acknowledging and supporting the value of uh, worker co-ops. Um, they, uh, we are already, I think this may have been a bit of a um, uh, learning experience for some of the people that brought this forward. We do a lot already in our economic development department to support local business and small business. And um, there we have a robust program of support within <coughs> the department and uh, very good relationships. I noticed one thing that wasn't listed on the presentation was the Small Business Development Center, which is not our entity, but it's a very useful entity and a partner for us. So I think our feeling and the others can, can kick in was that we are very much geared to supporting small local businesses uh, and we see the co-op movement as uh, yet another variety of that. And so without giving necessarily preference to, to co-ops, we do, for example, we have a local uh, um, contracting bidding uh, process for goods and services. Co-ops would fit into that. So there's some things we can readily do at no cost um, through our partnerships and relationships. And I'm trying to respond to your question about fiscal impact. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of grants, um, given the city's fiscal situation, I don't see us taking a big plunge in that, but we do have relationships with uh, state and federal entities who, who do investments in economic opportunity. So I, I think there's a lot we can do without taking on direct additional financial burden to the city to support a really important component of small local businesses. Does that answer your question? Yeah. A first, a first step. Yeah, okay. a first, it's definitely a first step. Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, and. Yeah, uh, so I'll, I'll make a, just a couple of quick comments and then try to also speak to your question about Councilmember uh, Brown. I just wanna say I am so thrilled that we are doing this. Uh, I recognize that it is uh, you know, resolution is, uh, I see a, this as a first step, certainly. Um, I recognize, having been involved with various producer co-ops, worker co-ops in the past, I, you know, I realize that it is a huge endeavor to try to either transition uh, business to cooperative um, ownership. 
Um, it, it's, it, there are major challenges. I was assigned to do that at, for my uh, local employer and uh, to kind of move towards worker ownership. It takes a lot of effort and try to, to navigate the, the system. Um, capital is clearly an issue. Uh, while, and then I worked with, worker, with um, producer co-ops as well in Latin America. It's hard to start them. Um, capital is a major issue. I don't believe the city will ever be in a position to provide, be a major resource in that regard. Um, however, I do think that as we um, open up this conversation with Co-op Santa Cruz and other organizations, and I'm so glad to see that other organizations have turned out to, um, to want to be involved in this, um, that we can begin to better understand what um, what uh, the community, what would be helpful to businesses who are looking to transition and or startups, and we can, uh, in the future, move in that direction accordingly. I think um, there's, there's more we can do, and I want to be part of that conversation. Um, but I think, as Council Member Matthews suggested, that some of the things we're already doing um, can, that we can try to be make more accessible or, or more um, raise the profile in conversation with, with the co-op uh, advocates in our community. Um, Vice Mayor Cummings. I'm also really excited to see this come forward and really happy that members of the community brought this to our attention because it seems like there's a lot of interest in um, you know, really trying to support co-ops and kind of to what was presented earlier, just the difficulty of navigating the technical field of trying to transition small local businesses to co-ops is one piece of you know this conversation that was brought to our attention. Um, in addition to that, um, we through our meetings, we're also discussing ways that we can partner with local businesses in our community, the city, to put on events to raise more awareness, uh, whether there are workshops that we can uh, have to help educate folks on how they can transition their businesses. And so this was really a first step, and um, we are very much committed to seeing how we can continue to raise the profile of uh, co-ops in the city of Santa Cruz to support local businesses and figure out ways that we can have technical assistance for businesses and the, the things that we can do currently with the resources that we have. And as more resources come online and more opportunities become available, we can, you know, explore those um, at that point in time. Okay. Why don't you go ahead and add, and then we'll go ahead and have Councilmember Myers. Oh, me. sorry. No, but you can go finish. Um, but I, so I guess with that, I just want um, to highlight the desire for continued conversation and for those uh, of you who are listening in or here in the room from Sustainable Economies Law Center, uh, Co-op Santa Cruz, Community Ventures, others, please stay in touch with us and kind of encourage us to uh, continue to work with you. So um, we will do our part, and but, but keep uh, communi in communication with us about how to move forward. Councilmember Myers. Yeah, I'm going to I will be supporting the motion. I just um, wanted to thank everyone for bringing it forward. Um, and just a little bit of personal sort of reflection. I've worked for, worked for two um, co-ops over my time here in the city. Um, and I think it really is a great way to, especially for younger people who are, who are starting uh, work here, uh, it does, it can, it can be a really um, beneficial way to, to earn higher wages and have flexibility to, um, to succeed. And so um, I think they're a really interesting model. I had really good experiences with the two that I worked for. And um, so thank you for bringing it forward. You're here. Councilman for Clever. Thanks. I just love cooperatives. So it was really wonderful to have this up and props to everyone that helped to make this happen and put it together. Uh, I think one of the stories that always sticks out to me when we got a chance to meet was when y'all told me about the pizza delivery person that started at like $12 and ended up owning part of the business and started making like 20 to $23 an hour or something like that. Uh, so that possibility, I think, if we think about it, extrapolated out throughout the community can make an incredible impact, not only on uh, addressing issues of displacement from housing, since we have some exorbitant rent prices that we're dealing with right now, but also on the potential of home ownership, which I think is really exciting because of the potential of cooperative land ownership, as well as food distribution and all the other kinds of things that uh, this kind of opens the door for those conversations. So I really appreciate all the work and uh, we'll definitely be supporting it because, yeah, co-ops. Okay. Councilor Brown. I won't repeat what everybody said because I'm in very much um, with them on that. Um, and I like the way this offers opportunities and stuff. And I think we, we need the group to keep pushing and coming back to council and, and 
for, you know, getting a notion of what that bond might look like between um, a co-op and local government. Okay, great. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Thank you. <laughs> we'll maybe have a, like maybe a two minute transition before we have the next item, which is item number 16 on our agenda. Can I have a bio break? <laughs> Okay. Great. Okay, we'll come back to the meeting here. We're on item number 16 of our general business calendar items, and we have now at the Chinatown Bridge naming and public art proposal. We have Bonnie introducing the item. Hi, um, good afternoon, members of the council again. Uh, Bonnie Lipscomb, Director of Economic Development, and normally it would actually be Beth Toby, our Arts Program Manager um, here presenting. She's worked um, on this project for some time, um, but she is out of town today. She'll be coming back um, this evening, but unfortunately she's not here in time for this item. So I get the, the honor of briefly introducing these remarks and then turning it over to Greg Pepping. Um, so the motion before you today is to approve the naming of the pedestrian bridge, Chinatown Bridge and approve the Chinatown Public Art Project as proposed by the Coastal Watershed uh, Council. There were four Chinatowns in Santa Cruz at different times um, over, over the years. The last Chinatown was located near the river um, where the Galleria currently sits and was destroyed during the 1955 flood. Except for a plaque in the Galleria courtyard, there's very little, little visible recognition of the Chinatown residents and the culture of a community who played a prominent role in shaping Santa Cruz over the last century. The Coastal Watershed Council is a lo local nonprofit organization whose primary mission is to preserve and enhance the San Lorenzo River, brought forward the idea um, under Greg Pepping's leadership, naming the pedestrian bridge Chinatown Bridge. Conversations between Coastal Watershed Commi uh, Col uh, Council and George Al Jr. led to an idea for a public art plaque piece, which eventually became this beautiful piece that you see um, before you today, um, consisting of a non-traditional Chinese style gate with a mosaic um, tiled water dragon on top of it. Uh, this came before council in June of last year and council directed it be considered by the Parks and Rec Commission and um, the uh, Historic Preservation Commission and then ultimately it also went to the Arts Commission. All three unanimously approved um, this art piece and the naming of the bridge in September and so now it's back before you today. There's been extensive community outreach um, in over the last couple months leading up to this project um, and then the selection approach with the with the artists leading up to this. There, um, the actual structure itself is a steel armature with a foam interior and a, a concrete sort of skin around it. It is very durable, um, or we're anticipating it to be very durable. Um, it's a similar process that's been used at playgrounds at some airports and some uh, public, uh, very publicly used playgrounds. So we're hoping that it will stand the test of time. Um, and the fiscal impact to the city, the Arts Commission as part of the city's economic development arts budget approved 10,000 contribution to really enhance the ramps, signage, educational elements, and some enhanced landscaping that you, you see there. Um, and this would be in collaboration with our Parks and Rec Department to go forward to um, as part of the honoring of the um, Chinatown Bridge. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Greg Pepping, um, who has a brief presentation. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. Uh, my name is Greg Pepping, the Executive Director of the Coastal Watershed Council, and um, our vision, the Coastal Watershed Council's vision, is the community's vision, which is a safe and healthy, um, a healthy San Lorenzo River surrounded by safe and inviting parks. And what we're doing every day to work towards that is we're getting kids out there. It really changes to get youth out there. 2,700 youth will earn this wooden badge, you've heard me talk about it, Watershed Ranger, after they do a service project work on the river and pledge to keep learning and share with others. Hundreds of volunteers will be out there planting over 2,000 plants and testing water quality to, and taking action to improve water quality. So we are, that's what we're doing to connect and reconnect members of Santa Cruz to the San Lorenzo River. We ask them to spend time there to learn about the river. We all rely on the river and we impact the river, so to learn about that. 
and to build an emotional connection to the river. The levees are doing their jobs and physically and visually, emotionally and psychologically, they're also disconnecting us from the river. So we have to overcome that, that barrier. So speaking of learning about the river and speaking of remembering and, and forgetting things, I'll give you some background on why an environmental organization, why, why the Coastal Watershed Council is bringing this project to you, how these things are related. When I'm meeting with donors or partners or um, colleagues or peers, I invite people often uh, for a walking meeting. We all sit down, many of you do in these long meetings and other work too often. People are really game to have a walking meeting very often. And I say, meet me by the bridge, the pedestrian bridge going from San, uh, San Lorenzo Park over to Trader Joe's and the Galleria. It doesn't really roll off the tongue. So it was a very practical consideration. I thought we should name that thing. What might we name that? Just really practical, as I, was, uh, as I would walk or bike it regularly, I would think about what might that be named. And um, the Chinatown Bridge came to me as an idea among other ideas. So that's not something I should decide um, or Coastal Watershed Council should decide. The conversation, um, I brought that idea to George Ao um, and he liked the idea and started talking to members of his family and his colleagues and um, relatives and he liked it a lot. <coughs> so the idea uh, evolved from the renaming into the public art piece you see before you the non-traditional Chinese style gate, the water dragon. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about the water dragon and its significance. The things I mentioned that we do as a nonprofit, um, I'm at the river all the time for stuff like that. Our office is in the Good Times building right by the river. I live at the end of Price Street right by the river. My kid is two and he goes to daycare at the end of Felker. I'm on the river all the time. I'm professionally and personally committed to the river. And through these conversations, I started talking to George about the importance of um, this piece of history, Chinatown right next to the river, and it's forgot, how it's forgotten. And the role, the significance of the water dragon. When, he, when, when George walks the river regularly, he couldn't be here, I think Bonnie said, for, because of another commitment. When he walks the river, he sees a water dragon, sometimes multiple water dragons in the river. He sees different moods in the river um, dragons. He'll see a really fierce river dragon when there's a lot of flow. He'll see it meeting another dragon coming in with the pulse of the tide. He'll see another dragon coming in where Branson 40 Creek meets the main stem. And he sees that change in mood and dynamic and energy of a dragon. Um, I see the river differently now because of hearing those stories. And it's really moving for me to hear George talk about how Stuff like this, remembering, learning, and reconnecting to that history and all those people, it feeds the ghosts, is, or that's the, those are, that's the language he uses. It feeds hungry ghosts, and that's our duty if we wanna honor them. So, um, that's the emotional piece to offer with the intellectual and the practical. So, we're here for any questions you have. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for that great presentation. That was really, really helpful. And I, I, I like the concept of feeding the ghost. I was wondering how, if I just add the, uh, is it um, 14 and five, 19 feet, that's, his, that's the, the height of that right there? That as high as it goes? Somebody was asking me this and they thought it was uh, uh, higher than that. You're looking at uh, width and height? And the dragon, as you see the dimensions there, is, is um, 12 feet long. So sh we should, um, five feet high for the dragon. And I think the 18 on the gate is the height. So about 23 in height. Does that make sense? It says 14 feet by 14 feet by 18 inches, right? So is that, anyway. I for the gate part. 23 feet, okay, that's what, that's what I wanted to know because somebody was asking that question and I think, is that gonna be open at all where it is now? Is there gonna be any changes to that grill work or cement area or you know, stepping through the gate? Is that something that is envisioned? So that half, that round, uh, that half circle will kind of be under the gate. So the most that you can walk through the gate is to step into that and you're kind of walking under it but you don't really walk under it and keep going. Yeah. I, think we, I think it'd be better if we did what you're asking about. And it's also sort of a, um, it's more engineering, it's more cost, it's more design. 
So right now, no, and hopefully later. Thanks. There's also been a discussion to maybe s uh, some simil similar um, attractive art piece on the other end of the bridge, but this is phase one. Yeah, it's great. Um, thank you for helping to move this forward, and uh, it's important for us to be acknowledging and recognizing the history of the Chinese residents of Santa Cruz. How long did the process take from the inception of when you first, uh, m you know, coordinated with Mr. Ao to now? Um, probably, probably a year and ten months, and maybe a year and eight months. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that diligence. Thank you. You're welcome. Just um, thank you for bringing this forward. Um, I'm really excited about it and just the partnership between you and uh, the artist um, and the city is exciting. Uh, I did just have a question. I'm not sure if it's per Bonnie or you. Um, I just wanted to make sure I understood how the maintenance of a piece like this is, is um, I, this is a high traffic area and, and I just wanted, it says in the staff report, the city will maintain the piece as part of the public art inventory. Is that something that we, we have um, funds in our, so, so if, if it gets any damage or anything like that, uh, and that would include, I, I hope not, but something like a skateboard injury or a little graffiti here or there, we'd be able to get out there and repair it quickly? Yeah, we have a general as part of our budget maintenance category and it sort of it's for everything. Um, so depending on, on what else, you know, uh, is if there's other maintenance needs, but typically it's available for any, any art project. Right. Great. Um, and then I just want to make a note, um, uh, Mr. Pepping, that uh, there's actually a dragon on the other side of the river. I was going to mention and, uh, in, in the playground. <laughs> the San Lorenzo Urban River Plan Committee, which was a committee of 24 members of our community, um, intentionally left that dragon in that playground and then had a local artist named Kathleen Abood paint it into a dragon and renew that as a dragon. So it's definitely a dragon for the kids over in the playground. And I hope we retain um, this vision of a dragon along the river. It's super, uh, it's just uh, very fortuitous that these two um, images have come together this, this far apart. So there's one over there, but we could use one more. Have a friend soon, right? Yeah, thank, thank you for your effort. <laughs> Any other questions at this time? Okay, seeing none. I offer one more thing before you close. It's just that I forgot sure. to acknowledge Beth Toby, um, who really guided us on this. We went through three commissions. That's the. The recommendation you have before you includes going through three commissions and Beth was really the staff lead amongst others on that. So I wanted to thank her for that. Thank you for doing that. Councilmember Brown, a question and then I'm gonna open it up to public comment. Yeah, I don't have a question. I no. Know. But we'll come back to you. Is there any member of the community who wants to address the council on this item? This is item number 16 on our general business. Okay, come on forward and you'll have two minutes. Sir, you're welcome to step up. Okay, great. Go ahead and come on. Uh, I'm a partner on a, a biotech fund in Shanghai. And uh, my experience dealing with the Chinese is that things like dragons um, and similar kind of things have great significance in Chinese culture. And I wondered if this type of a dragon in this color had any significance that we should be aware of in the Chinese culture. Okay. That's, that's my question. I don't know the answer, but that's my question. Okay. It, it's, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, a Japanese firm built a skyscraper in, in, uh, in Shanghai and they had a big round sign on the top and the Chinese said, well, that looks too much like the rising sun, you've got to take it down. And so a lot of sensitivity to things like that. Thank you for that. Okay. Any other member of the community wanting to address the council on this item? Okay, seeing them, we'll go ahead and return back to the council. We had Councilmember Brown, um, Matthews, I mean, Councilmember Brown, Matthews, Glover, and then Vice Mayor Cummings. Um, I don't know if there was an answer to the question that was posed. If, if you want, you're welcome to do that before we go ahead and turn it over to the council. So the, the question was about appropriateness and cultural um, so considerations that a lot, um, if you're not from a member of this culture, you might not understand. A few things um, came up during the community outreach meeting at the MA and, and in our outreach to um, artists and historians um, and members of the Chinese American community. Um, the color is, um, is appropriate 
this type of dragon um, is appropriate. Um, the gate, there was some discussion around the gate. Some folks think that certain gates should only be at temples, and there was a variety of opinion on that. This is a non-traditional style gate, so anyone who would have that opinion um, might be more accepting of this. The, the dragon should not look down, um, even though it would be nice for you and I standing under it, because then it can't fly. Those are the types of um, nuanced things that matter. Um, and we also learned from projects in Chinese, you know, in Chinatown in Portland had a really bad example of how they kind of fumbled on some stuff like this. So we tried to do our due diligence, um, George and Kathleen particularly, and others. So, Great, thank yeah. you for answering the question. Appreciate that. Okay, Councilmember Brown, comments? Councilmember Matthews, Councilmember Glover, Vice Mayor Cummings. I, I'm really excited to see this project come to fruition, and I want to thank everybody who's involved. Um, George Ao, who's not here. Um, Mr. Pepping, thank you also for uh, providing us with some literature that also helps tell the story of the very rich history of the Chinese in um, Santa Cruz, in this area on the coastal coast of California, which stretches back um, to before the Spanish. So a long, long history and um, some, some great uh, material for us to also um, digest kind of the, the bigger, <coughs> bigger history there. And um, so thank you for that. And thank you for all the work you did. Thanks to the various commissioners and our staff. And I think that I'll leave it at that. Councilor Matthews. Yeah, I'm, I love this project. And again, I want to commend, um, um, this is just a perfect example of involving a community nonprofit a value the community shares, private philanthropy, and a public entity, all of which have contributed to make this happen. It's just wonderful. Um, I am personally, as someone who loves local history, I really believe in creating reminders of our history, and this is a perfect example. Um, and I also worked with many of these same people on the Chinese gate at Evergreen. Um, so um, we are just so lucky to have um, the resources and interest in making a project like this happen. Um, I did want to mention, I've spoken to the principals here, I'll just, for, for the benefit of others, um, this is a pretty high impact zone. Um, and I did raise a concern again with the artist um, and, and Greg on, on the fragility or apparent fragility of some of these, um, the features on the dragon particularly. And uh, it's been explained to me the composition of this, and it would be very strong. <laughs> and um, it is something that I want to have be beautiful and lasting um, for years and years into the future. So um, I just wanted to mention that as a concern that um, uh, as this, this is conceptual, as it moves forward, that, that high attention is paid to the durability of, of this, of the artistic feature. But with that, I, I am happy to move the item before us, um, okay. the, uh, approving the naming of the pedestrian bridge and approval of the Chinatown Public Art Project. It's a great <coughs> project. Yep. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Crone. Further discussion, Councilmember Glover? Yeah, I just had a question that came up from <clears throat> that public comment. Um, what, um, what artists were engaged in the design of the, uh, features, I guess, within the, the gate and the dragon. I noticed, uh, were there any people that specialize in Chinese uh, design or um, tradition or mythology with regards to that? I know there was the public input process, but I'm looking at the lead designer's names, and I don't want to judge based on their names, but I think from my experience with them that neither one of them are of Chinese descent. Yeah, George Ao specifically approached Kathleen Crocetti because of her extensive um, work in Santa Cruz, also on the pedestrian bridges with the mosaics. And together they did reach out to um, community members um, and, and the Chinese community specifically for their engagement in the process. I also actually want to recognize Tom Ralston, who is here, who is also one of the artists involved with the, with the project, and he may have a little bit more to add to that. Oh, great. Thank you. Yes, um, I built the uh, Chinese monument in the Evergreen Cemetery five years ago. It's a project that lasted, uh, went from August to uh, April. I think just an amount of time, uh, this will be all of that, eight to 10 months. Uh, as far as the design goes, I researched the designs thoroughly, as thoroughly as I could. 
for Chinese gates and Chinese bridges and came up with a whole amalgamation of design and some that I thought would work and look really good. And the Chinese Memorial, have you seen that? Mm -hmm. In Evergreen, you should take a look sometime because I think you'll be um, you know, just impressed with what I would call the authenticity of a Chinese piece and some of you have been there. Um, this piece is gonna be that and actually more uh, if I can get my, have my way. But um, I uh, am using concrete in here that's almost uh, 8,000 PSI and normal concrete is 2,500. So as far as my end goes and the structural integrity, barring a nuclear warhead hitting directly on it, it's gonna be here for a lot longer than the uh, Roman Colosseum. So uh, the dragon, I think Kathleen had addressed that with you, Cynthia, that uh, there are works of art using this method that have stood the test of time. And um, we, uh, we think it's gonna be a really cool uh, design. Do you have any other questions? Um, yeah, so I was just looking at the Chinese Memorial in Santa Cruz, it, is, it looks great. Um, my main concern, or just curiosity had to do with the intentional outreach that was done to people that specialize in Asian historical analysis as well as uh, Asian tradition, specifically Chinese tradition yes. and Chinese architecture and uh, making sure that their voices were prominent and taken into consideration. I know that there was the concern mentioned about the placement of gates not associated with temples, so I don't know what kind of uh, resolution was made around that or whether those were taken into consideration, but then ultimately decided on establishing a gate here. Um, just, you know, coming from someone with a diverse background, I could understand the perspective of some that may celebrate this, absolutely, but then others that may feel if there was not enough inclusion or um, kind of um, evaluation of it with the uh, incorporation of many different voices from that community to make sure that everyone has the buy-in to appreciate it. I completely it. understand your concern. We had a meeting at the um, MA, the Museum of Art and History, and there were Chinese people present, and there was one woman who's very active in Chinese history and art, and she's over the moon with this. She's thrilled with it. I took a, two visits to the um, uh, MoMA, the Museum of Chinese An Ancestry, uh, in New York City, and I actually uh, broached this idea to one of the curators who thought it was a great idea too. And as far as the lettering goes on the Chinese memorial in the Evergreen, we actually sought the advice of a uh, professor uh, in Chinese in Sacramento, and he not only um, uh, scripted the Chinese character, but he said, do you want to go pre-Mao or post-Mao? And so it was, uh, com it, we, they, were, they agreed it should be pre-Mao. And I imagine the lettering here will probably uh, replicate that, but I, I can't speak to that completely, but I just really feel that we've uh, collectively done our homework uh, to make sure that we're including uh, anybody of Chinese heritage and ancestry to make sure that this is authentic and something that they would approve of. Thank you for that. Thank you all so much for your hard work and then we'll go ahead. I just wanna also um, say, you know, to the points made earlier, it's wonderful to have these types of efforts come forward to us and to celebrate. And one of the things that I did notice about the agenda report was really the call out to the equity and the inclusionary as well as the sustainability. And I think it really encompasses all of those elements. So thank you for your due diligence and your hard work in bringing this forward to us. I know Councilmember Matthews had one last comment. And, oh, I'm sorry, did I skip? Councilmember, Vice Mayor Cummings has a comment and then Councilmember Matthews and we'll go ahead and see if we get Councilmember Cohn. So just wanna say thank you to Greg Pepping, the Watershed Council, our staff, the Owl family, and all the folks who really put a lot of hard work into this. I think it, um, it's really important that we educate, you know, the people of Santa Cruz and the people who visit Santa Cruz about all the cultures that really contributed to the city over time. And I think this is a great way to honor our Chinese hist history and culture in Santa Cruz. And additionally, I'm just very um, excited about, you know, another 
um, really significant piece of artwork that's gonna draw attention to our river and really activate our river space because um, I think that this is an, another opportunity to also um, not only bring attention to the culture of, of the Chinese people who have helped make Santa Cruz what it is, but also engaging people in our natural spaces and getting them to appreciate the beauty of our river. And so I just wanna say how much I appreciate this and its placement and, and everything it means for the city. Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember Um The question was raised about uh, uh, how the artists were selected, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think um, our, our <coughs> arts program envisions two paths for public art. One is uh, selecting a site and doing a request for proposal, something like that, and the other is an unsolicited proposal, which this one was, where someone has an idea and comes to the city, and so um, these were the artists that George Al particularly uh, selected himself and brought forward as a, as a package. And again, I just wanna thank Tom <laughs> and the quality of artists involved in this and the, the really thoughtful approach to, to making it culturally right. Um, we're, we're really lucky, yeah. Council McCrone. Just a question on, um, cause it came up on the design. Um, we've had two emails on it too. Are the, the lettering, what, what does it spell? What, what, how would you translate it? Well, that's one question and the other one is will it be translated on the site as well so people who don't speak Chinese know what it says? Um, I'll address that because um, the last uh, monument that we did was just uh, dedicated to the Chinese uh, that helped uh, build the Monterey and Santa Cruz community. And then the two pieces on each column were, were actually Chinese po poems. And I envision that this will be much of the same, and I'm pretty sure that George Ao has uh, someone of professorial uh, quality that will uh, make sure that this is, and if it needs to be approved what they say, uh, so be it. But if not, I mean, that's where we're gonna go with it, and we're gonna probably have the same format, poetry on the sides, and then a Chinese statement saying, um, I don't know, welcome to Chinatown, or this was Chinatown in 1885, or Chinatown, eight, uh, 1870 to 1949, or whenever it was, no more. I just, that's still a little bit uh, in development, but it's gonna be something of that nature. Thanks, so this isn't the lettering, right? No, okay. this is not. Thanks, okay. and I just wanna point out two issues in a row that I think we have a lot of enthusiasm and unanimity in. Um, I know we haven't voted yet on it, but I just, it's really nice to see. See that, I agree, hear, hear. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and move on to item number 17, um, and that is the Residential Rental Inspection <laughs> Services Update and Options for Modifications, and we have Lee Butler, and Laura coming forward to present the item. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Lee Butler, the Director of Planning and Community Development for the city. And with me, I have Laura Landry. She is our Code Compliance Manager. And we'll let Laura kick off the presentation. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. I'm Laura Landry with Code Compliance Manager with the Community and Development Department. Thank you. The Residential Inspection Services is a self-funded, proactive inspection service that was enacted on August 2011. It was created to improve and protect the tenants. It was created to improve and maintain the housing stock and protect um, the tenants of our community by assuring that the minimum habitable standards are met. The sole purpose of the Residential Inspection Service is again, protecting our community. Here we have a concrete um, driveway 
that after inspection, it was found to be collapsing due to several main posts being deteriorated or that they were completely, um, did not have any support. As you can see from the un underneath the driveway, you have the main post that's completely deteriorated or is not being supported, as well as the detachment of the side because one of the supports has been completely deteriorated. In this particular instance, one of the tenants that was living in this unit, um, in this single family dwelling, was uh, irate, thinking that they were gonna need to relocate due to the condition of the driveway because it's considered to be unsafe. After explaining to the tenant what the situation was and how important it was for this to be addressed, they were able to understand the situation and work with the rental inspection um, inspector. Here in this pictures are two unpermitted um, water heaters. Just by looking at this picture, you could see that one is pretty obvious. It has no venting, it has no strapping, while the other one might not be as obvious. The other um, water heater that you can see that there's a vent, that actually was venting into the walls and also into the attic space of a single family rental unit. The one with no venting was actually in, located in a place where a childcare center was being conducted. Unfortunately, both um, the, the rental inspectors in this case is were able to assist the tenants and get um, the uh, condition rectified um, promptly. While these two may seem obvious, I mean, well, these two may and may not seem obvious. In the next picture, you see where a white, an unpermitted water heater is very obvious. The um, inspector was out there, uh, noticed the um, darkening around the water heater, waited for the pilot to go on, and there, flames. This is on a four, uh, 14 unit apartment complex that was also close to other water heaters that could potentially have been catastrophe. Um, it could have been a catastrophe for all of that were involved. And I'd just jump in here and say, um, <clears throat> the council has seen um, some of these photos through the weekly updates, but these are all recent occurrences. This is something that our team is out doing, protecting the lives of our community members on a daily basis. And I'm really proud of the work that they all do to keep our residents safe. These all happened in the last few months and it's something that we come across on a very regular basis is serious life safety threats to our community that our team is out there addressing. Here we see stats of the rental inspection services. We have approximately 11,400 registered units in the city and conduct approximately 3,700 inspections a year. Out of the 3,700 inspections, 14% pass the first inspection, meaning that 86% require additional work in order to improve the conditions of the tenants in these locations. And only between one and two are vacated a year due to hazardous conditions. This fiscal year, the 2019, only one was vacated due to hazardous conditions. In May 9th, 2019, direction was to bring back for discussion four items. One, shift the program to a complaint based only. Two, maintain landlord fees to fund the program. Three, codify SB 1226 that was adopted by last year, allowing for enforcement of codes in effect at the time of construction. And four, bring construction up to code at the time of sale. Two additional considerations are also listed here for the council's um, consideration. One is expand outreach, and two is the amnesty, a pilot amnesty program, which will be described later on in this presentation. Currently, the rental inspection services is a mandatory program that provides services to all tenants without the fear of retaliation by the landlord. The Housing Voice Outreach 
confirms that tenants often live in unsafe, dangerous condition and do not report these situations due to fear of retaliation or fear of eviction. Moving this program to a complaint-based program will leave the most vulnerable of our community members, um, they will leave them vulnerable. I would also like to say again that based on the stats, which is 86% of the um, inspections that are conducted, conducted fail, we strongly recommend that this program not switch to a complaint-based program and be made mandatory. Council requested that this program remain cost um, self-funded, which we completely agree. At this point in time, the fees are approximately $76 per a single family, single family dwelling, which includes the cost for two code compliance specialists and one code compliance technician. We further would like to expand our right outreach program to include other community um, organizations as well as other community depart departments to organize additional events and educate the community on tenant resources. Thanks, Laura. I'll wrap up the presentation here with a few things. Um, <clears throat> first off, the council provided direction to bring back a discussion related to the codification of SB 1226. And SB 1226 would allow the, and does allow, the building official to apply on a case-by-case -case basis codes that were in effect at the time of the construction of an unpermitted unit or a unpermitted addition, for example. And this is current state law. It is incorporated into the health and safety code. And so we do not need to codify this into our code. We are already implementing the use of SB 1226 in our um, evaluation of unpermitted units and unpermitted um, additions. Speaking of those unpermitted units, um, we have um, about 450 that we have identified. Those units remain occupied, and um, the, the vast majority of them are still occupied. We do end up, um, as Laura mentioned, um, issuing vacate orders to one to two units per year based on health and safety violations that um, preclude occupancy. Um, but the vast majority of these are still uh, housing individuals. <clears throat> we have uh, about 158 in uh, our current unpermitted dwelling unit legalization process. Um, we have uh, fully legalized 32 of those, 15 of those the owners have chosen for whatever reason, either non-compliance with planning requirements or cost associated with, um, with having the structure meet the applicable codes. 15 of them have been removed. Um, 17 more are um, issued, they've been issued building permits and so they're, they're close to having um, a legal unit. And then 94 in various stages of the process, preparing plans, um, in plan check and so forth. Um, we have about 300 that are in the queue, and some of those have been in the queue for quite some time. I mean, we've got some that have, have been there for five years. And one of the things that we do is when we've got these units, our goal is to legalize the units. So if we have a unit that may, be benefit, may benefit from uh, a law that may be coming down the pipeline from the state or from us locally, we set that one aside. And that's part of those 300 units that we have pending. We, we, the last thing we want is people to remove units and then to find out a few months later that, oh, uh, you know, the state would now have allowed that. We try to keep these units online and we try to make sure that we can get them permitted and legal. So one of the uh, actions that the council requested discussion regarding was um, point of sale reporting requirements. Council 
direction was to bring back for discussion uh, the uh, consideration of structures being brought up to code at the point of sale. And we saw a number of members of the public writing about um, the impression that old homes would have to be brought up to current code. And that isn't um, what we took the, the council's direction as. Um, we uh, took it more as looking at unpermitted units, um, uh, looking at unprevented additions, and potentially looking at um, health and safety violations that would need to be rectified. And potentially, um, if eligible, um, using SB 1226 to apply the older codes. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, the, the council also, um, because um, they, this was not agendized when the direction was given, there, uh, there wasn't a discussion about um, the intent of the motion. And so um, the uh, statement of at point of sale also would need some clarification. Um, the council didn't discuss this, but the agenda report identifies a number of reasons why um, having um, structures either legalized or get permits prior to a sale can be very problematic because that process is really time consuming. It, it, um, and, uh, it, people have to prepare plans, they have to come in and get permits, they have to get inspections. Uh, the timelines associated with property sales often don't allow for that. So any type of action that the um, council considers, staff would recommend, that if it's a legalization or permitting requirement that the council's looking at, that that would actually happen um, after the sale occurs. Um, the government code does allow for cities to require point of sale um, reporting and um, both Salinas and Seaside have done that in, in different manners. Um, the uh, report here on the screen is a sample of what Salinas does, they essentially run a report that shows here are all the permits that um, have been pulled and that's that's included. The city of Seaside goes a little bit farther. They also require an inspection and so there's an inspection and that inspection compares um, what's out in the field to uh, the permits that have been identified on uh, their research. Um, and um, there, has been a fair amount of discussion amongst uh, the community comments about the effects that something like this may have on sales price. Um, so I'd like to, to delve into uh, that for just a moment. Um, first off, um, as indicated in the agenda report, there have been multiple studies that show an inverse relationship between sales price appreciation and filtering rates. And filtering rates are the rate at which rental units become more affordable over time. And while this is a very complex relationship, the studies have shown even in high demand markets like ours, this inverse relationship of units getting more expensive um, inversely relates to um, rentals, uh, rental filtering. And so over the course of decades, a reduction in the escalation rates of sales prices could result in lower rental rates than they otherwise would be. And I wanna be clear here um, that I can't think of much, maybe anything that we can do that will actually lower sales and rental prices in this community. Um, that's gonna take some larger macroeconomic forces to actually lower the prices. But we can do a number of things that have the potential to lower the rate at which increases occur. There are lots of things that we can do to lower the rate at which increases occur. And um, there is a potential that um, a point of sale reporting process in some instances could lower sales prices. It certainly wouldn't in every instance, but there's the potential. And I'll give you an example. Um, a buyer could think that, well, this unpermitted unit has been on the market or has been in existence for 20 years and the city doesn't know about it, it's rented. Um, I can just keep going on as is and not invest any money in it and have that revenue without any cost. If the city is aware of that unpermitted unit and requiring that it be legalized, then that potential owner could 
um, taken, take that cost into consideration. In some instances, it wouldn't matter to the owner or to the new, to the buyer, I should say, but in other instances, it may. Is this a, a proven fact? Of course not. And, um, you know, could it happen? Yes. In some instances, it certainly wouldn't. But because there's that potential, and because this uh, point of sales um, reporting program could um, help us to identify and legalize additional unpermitted units, we are suggesting, we are seeing value in that and suggesting that council provide direction to research and um, do outreach and uh, then come back with some ordinance updates. We've got a number of things on our plate right now, particularly um, in the, um, rental inspection service, we're looking at automating a lot of the um, payment systems and the registration systems. And so that's really a priority right now. But um, we could, if the council is interested in doing something like this, we could take up an effort like that in, um, in six months or so. Now, um, there are a lot of things that the council could consider in relation to this. First off, you could just say, nope, we're not interested in point of sale reporting. If you are interested in it, then you don't have to answer all these questions, but if you have um, thoughts surrounding that, that could help inform our discussions with the community. Um, the point of sale reporting options could be uh, permit history only, similar to what um, Salinas does. It could add basic findings. So someone reviews that and says, based on what we see, we think only one one single family residence should be there. Or it could add mandatory or on request inspections. Um, it could uh, be inspections of just unpermitted units um, or unpermitted construction, or it could cover the life safety items that we typically do with a rental inspection. Similarly, um, there are options in relation to corrections and permitting. Um, would we just be looking for unpermitted units? Would we be looking at unpermitted additions um, that have to uh, then be permitted? Um, would there be a specified time frame, or would we just include those with the existing legalization program, which as I mentioned, sometimes you know they, they can sit there for five years or more. Um, so really what we need to understand from the council today is based on the direction to bring back a discussion about this, do you want us to pursue a point of sale reporting uh, option or um, would you uh, suggest that, that we do not do that at this point in time? The final item uh, for discussion um, is something that wasn't explicitly directed, but it's in response to uh, a number of the comments that we heard from individual council members and certainly from members of the community, where individuals have expressed concerns about units being taken off of the market as a result of the residential inspection service. and. Um, in most cases, um, if not all cases, the, the unit is actually being taken off the market. The residential inspection service may identify it, but it's not meeting planning requirements or it's not meeting building requirements. And that's why the unit would have to be taken off the market. You know, we mentioned before that there's only one or two that are vacated per year. And there have been 15 in our legalization program that have opted to, to, um, to go out of the program. But, um, those, uh, the, the inconsistency with building and planning requirements is what brings them offline. We have very little flexibility in um, what we can do from the building code perspective. We can utilize SB 1226, but those are state codes that are put in place. Now, on the other hand, we have a significant amount of flexibility as it comes to um, our planning requirements. And so, if the council really wanted to um, value the, uh, the keeping these unpermitted units um, and legalizing them, then um, we could pursue an amnesty program. There are 31 units right now that do not, that we know do not comply with current um, planning requirements. And um, we could, um, pursue program that would allow for uh, those units to be legalized in exchange, for example, for 
affordability requirements. Um, there are some significant trade-offs there. Um, certainly, um, we'll have some who may not be in favor in the units in the first place, or some that say, hey, I wanted to do something like this and I was playing by the rules. Um, and so there are very significant trade-offs here. And there are also some very real threats to putting a, a program like this together. One, particularly if there are affordability requirements, um, some owners could be unwilling to uh, proceed. And certainly if, if the city doesn't know about their unit, they might be more unwilling to proceed. And then of course, um, SB 50, some owners may um, not wanna proceed because of SB 50 coming down the pipeline, which was made a two year bill this year and could, if it's approved, allow up to four residential dwelling units on all single family properties throughout the state. So that particular, uh, you know, if, if someone didn't meet the density requirements, for example, um, they had four units on a property where there could only be two according to the planning density. They may say, hey, the state might allow me to do this next year without any affordability restrictions. So again, with this, um, we have a, a full plate. This would fall onto our advanced planning team. We have, um, a, we have an approved from council six month work plan that was just approved last month. And so we've got our, our chart, our, our, uh, our path is charted for the next uh, six months and delaying that um, would actually be better if you wanted to pursue something like this because then we would know better where SB 50 is is heading. Um, so that um, sums up the, uh, the approach that we are suggesting. Um, maintain the current um, residential rental inspection service, enhance our community outreach, um, research, um, conduct outreach, and prepare a draft ordinance for residential point of sale reporting, and then um, provide, we're asking council to provide direction on whether or not you would want us to uh, pursue some sort of temporary amnesty program. And Laura and I are both available for questions. Council Member Myers. Uh, I just have a couple of quick questions. Um, could you remind me, was it 11,000, something like 11,400 units? Total, That's correct. Total yes. rental units yeah. in the rental inspection program? Yes. And do you have an estimate of how many, do you feel like that's pretty much capturing uh, most of the units in town or are you? Is Those there are the ones that we have currently registered in the rental program. It also includes the uh, units that are exempt also from the rental program, meaning that they're being inspected, for instance, by housing authority. So it also includes those as well. And these would include apartments um, and, 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 and multifamily types of situations as well? <coughs> yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, so interested in, or curious about this amnesty program idea. Um, so you, there were 450 unpermitted units that you'd identified. 31 of them have been identified as potentially being applicable for the amnesty program, but it um, mentions that they're expected to be more that qualify. So I'm just curious um, what process was used to identify this initial 31 and uh, how far have you gotten in analyzing the 450 compared to that 31? So like, have you gone through th four, four, 399 of them and then you've only identified 31 or have you gone through 50 and identified 31? So out of the um, 450 units that we have identified right now, 158 have gone been going through the legalization process. So we do have a figure of where they are in the process. Mm -hmm. Approximately 300, um, what uh, one of the planners did, and the person that's also involved with the legalization process, she went through and just scanned to see one um, based on the zoning regulations, based on setbacks, based on just the planning um, regulations, which ones would be able to move forward through the legalization process and which ones would not be able to move forward with the current um, planning um, regulations. And t um, 31, approximately 31 were identified as not gonna be able to move forward with them. And there's certainly the potential that more could be identified. You know, that was, that was a first cursory review, um, quickly looking at things that often uh, uh, come up as um, roadblocks. But 
as you dive deeper into the analysis, other things could come up. That number could grow, and certainly, uh, you know, it's it's intentionally identified as 31 known because there are undoubtedly units um, throughout the city that um, we are unaware of, and um, we're not sure whether or not those meet planning requirements or not. Thank you. And with the 15 that have been removed that you cited on there, uh, is that? after contacting the 450 people or owners of the units, of that initial contact, 15 of them were removed while the 300 are still pending? Or how does that work? Like with regards to, you have 450, did you send out letters to all of them and they were identified as having issues and then they voluntarily removed those units? Or was it that they were being enforced on, like they weren't on the queue anymore and then they were moved into that process of having to Fix it. For instance, the 300 that are um, currently pending, what we do is a batch of 25. We um, do batches of 25 and move those through the legalization process to be able to assist the property owners in detail and go through the process. There's six steps that goes uh, that um, occurs during this process. And it's during that process after the property owner has already obtained all the information of how much is going to be in order to legalize the unit, um, and it's through this process and after the property owner has been informed and given all the information that they require that they think, okay, whether am I going to continue to pursue the legalization process or if I'm just going to convert it back to what it was originally. And out of the... Uh, again, the 125 that have gone through the legalization, and some of them will come forward on their own. Doesn't mean that it's uh, particularly uh, ones that were already moving through that process. Um, they'll go ahead and say, no, we'll just go ahead and obtain a permit to convert it back to what it was originally. So out of the, I mean, I could probably do it really quick on my computer, but out of the amount that have been processed through the 25 at a time batches, what mm -hmm. percentage of those have been removed from the market? About 10%. We've got 158 mm -hmm. in the process. 10% uh, have been, 15 have been removed, so roughly 10%. Okay, so it's 158 or is it 125? No, 158. 158, okay. Yeah. Um, wonderful. And then, so about 10% loss, which is concerning with regards to units and people being able, I mean, granted that they're out of, um, out of code or building. Other question, uh, you'd mentioned that tenants May I clarify one thing? Oh, yeah. The uh, 15 units that have been removed from the rental inspection services, um, those are the ones, for instance, that um, have decided obviously not to go through the legalization process. Now, the legalization process um, has started, it started, I believe, in April in 2017. Um, that's how many units, 158, that have um, gone through the process. These, some of the units could have been removed prior prior to that. So it doesn't mean necessarily that it's just been in this uh, period of time that all these 15 units have been removed. Thank you for that. Um, I think I only have about one more question and that has to do with the statement that was made about not having to be complaint based because of the concern of the threat that tenants would face because uh, you mentioned the tenants don't complain because of fear of retaliation and eviction. So besides keeping it as a anonymous complaint base, anyone can complain and that triggers an investigation thing, which has caused a lot of problems for different tenants in the community. Um, what are some things that you would recommend that we could implement that would protect tenants from retaliation and evictions? So the program as it currently exists provides through its proactive approach, mm -hmm. protection for improving the quality of life, health and safety of these units without tenants needing to fear of retaliation because of its proactive nature. Um, if it turned into a reactive complaint-based program, then uh, a landlord would likely assume anyone who is complaining about the living conditions in the unit would be the tenants, and even with the new state law, um, 1482, um, SB. SB 1482, um, that is um, uh, gonna, assuming the governor signs it as he likely will, um, gonna put in place, um, sorry, it's AB 1482, thank you. Um, that's gonna put in place rent control and just cause eviction protections. 
that fear and the knowledge of that in and of itself may not be out there in the community and that fear of retaliation regardless of that, particularly if individuals you know, are vulnerable in terms of very low income or undocumented status, um, could drive individuals to not report the program. And so um, the state is um, putting in some provisions that can help to address that. Um, in relation to the, the program now, I, I firmly believe that um, as a proactive program, we protect tenants substantially more than would be the case in a reactive one. Great, and then is it local or state law that um, units, if they don't have bathrooms, have to be physically connected to the main property? That would be one moment. Do you know the answer to that? I'm gonna. I see uh, John McLucy, John McLucas, who is our um, interim deputy building official, who can speak to that. That's a, a basic requirement. Any, sorry. <laughs> That's a basic requirement of any dwelling unit. It has to have a bathroom. For the state or for the city? For the state. For the state. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll just do a quick um, kind of time check, uh, given kind of our time constraints for this today's meeting. Um, can I get a sense of how many members of the community want to address the council on this item? Okay, okay. We'll, um, we'll have an opportunity to hear from you. This is a big uh, item, so we're gonna likely have to take it bit by bit and, and hopefully get through majority of it. None of it is very pressing, I don't think, in terms of needing to have a time kind of um, immediate action by the council. I know we have some additional questions. Um, I'll just sort of kind of ask my council members to be aware of that and um, and then we'll come back and have a chance to kind of get into what the specifics will be. So I had Vice Mayor Cummins, <coughs> Council Member Brown, and then Council Member Crone. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And um, personally, I see how these programs can help um, by being um, non-voluntary because of the concerns around retaliation against tenants that landlords could impose should they want to report mold or any other kind of um, condition that might be unhealthy for, for living. I was curious around the, of the 450 unpermitted units, what are some of the more common things you're coming across that makes them in violation of the city's code? So I know that some of the examples you showed earlier um, with you know, for example, there are buildings that might have failing garages, they might have exposed wiring, they might have um, the, the um, water heaters that were, you know, on, uh, where flames were coming out of them um, being concerns. Are those some of the conditions where we find these units coming offline or is it other things like ceiling height, um, ADA accessibility? Can you just kind of speak to what are some of the ways that these units or, or rooms might be coming offline? Some of the conditions that um, would, uh, where the inspector would have to post it, vacate, would have to do with, for instance, egress. That's one of the major issues where there is no egress. Um, if there's, for instance, a water heater in the bedroom, um, that those would be the, the situations that um, would cause for these units to be vacated. Yeah. They get vacated? yeah, that was because I was really trying to understand for some of these that um, have been removed, you know, like um, it seems like some of them that that might be an easy solution, right? Trying to relocate a water heater inside of a house, but some, uh, you know, other situations where I've met with people in the community and um, they have issues around like the height, like ceiling height in the houses and that being, um, you know, a reason to potentially pull something offline, although some people might be find living in that kind of situation. Um, so just trying to get an understanding of. Yeah, we have had, uh, for instance, um, structures, uh, un unpermitted structures where there is no sanitation, where there is no cooking facilities, where there is, again, the no egress. So there has been instances where it's not considered to be a habitable <coughs> unit um, for a person to um, be able to stay in those units. It would be considered unsafe. And if I could just add, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but a ceiling height issue. I have also um, talked with a community member who had a unit taken offline, and, and that's um, I've, I've had that experience not only in this jurisdiction but elsewhere due to ceiling heights. And the the challenge there is the um, uh, the state codes 
and you know, if, if it met a state code at the time it was built through 1226, then we can take that in consideration. But if it hasn't met any state codes, then we're very much challenged to do so. And, and I ask the, correct me if I'm wrong, in an instance like that, um, that would not be um, uh, requiring removal of the tenants. We would just put them in through the legalization process and they could, for example, try to excavate or try to raise the house as has been done in, in certain instances, but that can be costly. Okay. Council Member Brown, do you have a question? Yeah, I, thank you for the, the report. I have two questions. Uh, the first is, could you refresh my memory, perhaps our collective memories on how, when you say it's page one, two, three, on page three, approximately 450 dwelling units have been identified. H how are they identified? Um, I understand the process mm -hmm. after they, or the contact is made and they, um, the, the, the six steps and all of that, but how are these units identified? Well, they're identified through two, um, two methods. One of them, it could be the proactive inspection program um, inspection services, and the other is also through a complaint base. So the code compliance division is made out of both the rental inspection services as well as code compliance. So they, it could be both this number of 450 um, identified units could be from either or, not just necessarily for from the rental inspection services. So follow-up question then, um, if there are units that are not enrolled in the rental inspection program, it, the only way then for uh, them to be identified would be through a complaint? Yes. So then the same challenge applies. I guess I'm just getting at the, the challenge that you talk about going to a complaint only system. The same challenge applies for tenants who are living in units where they're not in the rental inspection program. Yeah, right? and we have okay. found that some of the units that, um, for instance, we receive a complaint on that um, are, uh, uh, a reactive program goes out there and identifies it, they're also rental units and therefore we do communicate with the rental program as well as the legalization program so it does get um, entered into the system. And th thank you. And then my second question is um, on page six, you know, and we've discussed it, that the city does not have the ability to reduce building code standards below those adopted by the state. Um, uh, however, the, um, there are some flexibility now with 1226. Uh, what is this, the city's um, responsibility to en for enforcement? Are we required to enforce all of these codes, state codes? When we find out about issues, then yes, it's incumbent upon us to make sure that if people are inhabiting dwellings, that they are compliant with the, with the state codes. And um, there can be alternative ways in which that compliance is achieved, whether it's through SB 1226 or through an alternate means and methods of construction. Um, there are, are ways in which um, an equal amount of protection can be achieved or you know, we, we try to exercise flexibility through those while ensuring that the intent of the codes is met. Um, our objective is to legalize the units and to make sure that they're safe. And um, in doing so, we look at everything on a case-by-case -case basis, but uh, we do have those codes that are sort of our boundaries for doing so. So we're legally required to enforce? Correct. And any clarification on that? I would kind of turn the question around a little bit. Is the city legally liable for not enforcing its code? Another way to look at that. Um, there is uh, generally immunity in the government code for failing to enforce uh, the law. However, um, recent precedent has sort of um, altered that. Uh, and I'm thinking specifically of the a ghost ship fire in the city of Oakland in which um, a lawsuit was filed against the property owners, the city, and others 
um, in connection with the tragic fire that happened there. Uh, the city filed a motion based on its statutory immunity uh, to uh, essentially taking the position that it didn't have a legal obligation to enforce its own codes um, and the court rejected that. So that, that's become an issue that will be litigated. Um, but uh, I think there is a risk inherent in um, just looking the other way when code violations come to our attention that the city could be ultimately liable for, for not um, taking steps to address known hazardous conditions. Just to, I just want to say, I, I'm not that I'm suggesting we go that route. I just wanted to get a better sense of what our role and responsibility is as we consider moving in directions where we may have more flexibility about what we enforce with 1226. Thanks. Uh, before we get to more questions from council members, and I know council member Crone, you're next for questions. I'm gonna go ahead and open it up for public comment and then we'll come back and we'll get your questions answered so that we can eventually maybe get some direction on this item since we're at limited time today. So those who are interested in speaking to our, us on this item, please come forward. Anybody who wants to speak briefly in about one minute, you're welcome to come forward um, first. Is there anybody who wants to briefly speak, don't like it like this, what, what have you, in one minute, let me know. Any one minute uh, public comment speakers by show of hands? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and open it up for uh, tw two minutes. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Rick Longinati with the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. So our group has, as part of its mission, uh, preservation of affordable housing. And so this is a great opportunity for you. I think that the staff is asking for direction. Uh, they already have a priority to preserve uh, units and to legalize them. And I think that bringing forward their amnesty program uh, is, is really the opportunity that you have to encourage them to, to continue with that. Uh, we might have had an amnesty before doing the rental inspection ordinance, but now we get a second crack at it. So um, I would ask that you, that you do that. There's certainly many uh, planning regulations, you know, a distance from property lines and so on that, that, uh, that we have the, the power as a city to change. And it would be just a real shame to, to lose units on account of that. One of the downsides that was pointed out by the staff report was that people might be resentful because, you know, hey, I played by the rules and somebody else gets an exemption. Okay, I get that. But uh, if you compare that to losing a housing unit, what's more important? Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Please come forward. You'll have up to two minutes. I'm um, Gina Jeffs, and I'm um, an evil landlord. Um, if you could just, if you could, if you wouldn't mind facing the council, thank you. I'm an evil landlord, and um, I, uh, I really resent the 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 cl classic characterization of landlords as evil and greedy. I have worked as a teacher and a, a second job in order to pay for these houses. The only people that's making money on these houses this 25 years that I've owned them is the banks. And so I've been contributing. I go after work to take people's garbage to the dump in my own truck, even at my age of 74, because I can't afford to pay it. Nobody's doing the math. We don't get to keep the money. I have a first mortgage, a second mortgage, repairs, taxes, rental inspection fees. Um, so I would just love people to consider that when they're doing these things. My tenants are my friends. I have students. I have, I don't discriminate. I have elderly people. I have one woman who was hit by a forklift at work. She's disabled. I have people with children. One has cancer, the child, and it's breaking my heart because of stuff the city inspectors have done and how they're condemning my units, which they've inspected as safe and good for, for five or six years. Suddenly it's a catastrophe. Everybody is gonna die if I don't do something. They're safe, there's not a problem. It's an eighth of an inch difference in a size of a water meter. People, these people are gonna be out and these people are not gonna find another place. They don't have the funds to go out in this market and find something. The place is safe, they love it, they wanna be there. I care about them. I'm a human being, I'm not just a landlord. 
And uh, I've always done the right thing. Even if my house isn't right, I always see to them first because I committed to that. And I know I can't talk anymore. Thank you. Next speaker. Thank you. Hi, Sandy Hockman. I support the landlord. Um, when you guys are taking these programs like you did Just Cause, um, I sell real estate and we actually were going around interviewing other coworkers during the time the Just Cause argument was going on, how many people were actually selling um, that were rentals and are becoming first time homeowners, which is going to happen, which is going to be nice as well. Maybe a lot of first time homeowners are gonna be able to afford West Side, maybe a little more, but you're gonna have higher rents, you're gonna have more students or other people not able to afford rentals. You're gonna have a lot of people who um, think that this is helping them and actually it's going to only hurt them in the future. Uh, just um, from the sewer laterals that the owners already have to pick up right now, as well as low flow toilets and everything, you're not talking like $500. You're talking right now with a sewer lateral and if everything is any issues, 30 plus thousand dollars. So to put on top of that, um, bringing per certain properties up to code that may or may not be, it could turn into just a primary family residence and it may come off of um, the rental market and that's gonna really actually increase rents, not decrease. So thank you very much. Good afternoon, Darius Mosinin. Um, I'm actually opposed this uh, measure here for on two, two fronts. Let me just talk about the uh, point of sale. Uh, that's actually rather <clears throat> tricky because it can actually shift the burden of disclosure from the seller actually to the city. The city can't possibly know all the history of a home. Uh, my brother, for instance, was sued uh, selling a, after he sold a home in Berkeley because he didn't disclose that a raccoon came into the basement uh, or the, uh, the crawl space. And they went to binding arbitration and settled for like 50,000. A city inspector won't know that. And anybody, and any of the realtors, I'm sure there's several in this room, will know that they infer, um, <clears throat> agree that they advise their clients to disclose, disclose, disclose. So, so every, I'm reading these charts and what is asked to being disclosed is just a fraction of what sellers at least those that get it and are want to avoid further litigation, disclose. I just sold a home. I disclosed unfriendly neighbors. I disclosed deer coming up on the property, raccoons coming on the porch, in addition to the unpermitted outlets that I replaced and things like that. <clears throat> but if now we, you the city, choose to go this route with a city-based point of sale, concern is, and Mr. Condotti kind of you know, mentioned it with the ghost ship, how no cities are not immune from um, litigation for their actions and as far as code enforcement and inspections concerned. It could possibly put, put a burden on the city. And anyway, like I say, most, if not all, homeowners selling a house um, do exhaustive, exhaustive disclosures. And there's a lot of due diligence on the part of the buyers. They go to the county, they go to the city, they go and after all, what they have a vested interest in doing it. They wanna drive the house price down, so they come and they try to find any kind of flaw. Thank you. <clears throat> Next speaker. Good afternoon, uh, Bill Cook. I live in Santa Cruz. Um, <clears throat> a building contractor in this town for 30 years. I'm also a landlord. Um, uh, I'm sorry to say that I, I'm, I'm happy to hear um, Mr. Butler describe um, a shift in policies it, to my ears. Uh, uh, it's uh, in general uh, the way enforcement actions occur are, are, are very much, in my experience, very much at, a, at variance with what, what's been described. Um, uh, there are no limits to the number of times that a complaint can be filed. Um, my property was complained against twice, both times it was found that there was no merit to the complaint. There are two parts to um, our inspections in our town. One is zoning. A property can be found not to be in compliance with zoning 
or it may be found to be not in compliance with health and safety. Health and safety has been covered for <clears throat> 75, maybe 100 years in the city of Santa Cruz by the building department. That's a building inspection. We added this process of rental inspections 15 years ago or so, uh, and it is duplication of that effort. Tenants should absolutely be protected from wrongful eviction as a consequence of uh, a health or safety violation. Zoning is another question. This is, this is entirely up to leadership. We are burdened by our current zoning. It restricts what our possibility is. Uh, SB 50 is, in my view, a great idea. I hope, I hope we find a way to embrace that. Thank you. Thank you. because I'm gonna ramble a little bit. This is uh, Gary Phillip from Santa Cruz. I, I think, uh, my, in my opinion, the sale of property is, is a random event that means really nothing or should mean nothing to you. You know, when you buy a property, you buy the property rights that come with it. It really doesn't matter who owns it. Why does that trigger an inspection? I don't know, I don't get it. Um, you know, it's just, uh, anyway, uh, the other, item is just that in general, as with these codes, you know, it, it comes down to sort of an ex post facto law situation where if something is legal when it is built or whatever, you can't retroactively go back and say that it's, it has to be upgraded. Sounds like a nightmare of 100 year old buildings con conceivably being compared to codes from long ago. And, you know, I mean, you can find violations of codes like an eighth inch crack in a driveway if you want to get tough about it. And, there's 10 grand or whatever. I mean, I don't know. It, it sounds like it's going to raise rents by generating huge amounts of money that people are gonna have to spend on all these properties. And uh, the judgment involved in whether it's really safe or not, or just a violation or not, or sounds very iffy. And uh, I, I don't know, that's, that's really all I have to say. Okay, okay next speaker. Good afternoon, my name is John Flanagan. I have what I consider to be kind of a unique position. So I'm both a real estate broker, but also an investor. And so um, I'm listening to the conversation around point of sale, and I'm trying to figure out if the point of sale only applies to properties that have been complained about, or properties that are registered in the rental registry, or if it's all properties in general. And from there, I would say that as a real estate broker, what I see is a tremendous amount of effort, energy, money required to enforce these codes. But from an investor, I mean, purely from a financial standpoint, I love the idea, right? Because you're gonna drive down the price of housing and make it more affordable for me, who has money and resources to buy these houses. And I'm gonna pick these houses up cheaper, which means that I'm gonna be able to rent them for the same amount, maybe even slightly less, but I have less competition. So. The pragmatic me wants what's best for the community, and that is not a point of sales code compliance. But from an investor point of view, I mean, I'm gonna look at the city of Santa Cruz as being a prime investment opportunity if you come to enforce code compliance like this. So thank you. Okay, next speaker. Hello, Elise, Elise Casby, renter and activist. I just wanna say that, um, first of all, and I don't think this is any malintention by anybody on the council, but renters are not able to be here right now because they're at work. <laughs> so their entire weigh-in on this item is pretty much vacant. So I just wanna say that I've heard horror story after horror story after horror story. Um, we can cite the sociological study that has tremendous credibility um, that Steve McKay and students have done throughout the community. M um, walls that are so mushy that if somebody leans against them or puts their hand up, they just cave in. Lack of bathrooms, all this kind of thing. Um, people living with children in really hazardous conditions. I wish more renters could have been here. But having said that, I think at this point in time, flexibility is key because we do need to maintain 
uh, affordable units. I just want to disagree also before I finish with uh, Mr. Butler. I think there was in fact a tremendous amount of discussion on the council about this and that happened after um, the city did not actually pass renter protections or any kind of protections from unjust eviction. And so the council actually had a lot of discussion and one of the things that came up was that the point of sale could be a time to gather a lot of information about what's really happening out there for renters, for owners, for everybody. So I think that the point of sale might be a good time to do it. I just wanna say the problem that we're in here is a ridiculous problem of lack of supply and that's because for over 100 years in Santa Cruz there's been a refusal for the city to buy and build low income housing, not just market rate based affordable housing. We need to do that. Uh, also, please um, protect the tenant, tenants and yet if it's complaint based, the tenants could be protected at that time. Thank you. Next speaker. Lynn Renshaw, SantaCruzTogether.com. If you intend to require new code compliance for every property sold, you should be transparent with the community. Several questions. You know, first, I'm glad to see the intent is to limit code compliance to unpermitted units or additions. Properties built uh, years ago met the standards of their time. However, I think it's a little bit misleading the public by framing this and putting it in the rental inspection program if the intent expa is expanded to unpermitted additions on any property when it's sold. So to, to put it into this particular program does not seem transparent. Um, I also think that to be transparent, this proposal should clearly state the problem you are trying to solve. The report stated goal of lowering property values and it states that multiple times. Where is the community input showing that stakeholders want lower property values on balance among all types of, of the people you represent? And then where is the, city, the study on the city revenue impacts? Have you considered how this proposal could backfire by focusing on buyers? If expensive code compliance is required to purchase homes, entry level buyers with extra cash will be shut out. So for many buyers, it's all they can do to scrape together their down payment. If then they have to come up with tens of thousands of dollars to remediate the problems identified, that is going to shift the per, uh, that's gonna gentrify our community because only people with more money will be able to make those repairs at the time of sale. <clears throat> and then, you know, is the city council's place to interfere with markets by seeking to lower home values? Please, oh, very okay. slow, thank yeah, you. Thank you. Okay, are you wanting to speak? Okay, why don't you come forward and you'll be our last speaker then. Go ahead, you'll have up to two minutes. Uh, good afternoon, Scott Graham. Um, I'm in favor of changing to a complaint-based uh, system here for the rental inspections um, because the tenants in these places are the ones that should be complaining, not uh, neighbors, not city employees driving by the properties, not drones flying over the properties. Um, there should be some sort of whistleblower protections for tenants so that if they do complain that the landlord can't retaliate against them. Um, and to uh, council person Brown's uh, question about how they are how these units are discovered. There is a Stasi-like program that is part of the uh, parking program where if somebody comes in and wants a parking permit and the parking department doesn't have that unit on their list of approved units, they get turned into planning. This is a terrible program. This is, this is way overreaching. You, you, you tell people they need to have a permit to park downtown or other areas of town, and then you come in and either close down their housing or put an extra burden. San Luis Obispo used to have a rental inspection program. 
The big difference, which they don't, the, which would, has been ended, but the big difference when they did have it was that tenants <coughs> could opt out. That if a tenant didn't want their uh, privacy violated, the right to privacy violated by the city, they could opt out of the program. At the very least, I would like to see something like this in place here, but I'd like to see the program change to a complaint-based system. As far as amnesty goes, I'm in favor of amnesty. I'm in favor of legalizing as many units as possible. And also, the, the people that owned units that have been abated in the past should be contacted and said, hey, if you wanna bring your unit back online and go, go for this amnesty program, please do so. Time is done. Okay, you'll be our last speaker, please come forward. Hi, I'm Carmela Weintraub. I'm a resident of about 60 years here, age 77. I have had a 1904 uh, rental for years and I uh, have spent a hell of a lot of money keeping it beautiful. And I resent some of the things, the costs that have been shifted to me and my husband who are now retired and don't have a lot of money. We're responsible for the strip in front of the um, property, you know, the little parking area. We're responsible for the lateral sewer thing. If we do wanna sell, we have to do the lateral sewer inspection. Now we're gonna have to do the inspection for the whole thing. And I don't like it. I do also do not like being characterized as a bad landlord. My property has passed numerous inspections, one of which was a month ago, and it's fine. I don't like this whole program. I know, for instance, in relationship to the other guy who just spoke, we had a loss of, of water pressure, I'm not pressure, but water use or no, and then all of a sudden we had an increase, which was actually the result of a leak. It was reported by the, the uh, water department to your department, and they questioned whether or not we were currently renting, and we weren't, you know, and it was like, what kind of bull, you know, is that? I don't like that. I honestly don't like being characterized that way. I want this to stop. My husband and I made this investment. We have a lot of money in that building. We don't have the money in the bank. I don't like the city council and I don't like the planning department messing around with my bank account that is in a property. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and return it back to the council at this time. I know there were some pending questions by Councilmember Crone. I just wanna go ahead and remind um, my colleagues that we have limited time today and that some of these, um, if we can keep our uh, focus on um, the policy direction that we wanna give at this time, I think we could all, obviously this is a lot of really complicated policy and I think we could all ask a number of questions. Um, but for the purposes of today's meeting with our time constraints, that we um, try to remember that we need to get procedurally moving this along. I'd like to have this item um, with some policy direction or potential continuance be uh, wrapped up about uh, 240 or so, um, given that we have additional items to cover. So I know you had questions at Councilmember Crone, then Vice Mayor Cummings, and then Councilmember Brown. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just real quick, the, um, the Housing Authority program, how, could you talk about that a little bit and how is our program different and I know a lot of people who rent under housing authority and would never rent with uh, city inspections. The housing authority program um, is uh, a state program that uh, the tenant would need to qualify for. Now the housing authority program doesn't, um, while they do grant the tenants to be able to stay in these units, they don't normally, um, look at whether the unit is a uh, legal, a, a permitted unit or not. So they can't, uh, they don't have the authority to also legalize a unit that is unpermitted. Um, I do believe that they do um, have inspections, but they're not yearly inspections. They might be 
by yearly inspections that are conducted. And their uh, list as far as the inspection list um, is um, not the same as the rental inspection services thank that you, we provide. Thank you. Lee Butler, what if we took the housing authorities checklist and used that instead, or even actually um, made them the inspectors? I think we would be sacrificing um, some of the health and quality of life issues. Our, our list is more extensive than theirs. And so we, uh, they have an incentive, you know, that's for section eight tenants. And if, if they make that program too onerous, then, um, <clears throat> then individuals are gonna choose not to use section eight. Um, we also have an incentive and to you know, make it an easy program to use, and we try to balance that with also making sure that we're meeting minimum health and safety standards. I, I hope we can look into you know, using housing authority because they are dealing with the most vulnerable folks in our community, and they are looking out for health and safety is what I understand, um, and I think Certainly we should be yes. following their guidelines. Covered parking, if you, is that ever an issue when you encounter a unit and they don't have covered parking? Covered parking can certainly be an issue. That is definitely the case with garage conversions. Um, and um, sometimes those are new units, sometimes those are bedrooms. In any case, um, uh, for ADUs, the council addressed that earlier this year. Um, however, um, for single family residences, covered parking is still required. The uh, team is looking to bring back something to the council in the coming months. It may be um, sometime early next year that our advanced planning team gets uh, a change in front of the like council. I would like to see us look into that, that getting um, that covered parking ordinance off our books. Uh, going back to the outdoor bathroom that Councilmember Glover was talking about, I don't think it really got fully addressed. Can you use an outdoor bathroom and for, for various units? I'm gonna um, So if you have up. two or three bedrooms outside away from the house or something built, can you use an, um, a, a, an outdoor bathroom? I'll have our, our code expert here uh, chime in. Again, John McLucas. Yeah, generally the, the bathroom itself has to be con a contiguous part of the dwelling. Does. You okay. can is have that a state outside. law or is that a local law? It's a state law. It is yeah. a state law. Yeah. Th thank you very much. Um, uh, do do in tenants have to? Somebody brought up the idea of, of uh, you don't ha you can opt out. You know, do tenants have to let inspectors into the house? There is a provision in our ordinance that allows for tenants to refuse an inspection. A property owner is not allowed to do that, but there is a provision in our ordinance that allows tenants. So tenants can opt out of the inspection? Tenants can, yes. And But if the owner's not living there, then it, it's uh, moot. Then the tenants can just say, no, we don't want an inspector. They, the tenants have that option of um, refusing the inspection. Um, going back to um, the... Uh, Mr. Kandati, um, we don't have a legal requirement to enforce codes. I wasn't sure, I, I'm still running that around in my head. And you, did you say the ghost ship um, uh, case has gone to the court, but it's, and they, they ruled in favor of the city of Oakland that they did not have to legally enforce their, uh, their codes? No. Um In that case, the city of Oakland filed a motion to dismiss the case at the pleading stage, basically saying, even if we neglected to enforce our own building codes, um, there's no liability here because we are immune from liability for failure to enforce the codes. And the court rejected that argument, so that means that it's a, it's a an issue for trial, and I don't know the most recent procedural history of that or whether or not that case has been resolved, but I doubt it. Thank you, and I just last thing I'll say is I just wanna support Mr. Cook and Ms. Weintraub. I don't like the rental inspection program either. I never have liked it. I think it's onerous, and I think, you know, if, if it was up to me and we had the votes up here, we would disband it and then start over and bring in folks like yourselves to what, what kind of program would actually uh, work and be effective. And I'm not even, and I know you both said you're landlords, I'm talking for the students. I hear it from the students at the University of California, Santa Cruz, who find it very onerous and uh, it's not a help to them. And I've had the same uh, experiences that Mr. Cook has had as well. Um, and uh, the, uh, I don't also like the, uh, I'm not in favor of the homeowner inspections either before selling. And I don't know where that came from, but I'm not in favor of those inspections. Thank you very much, Ms. Mayor. Okay, Vice Mayor Cummings. I think um, there's a lot that needs to be, well, 
I think there's a lot that needs to be learned by the community and council around just all the different intricate parts of the, the rental inspection program. Um, I think it's I think it's good that we have a program that is um, actively going out and making sure that the units that are being rented to folks in our town are safe um, because I've come across plenty of students as well who have said that they've had mold and they're experiencing issues because of that, um, but they feel scared to go to their landlord and tell them about that in fear of having a rent increase and so, or being kicked out. So I, I hear the concerns on, on that side. Um, and I think it's really important that we, you know, are really focusing on making sure that the health and safety standards are being met to protect residents. Um, the point of sale program, I'm still a little uh, hesitant on as well because it, I, I hear some of the concerns from folks in the community around, um, you know, bringing the units up to code, the costs that that w um, could impose on them, and for some units it might not even be possible depending on their age. Um, and understanding that, you know, when some people go to sell their houses by getting an inspector, an inspector to come in and check out to s the property to determine whether or not there are any code violations is a really good way for them to be able to um, have that influence the price of the houses. Uh, and then kind of getting to the point that was brought earlier about SB 50 and how that might have impacts on um, kind of units that can be on a property. I think that we really need to better understand where the state's going with that um, before we make any decisions on, around our local policy. So I'm gonna make the, um, a motion to direct staff to explore options for an amnesty program to legalize unpermitted units and provide the council with an updated report and recommendations on or before the first meeting in April, including within that report recommendations that take into account options for the city's rental, ins rental inspection program available under SB 1226 and as they relate to the passing of SB 50 and um, also uh, enhance the expansion of tenant outreach that can also be community outreach as was uh, asked for by um, city staff. And then also have a study session on the rental inspection program and include information on how proposed amnesty programs and changes to focus on health and safety can benefit the program in February of 2020. Second. That was a bit of a tie. I will go ahead and say it was uh, Councilmember Glover. So we get a motion by Councilmember, Vice Mayor Cummings, seconded by Councilmember Glover. Um, Councilmember Brown and Councilmember Matthews. Just, I'll just quickly say, yeah, I, I'm gonna support that motion. I am not interested at this time in a point of sale program uh, through the rental inspection program. I think it is an expansion and it wasn't entirely clear to me um, what housing would be covered. And um, with all due respect to the folks who, uh, the laudable goals that you pursue in, in maintaining health and safety, and, and I absolutely agree we need to do that. Um, I'm not a big fan of the rental inspection program either. I hear many stories from um, you know property owners, from tenants about the, um, you know, the ways in which they are, the housing stock is put in jeopardy and, and the individual cases of that. So, um, you know, I'm hoping that we can do whatever we can to facilitate legalization of unpermitted units and um, bedrooms. And so I absolutely support pursuit of an amnesty program. Um, I'm interested in under, better understanding how um, SB 1226 can help us become more flexible in our interpretation of what, um, you know, what kind of enforcement we will be doing in the future. Councilmember Matthews. Um, a few points, uh, and they'll be almost random. Uh, my impression is that SB 1226 is now incorporated into our practices. It's fairly new, I'm, this is a question, so we don't yet fully understand the full range of how it will affect uh, what's permissible or not. Is that a fair? question or correct me? <laughs> I, I would say that um, we look at every case on an individual basis and that's because depending on the year it was constructed, depending on the construction type, depending on, you know, if you've got uh, insulation in the walls and you don't need to do anything in the walls to meet the energy code of the time or, or you need to do something in the walls to meet the energy code of the time but you've got an uninsulated attic that's got easy access, then we look at, all right, well, insulating the attic will um, meet the intent 
there. So we, we try to apply flexibility and we use those old codes in doing so. And, and so we have used that and we will continue to use that. And, and really it's not a blanket um, because everyone has to be uh, looked at individually. So I guess the purpose of my question was that the, the clause here, taking into account options for the city rental inspection available under SB 1226, that's moot. We're already doing that. Is That's that correct? correct. We are already doing that. So, uh, um, and then, well, I'll just say for the record, I really do support the rental inspection program because um, I think what the record shows is it uncovers some truly genuine, serious threats to health and safety. And it also identifies many other conditions which can be readily cured. And I speak from personal experience, I was grateful for that. Un uncovered a few things I wasn't aware of, fixed, done. Um, and so I think overall that does uh, over time contribute to um, the rental housing stock in the community. So I support your recommendation, which is um, to continue the rental inspection service. And that's implicit in your motion, okay. Um, uh, I do want to ask about exploring options for the amnesty program. I'm certainly open to that. I think you told us that that would, um, given your work program, that would occur in the next six months work program. Did I understand that correctly? We do have a council adopted work program for the next six months for our advanced planning team. And um, as it relates to SB 50 um, or an amnesty program, that would fall onto our advanced planning team. And so it would have to occur after that six month period because we've council's already given those priorities. So how does that jibe with the motion on the floor? Is that, um, is that doable? I mean, maybe you consulted here. <laughs> For the amnesty program in February, I mean, we, we may not have an opportunity to provide a lot of research um, in advance of a study session in February, um, but we could, um, in the April timeframe, um, certainly have some more information. And, and if it's the council's desire to have something in, in February, we can bring back what we have at that point and we'll know more, a little bit more, although that'll be the beginning of the legislative cycle. And so um, we'll certainly know more in April um, about SB 50, just in terms of what we're, we're hearing, although it certainly won't be a done deal at that point. Well, I would just suggest um, maybe trying to look at the dates and see how realistic those are for what's already in a heavy, heavy duty work program. Um, and then this motion calls for a study session on the rental inspection program. Um, I guess that um, we have had quite a bit of discussion here. The concern is more on how it affects amnesty than on the health and safety inspections. Do I understand that correctly or not? No. Okay. Um, well, I had at a previous um, uh, council topic on this subject of housing expressed interest in a study session on how all the state laws coming down the pike are affecting what we can do and not do. And I would still appreciate that. And um, do you want to make an amendment to the motion to incorporate other kind of policy into the study session? Is that what you're? Well, asking? the study session, this is specifically on the rental inspection program. I'm actually equally, if not more interested in understanding what more changes in the state that. legislation, how those affect what, again, what we can and cannot do. I think it's going to be pretty substantial. Um, and I will say, I, I also am not at all interested in point of sale. Um, programs coming forth at this time. Okay, maybe we could keep our comments and try to move it along, but Councilmember Glover and then Vice Mayor Cummings and then Councilmember Meyer. Yeah, just moving into some of this and to respond to some of the things that were mentioned. Um, I do think that it's really possible for us to ensure health and safety of tenants um, with adjustments and or potentially the removal of the current rental inspection program as it's currently structured. I am also not a giant fan of it because of the impact that I've seen it have firsthand, uh, not uh, on people that I know, as well as on uh, landlords that I know and the impact that it's had on them. 
um, one of the main issues is that it breeds distrust with neighbors. And so we see people that get um, reported anonymously and then they lose all trust of their neighbors and it breaks down the cohesiveness of a neighborhood. Um, also with that anonymous nature, as Mr. Cook mentioned during his comments, uh, it could open the door for undue harassment. So if there's already underlying neighborhood issues, then it could, uh, procure harassment from people. Um, also, as Mr. Graham suggested, and this is something that I think is really important for us to be thinking of, as you know, I'm an advocate for tenant protections, is to explore the uh, implementation of a whistleblower protection program uh, to ensure that tenants that uh, make complaints, if we do decide after study sessions or conversations to shift over to a complaint-driven process, uh, to ensure that tenants are protected from eviction and retaliation, and that could include uh, aspects of exorbitant rent increases or displacement. So I just want to let, just want to put it out there that it's totally possible for us to achieve all of these things uh, while still um, aggressively reassessing the potential structure of the rental inspection ordinance. Okay, Councilmember Myers. You know, in the interest of time, I think I'm gonna. I, I, many, I've shared many. I, I don't, I just uh, just want to publicly state, I don't, I'm glad that we're all in agreement on the point of sale. I think that's, uh, I was not going to be supportive of that. I believe that we've expressed through our planning process that um, we, will, we will be having a housing study session. So I don't know that we need to finish this motion, but um, I'm supportive of where we're going and, uh, and I would be supportive of, of Calling the question. <laughs> okay. Do, um, okay. Do you have additional comments, or do we want to just go ahead and take the vote on the motion, Vice Mayor Cummings? I think you were. I was just going to say, with regards to the study session, the idea is that in February. I mean, we've had a, a lot of discussion here, and it seems like we need. You know, so I think the public has expressed interest in learning more about the rental inspection program. You know, how what constitutes people being displaced from their their housing. And um, I think that we all still have a lot of questions regarding this in between now and February. It would give us an opportunity to really dig deeper into the rental inspection program, share information out with the, the community, and then have the community come in and we can all have a conversation around the rental inspection program, where it's going, how it relates to, and, and including information on the proposed amnesty program. It's not limiting um, our ability to have more information in that study session, but you know, just capturing that we're going to include information about these proposed programs, and if there's any changes to focus, really focus on just the health and safety, um, that that's an opportunity as well. But there's no, we're we're not leaving out the opportunity for that study session to also focus on other topics as they relate to SB 50 um, or other state bills that might be coming, and um, and I left out the um, the current rental inspection program just under the impression that we're not going to do anything with it at this time. So. Okay, so that's inferred that you're not changing. Yeah, no need to vote on it if we're not going to change it in my. Okay, so we're not going to take action on that tonight or today. Um, I, we have Council Member Cronin and then Council Member Brown. I'll just briefly make a quick comment that as we move forward with this um, direction that we don't lose sight of sort of the whole holistic conversation around housing affordability and get in the weeds around a specific individual kind of program that we may or may not like in terms of what we're ultimately trying to influence here is how are we supporting tenants, how are we maintaining a healthy and um, and uh, livable housing stock, and how are we holistically as the city council being responsive to the affordability issues in our community? So that would be my only comment. Councilmember Crone, Councilmember Brown, and then let's go take the vote. I, th I think the um, the rental inspection ordinance has actually broken down um, op affordable housing opportunity since its inception, and that's from a, a, a renter, a homeowner, and a and a landlord perspective, um, from not just from me and from all the uh, from other folks, um, I, I appreciate the study session. I think we could have one next week and and really tackle a bunch of stuff too, just in terms of um, rental inspection. Um, the mold issue, I just wanted to ask, because uh, I I hear that too. But is that included in rental inspection? Do you pick up a lot of mold issues because it doesn't seem like I've seen that in the checklist. <laughs> That is correct. We do pick up that as well. You do. How do you do that? You do. Do you have a? Is there a if box? I could, if I, maybe if okay. I could, if we could, uh, Councilmember Cohn, just in the interest of time, if you could get your questions answered about some of the specifics off duty offline, that would be ideal. Okay. Given and our I, time the last thing I wanted today. to say was that the city does similar to the police department. I mean, the city um, planning department has wide discretion on what it goes after and doesn't go after, and I just like to give the direction that the amnesty program is um, is really important. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for also understanding. Councilmember Brown. 
Just in response to uh, Council Member Matthews' point about SB 1226 and us not needing to take action, um, just to clarify uh, that I guess what would be helpful in that case is to just ensure that we get as part of the kind of report back and recommendations that come to us, we get a uh, report on ha what's happening there, what the planning department and the rental inspection program are doing vis-a-vis -vis 1226 um, so that we know and we can take that into account as we make any additional recommendations. Motion to call the question. Okay, we have a motion to call the question. Is there a second? Second. Okay, motion by Council Member Crown, seconded by Council Member Myers. Any, um, all those in favor to call the question, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Let's do it. All those in favor of the motion on the floor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. And um, our next item is item number, is consent public hearing, and these are items 17 through 19 on our agenda. Any council member interested in pulling either seven, any items between 17 and 19? 17, 18, or 19, Council Member Crown? I, I, just a question for uh, the city attorney on, you know, there was an issue with um, ads for, for cannabis uh, on bicycle taxis, and how would we get at, at um, working with bicycle taxi owners who wanted to display cannabis ads? As we read the code, um, advertising mobile displays of that sort are, are presently prohibited. And so um, it would simply be a matter of uh, amending the municipal code to authorize that type of advertising. That being said, I have not researched whether or not um, the state law would have any bearing on that, but we'd have to look into that as well. And um, as you know, um, this, uh, cannabis ordinance that's on your agenda today is really just one piece of a much bigger project that will be returning to the council uh, sometime in the spring and, and we could certainly address the advertising issue at that time. Just so I can respond to folks, is it just those uh, bicycle tax, or is it just cannabis that can't be advertised or bicycle taxis in general can't have any advertising, mobile advertising? Uh, I can only answer the first question. We look specifically at advertising cannabis because bicycle taxis are um, able to travel throughout the city, then they would fall within areas in which uh, advertising cannabis could be exposed to uh, underage uh, individuals. And so um, the analysis that we did was specific to cannabis, but Thank you. you know, that's a broader discussion. Be happy to look into Would that. cigarettes fall into that too? Uh, I believe they're subject to different regulations, not the same. Another question? Thank you, yeah, that, thank you. That was gonna be my question for the city attorney was, does that just apply to cannabis or does that also apply to alcohol and cigarettes and stuff? But we can talk about it, this is a larger conversation. Yeah, there's generally rules around advertising in regards to those substances. Okay, so this, uh, forgive me, it was actually items 18, 19, and 20 on, are the uh, titles of our consent agenda item. So given uh, that none were polled, um, is there any member of the community who would like to address us on our consent public hearing items 18, 19, or 20? If you're seeing none, we'll go ahead and um, return back for action and I'll go ahead and entertain a motion. I'll move the consent public hearing agenda. Okay, I'll second. We have a motion by Councilmember Brown. We have a seconded by Councilmember Myers. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay. <laughs> that passes unanimously. <laughs> okay, great. We'll maybe have a, a maybe a three-minute uh, window as we do a transition to our next item, which is uh, public hearing, and that's item number 21. And we'll take a yeah, two-minute. Okay, ready? Okay, we'll go ahead and call the meeting back. Um, so our, um, we're on our next item, which is item number 21. 
and it's a public hearing, and this is an appeal item. So it's a public hearing for 110 Cooper Street, floors five and two, and uh, City Council will review the Planning Commission's approval of an administrative use permit to establish a medical office, Kaiser, Permanente on the fifth and second floors of the existing 110 Cooper Street. And um, the process will go as follows. We'll have our staff introduce the item and present their report. We'll have uh, Council Member Myers, <coughs> excuse me, who requested this item be heard by the council. Um, she will be giving, given up to 15 minutes to speak and present evidence in support of the appeal. The opponents, um, whoever is designated, will have also 15, up to 15 minutes if they so choose to pre present any evidence or position. We'll go ahead and open it up to public comment, and then we'll have an opportunity for the appellant to uh, rebut, and at that time, there's not an opportunity for any introduction of new information. And we'll return back for council action and deliberation. So we'll go ahead and hand it over to our staff to kick us off. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of Council, Eric Marlatt, Assistant Director of Planning. I'd like to introduce Clara Stanger, who is the project planner and will be giving the staff presentation today. I'll also note that uh, Economic Development Director Bonnie Lipscomb is also here to talk a little bit about her involvement um, with the permit process on this particular application. Thanks. Good afternoon. So quick overview of what I'm gonna talk about. First, I will go through the timeline of actions that have already happened on this item leading up to today. Um, then I'll do a quick description of the project um, and then a discussion of the staff analysis of the administrative use permit. So the project went to the zoning administrator on April 3rd, 2019, where it was approved. Um, it was then appealed to the Planning Commission by Bob Cagle, who's the CEO of Product Ops, a local tech company um, that's also loca located in the same building at 110 Cooper Street. Um, the Planning Commission denied the appeal and upheld the zoning administrator's approval with a three to one vote. Um, there were no subsequent appeals filed by the original appellant. Um, however, this item was called up for city council review by Council Member Myers. Zoning Ordinance Section 24.04.175 allows any council member to call up a final action for city council review as long as they make that request within the 10 day appeal period. Um, and that was done within that time. Um, the item is then heard de novo or basically all over again from the beginning at a city council meeting. So, um, this is a proposal for Kaiser Permanente to um, take up some space at 110 Cooper Street. The location is at the corner of Cooper Street and Pacific Avenue. This is located in the Central Business District um, Zone District with a general plan designation of Regional Visitor Commercial. Um, that encourages a mixture of uses that serve both residents and visitors. Um, the site's also located in the Pacific Avenue Retail District of the Downtown Plan. Under the downtown plan, a medical center use is allowed on an upper floor of a building in this um, sub-district with approval of an administrative use permit. So the total square footage um, is uh, proposed as 21,641 square feet. Um, it includes the entire fifth floor of the building and part of the second floor. Um, Kaiser is proposing to have up to 42 staff members and up to 45 patients in the facility at any given time. Hours of operation proposed are 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday. So on the fifth floor, um, that's what you see on the screen right now is a layout of the fifth floor. They're proposing 13 provider offices, 22 exam rooms for by appointment visits, a conference room, a reception area and waiting room, a lactation room and administrative space. And then um, now we're looking at a um, partial of the second floor plan because they're taking a part of the second floor. Um, I wanna note that product ops, um, which is the, was the appellant to the planning commission is also located on the second floor. Um, so the second floor for Kaiser will include a clinical lab, a small pharmacy, a radiology department, a conference room, reception area, staff break room, and also administrative space. Um, so there is a condition of approval that it, um, allows Kaiser to move um, to a different floor within the building um, when they apply for their tenant improvement permits, as long as the total square footage 
um, of what they're proposing does not increase from um, what is approved on the administrative use permit. The reason why this condition was added, um, um, this was done when the project was appealed to the Planning Commission um, to allow flexibility in the final floor layout because at that time um, we had an understanding that Product Ops and Kaiser were potentially going to make an arrangement where they moved to different floors to work things out. Okay, to, so to approve an administrative use permit, uh, for this permit we need to make three findings. The first is that the proposed use conforms to the requirements and the intent of the zoning ordinance, um, the general plan, and any relevant area plans. Um, the, any, uh, the second finding is that any additional conditions stipulated as necessary in the public interest have been imposed. And then the third condition is that um, this use will not constitute a nuisance or be detrimental to the public welfare or the, to the community. Um, so planning staff found that the project is consistent with several policies of the general plan and also the downtown plan. Um, for example, policy um, LU, which is the land use section, LU 4.2 um, encourages uses that reduce the need for automobiles. Um, so downtown is by far the most densely developed area in the city. Um, therefore, people who are in the downtown are a lot more likely to walk to their appointment than to drive there. Um, then if the, um, if the medical center were located elsewhere in a less densely developed area where people are further away and are more likely to have to drive. Um, in addition, um, because there's so many different uses downtown, people are more likely to be walking maybe from their doctor appointment to somewhere else in the downtown to complete a multi-use trip, whereas if the medical center were located elsewhere, the people would more likely be driving there and then driving to their next stop. Um, general plan policy LU 4.3 encourages the development and expansion of neighborhood commercial services and general plan action LU 4.3.1 seeks to identify areas that allow um, the expansion of existing neighborhood facilities within easy walking distance of residential areas or areas well served by transit. Um, so the downtown area does have quite a few residents. Um, it, the downtown area does not have a whole lot in the way of doctor's offices. Um, so this is an important neighborhood use for the downtown. Um, it's in within walking distance of many residences and also within walking distance of the metro station. Uh, the community vision of the downtown plan calls for a diverse and wholesome environment for commercial, cultural, civic, and social pursuits for both residents and visitors. Um, the Kaiser offices will add to the um, diversity of the amenities and services offered to residents within the downtown, as well as to other Santa Cruz residents um, who are visiting the downtown. I wanna briefly note that um, for finding number two, um, the language in the proposed resolution includes language for the applicant to submit a formal request to the Public Works Department to create a dedicated patient pickup and drop off zone on Cooper Street. Um, this language should not have been included in the finding since it reflects a condition of approval that was removed during the Planning Commission hearing. Um, therefore, that language should be deleted from finding number two. Um, so overall, planning staff determined that several gen general plan and downtown plan policies support approval of this administrative use permit. Um, if the city council wanted to deny the use, then alternative findings would need to be made. There are um, some other general plan policies that also come into play for, the, for this project. Um, and Bonnie Lipscomb from the Evolve I'm sorry, the Economic Development Department um, would like to take some time to discuss their role in the project, um, and she's gonna do that right now. Thank you. Um, good afternoon again, Mayor and members of the council. Um, I'm here to just talk a little bit about, one, why economic development is, is involved in what typically is a planning process. I know a lot of people are um, have asked that question, or why am we involved in land use? And um, actually, in the general plan, there's a whole chapter um, on economic development, and there are a number of policies, goal, goals, policies, and actions around economic development in the general plan, and it's coming from that perspective and the overall long-term downtown sustainability and viability, which is why I'm here. Um, specifically in the general plan um, on, under economic development, and I'm, I'm quoting from the general plan, 
um, economic development is focused on the well-being of residents and businesses and the overall quality of life in Santa Cruz. The section of the general plan focuses on what we what will be needed to maintain the city's competitive advantages um, to mitigate its economic weaknesses and nurture a vigorous and diverse economy. There are a significant number of uh, goals, policies, and actions in the general plan. These have the same legal status as the other chapters of the general plan, including land use. But I would also argue that these two chapters are not mutually exclusive. In fact, there, there are multiple cross-references between the land use chapter and the economic development chapter, encouraging consideration of land use for economic development stability, including maintaining and expanding employment intensive uses that have a long-term economic viability. Specifically, um, I have a couple of them here. Um, and I wanted to mention that, oh, you know, the, the first one, ED4.2.2, preserve existing and seek new industries and businesses at the cutting edge of science and technology. Um, we have a number of policies in the general plan specifically around supporting tech and um, the technology um, in Santa Cruz. Um, we also have a, a, a ED 6.3, foster and retain locally owned businesses and startups. I would say over the last 15 years, part of our economic development strategy really been, has been to cultivate um, downtown vibrancy, filling office space downtown, maintaining that balance between office uses, retail uses, and businesses. And the tech community has responded um, so well to engaging downtown. I would say over the last 10 years, um, we have filled up a lot of our office space, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in general. But during the economic downturn, it was the tech companies that really kept downtown alive. So I think it's really important to talk about the importance of them in our community and specifically in our downtown. Um, additionally, um, we have um, a few more policies I'll just mention, foster new technology-based enterprises, um, and these other references are references across different sections, cross-references in the general plan. Foster new technology-based enterprises, promote development of new and retrofitted industrial and office space that meets the need of technology-based businesses. And this one's particularly important to talk about how flexible we need to be at times, particularly as our office space is filling up. So I'll talk more about that in a second. And then work towards expanding the city's technology infrastructure. So what this is about, um, I think for us, is uh, that while you can make the findings, and the findings have been made, and they're supportable um, for allowing medical use on a second floor, um, there are some locations in the downtown where it's not a great fit. Um, and when we're looking at downtown, and right now, some of you may be familiar with the fact that we're actually doing a downtown strategy, and we're working, um, we've met with over 100 stakeholders so far, and we're working on um, long-term downtown sustainability and what are the appropriate mixes downtown? What does our downtown look like? Um, and the current and future office needs of tech and creative businesses, and we have an extremely low vacancy right now in office. It's under 2.7%. When you actually look at availability of, of spaces, office spaces larger than 6,000 square feet, this is the last one is in the Cooper House, these two spaces on the second and the fifth floor. I don't want to um, understate that. Um, there's a variety of smaller spaces, but this is you know, arguably the nicest, closest to class A office space we have in the downtown. And it's the only remaining space over 6,000 square feet. We also have a sensitive retail environment we have an existing growing vacancy in retail. We want to support our locally owned businesses. We also want to support the remaining anchors that we have down, downtown for retail. I mention this in this context because something that's going to likely come before you within the next year um, is going to be to look at some adaptive reuse of some of our larger big box retailer spaces. I know that you've been following um, Forever 21 bankruptcy. Um, we've been actively engaged um, with them and with the owner in that space. We're concerned about that and we're concerned about being able to fill that space. So I'm just providing this context of downtown is changing. And we're looking really closely at what the different varied uses are downtown. Um, on retail, and why I'm also mentioning retail, is specifically on Cooper Street, it's the most impacted block um, that we have in the downtown. It's a vibrant block. We love it. You know, it has frequent street closures for festivals, events. Ma has done an amazing job activating Abbott Square. Um, we have a variety of businesses there. But we have a few retail and we have a restaurant, you know, we have we have some other uses. And the the actual available, the very few parking spaces we have mean so much to those remaining businesses that are there. Um, if you don't see a parking space as you're driving by, you probably won't stop at all. Um, so my concern about this particular block 
um, and my concern overall about Kaiser going in on this block is really related to that sensitivity. Elsewhere in the downtown, we have more flexibility. We have other opportunities where there are adjacent parking structures, there are parking lots. Cooper Street's the most impacted. So that's why I specifically have concerns um, on that street. Um, so going a little, in a little more detail on some vi viable alternatives and why I, I think they're there and what specifically we would be looking for um, specifically for medical use, we'd be looking for a dedicated entry so that they would have their own dedicated entry, whether it's on a ground floor or a, an upper level, um, that they can come in. They wouldn't be shared with other tenants, wouldn't be shared with other users. Um, we'd be looking for spaces that are single tenant spaces, no, uh, you know, shared upper floors, um, shared access. Uh, there's even some, uh, there's even more than one opportunity actually that's a standalone building. Um, we'd specifically be looking for our off-street drop-off. So the ability to actually have a patient drop-off um, off of one of our main downtown streets. So off an alley um, is preferable. There are a couple of opportunities off an alley um, and being able to designate a space. I wasn't supportive of designating a drop-off on Cooper for the reasons I previously mentioned. That street is already so impacted. Um, but there are other locations in the downtown where it is appropriate. Um, also be looking for adjacent or connected parking and um, where possible, and there's a couple of, of opportunities, um, looking for spaces where the majority ground floor access for, um, for a medical clinic and pharmacy, and we do have some for that. I think for uh, patients, for uh, it's, it's less confusing to be able to walk in straight off the street if they don't have to push a call button or have a secure entry point. I think for a pharmacy to have that street level access, I think it's gonna be uh, much better um, for the users and patrons of, of Kaiser. And then finally, I think just maintaining our extremely limited office space for primary office users and utilizing other available spaces for mixed use medical and pharmacy in the downtown. So finally, I wanna say Kaiser is a welcome community partner. I mean, I think, you know, just <laughs> I wanna end on that because we do want Kaiser downtown. It's really important for our economy. It's a needed um, service that they're providing. And they have gone, you know, over and beyond in engaging with the community, supporting the community. So I want to mention, I really do want Kaiser downtown. I just think there are some better locations that really work for the long term um, and we want Kaiser long-term downtown. They're gonna work better for balancing downtown business and community concerns and needs that enable long-term downtown sustainability. And then going back to the general plan that support that vigorous and diverse economy downtown. Thank you. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up our presentation. Um, so in conclusion, planning staff has found that the findings can be made to approve the project. Um, council has a couple options, you can either uphold the Planning Commission's decision to acknowledge the environmental determination and approve the administrative use permit, or you can deny the permit with alternative findings. Um, this concludes the staff presentation and we're available to answer any questions. Is there any questions for the, for the staff at this time? Yeah. Seeing. Um, no, I'm good. Okay, okay. So, um, We'll uh, ha maybe have to entertain some questions later, but I know we're gonna have a process now to hear from uh, Councilmember Myers, who um, is essentially speaking as the appellant on this item. And Councilmember Myers, you'll have to follow the same protocol as any appellant would have, and you'll have up to 15 minutes to speak and present evidence in support of your appeal. And then at which time we'll go ahead and hear from uh, responding applicant or, or um, the opponents, and they'll equally have up to 15 minutes to speak to the item and we'll go ahead and have you kick off your time now. Great, thank you. Um, and I'd just like to start off um, by really recognizing what an important community partner Kaiser is. And um, I'll tell you a little bit how we got here um, in terms of some of my discussions with businesses downtown, as well as um, working with economic development to really understand the framework of what we're um, looking here in terms of this opportunity uh, to have Kaiser expand its services and uh, move into a larger facility. Um, my intent with the discussion is really to recognize, I think Bonnie touched on this, this is what we all hope will be a long-term uh, residence uh, in a sense in our downtown for Kaiser. And, I think that's the, the framework that I'm looking at this in. I mean, we hope that this clinic and these services are available for our community for a few decades, uh, at least a decade or more. 
Um, I know it's expensive to move such a facility into a community. Uh, I'm very respectful of that. And, but it's really that long-term um, position of where this, this facility sits in our downtown that has really um, become apparent to me in terms of wanting to continue to um, have some discussion with council on this. Uh, as Bonnie mentioned, um, and earlier today it was mentioned, you know, we've been rebuilding our downtown since, 19, since the 1989, 1989 earthquake. And one of the really intentional things we did was to do what a lot of downtowns are trying to do now, which is really mix residential business um, and then have other supporting services. And we have a very vibrant downtown with our retail, our growing um, evening types of businesses, and then our um, housing and then uh, critical facilities like medical clinics as well as supporting nonprofits and various business types. And we wanna make sure that that vibrancy continues here. So when I um, first initially talked with Bonnie, I then went out and talked to several businesses in the downtown and I broadened my discussions beyond tech, tech companies. I talked to nonprofits, I talked to creative companies that were downtown. I talked to several financial service companies. I talked to a number of legal service companies and I also talked to some professional engineering companies. And what I came away with is everyone is struggling for office space downtown. And it's really affecting the way that businesses are deciding whether to stay there or needing to move to other places within the city or potentially out of the city. So in, as I uncovered some of these uh, restrictions, it became more apparent to me that um, along with the land use findings that you know, obviously were upheld in, in the decision, um, I also couldn't ignore the actual economic development questions around the, de around the decisions for, for the facility here. Um, I have met with the Kaiser's uh, leadership and I'm very clear on their um, really true need and interest and uh, timeline to expand their facilities and be able to serve more people. Um, they've invested in us and um, we know that they've uh, also committed uh, serious resources to getting this far in our planning process. But um, we've also seen uh, just actually great change in our retail environment downtown just in the last six months. And most currently in the last several, several months, literally in the last 60, 70 days, we've seen a lot of change um, and anticipated change in some of our larger retail spaces, or excuse me, larger spaces in downtown. So adding all this together is really why I brought it to bring and called this up for um, discussion with council because um, I really feel like this is a, a very pivotal decision in our downtown at this point in time. Uh, we wanna see this as absolutely a long-term use. We wanna see this use be convenient for the patients. Uh, and so I think having several of the um, values that or attributes that uh, our economic development director outlined is really important in thinking and working with Kaiser to move forward. And that is uh, availability of parking, um, ground floor, if we can find that for them, uh, frontage, <coughs> retail frontage for the pharmacy. Uh, I'm, I think it's excellent that we would have a pharmacy in downtown, another option, uh, but within the downtown core. So I, um, my greatest interest is, is really for us to work as a partner uh, with Kaiser moving ahead. And um, so I will stop there. And I do have a motion to uh, put on the floor, but I know that the appellant has um, a uh, time to respond. I'll just close with um, really just saying that um, this is really a critical uh, question and partnership um, that we wanna move through with, with Kaiser. We want to um, uh, see if we can uh, find a place that makes sense for you long-term and most importantly for your patients and our, for our community. Uh, and we also at the same time really need to be aware of how we continue to um, grow our downtown and have it be a successful place for people to work and live and also find the services that they need. And uh, so I thank everyone from Kaiser. Uh, I know I've seen a number of you sitting in the audience for a long time this afternoon. And so I really appreciate you being here. So thank you. Can you go ahead and pause the time for a second? Just for clarification, for process, is it appropriate for the appellant to share the proposed direction that they might wanna go in, even though it's for this case a motion, but just to sort of make that part of the hearing? 
That I don't see any problem with doing that. That seems appropriate. So you don't necessarily have to put in a motion form, but if you're interested in the remainder of your time to show share your proposed direction, I've generally I feel like I've generally seen that in these types of cases. It makes makes sense to me. Okay. Do you want to continue the time? Not necessarily the motion, but you can go ahead and just share as part of your presentation your proposed direction because then the appellant could actually speak to that right. and you could potentially rebut right. it. So it's part of just the general process, I'd yeah. say. Yeah. So um, so I don't need to do it as a motion. You don't need to do it as a motion, but you can. You don't have to put the motion, but you, no. well, but you would, you would continue the time based on what we had available. Sorry for the confusion. Okay. Uh, so I do have a motion, so I think I'm just going to work from that, sure. if that's uh, appropriate. Um, so at this point, my motion is to deny the applications 19-006 uh, uh, without prejudice for establishment of medical offices on floors 5 and 2 at 110 Cooper Street. And this is based on the findings of inconsistency with the city's general plan policies, including land use um, 3.2, economic development 4.2, and economic development 6.8 as well as general plan actions, uh, <coughs> land use 3.2.1, economic development 1.7.1, and economic development 4.2.2. And number two, to direct our econ economic development director con to continue a search for an alternative location for the Kaiser Medical Office in downtown, <coughs> and for our planning and community development director to prioritize planning review and action at such time <coughs> that a new location has been identified. And I'll just make a note that should a good faith effort to explore alternative locations prove unsuccessful, the denial without prejudice would allow the applicant to reapply within the year. So um, I'm really trying to uh, hopefully work, work in a way that we can continue our conversation. So thank you. We can debate the motion. This is not on the floor at this time, but this is part of the presentation for the appellant. I don't know. Maybe you'd want to speak. I just want to time. clarify something. I think what you what you mentioned was you want to deny with prejudice, or without prejudice. I'm sorry, without prejudice. Without prejudice. Yes. Which is. I gave you the wrong one. Is it not listed up there? Okay. So yeah, I just want to make sure that you have the right one up on, on the screen. Gotcha. Sorry. <laughs> okay. that was the one that, yeah. Did you give it? Did I give you? Because that's a that's a clear distinction. Oh, okay. So I just want to no, make clear that people understand that it's it's Sorry, without it. without prejudice. That's her, that's I, important to point I, out. Yeah, I had given her a couple of copies, so yes. Okay. Without prejudice. Okay. Thank you for that. And that concludes my presentation. Presentation. Okay. Thank you. We'll go ahead and ask now that the opponents or the responding applicant um, come forward, and you'll have also up to 15 minutes to present your case or any evidence to the council. Mayor, was that a motion? Was it seconded or? It's not a motion on the floor. It's part of the presentation. Okay. It's just sort of a unique circumstance, but that they can speak to it now that it's been presented in evidence. Correct. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Mayor Watkins, Vice Mayor Cummings, and the council members. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity here to talk to you about our interest in this project and uh, the belief that this is the right place for Kaiser Permanente and the clinic to exist for our members and for the community at large. Um, a few things were brought up, and I think just want to step back and talk more about generally from a Kaiser Permanente perspective. Um, our brand is one of total health. Um, so when you look at it from that perspective and the need that the community has demonstrated, uh, largely because we've uh, outstripped the space that we've, uh, we've been in over the past two and a half years, which has been a locust street. Uh, there's a clear need within the community. I don't think there's, that's, it doesn't sound like that's up, uh, anybody's debating that particular issue. Uh, the question is, is, it, is this the right space and is, is it the right space now? And what I wanted to share with you is a little bit more of the timetable that we've gone through. Uh, the AUP was submitted in January and you <laughs> saw that the, 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 the uh, Ms. Tango <laughs> talked a little bit about the rest of the timetable of when the zoning administrator took a look at it, when the planning commission took a look at it, and now we here, we're here in October uh, to, to discuss uh, the next steps for this particular project. Um, prior to the AUP submittal, we spent several weeks looking for places. Um, and this is the best space we landed on. And since then, we have spent a significant amount of time and resources developing the different uh, proposals and design of the space to best optimize it for patient care. Um, I think it's important to note that um, this, this space, you know, the, the, the downtown area is dynamic. I've no doubt we wait six months, we'll find another space that's gonna be different. 
we wait another six months, we'll find another space that's going to be different. From a business's perspective, and I'm maybe on, on behalf of KP, but also on behalf of probably other businesses, um, there has to be some level of predictability in the process. And that's where the challenge is at the moment. After spending about a year and a half on this particular project itself, internally and then about almost 10 months now um, with the city, um, it's, it's a bit challenging to be landing in this space uh, where we've got this particular concern being presented. Uh, we've, we've always been good partners. We've always wanted to be partners. Um, we have nothing against at all what Bonnie mentioned in terms of the vision for downtown. A thriving downtown is great for Kaiser Permanente. Um, having Kaiser Permanente downtown is, is great for the community in turn. So the focus on retail, the focus on tech, focus on business at large, whether they're you know, anywhere, any other industries, is actually a, a net benefit to KP. They're what we, call, we would call future potential members. Um, so we have absolutely no, no uh, concerns from that perspective. Uh, we support that and we actually want to be part of that, that conversation and that fabric, that, that roadmap that's being developed for the next uh, coming several years for the downtown area. Um, where we are at this moment is, and a few things I wanted to point out was uh, the impact of not moving forward with this. One is uh, we're looking at about a year and a half of delay. So if we were to consider, and we have considered a number of other uh, sites along the way, so it's not that we stopped in January and we haven't looked at the market ever since. <coughs> We've looked at other sites. Um, and we continue to look at other sites as a backup option. But we know that from internally that it's gonna take us about a year and a half. And my initial timetable uh, was working with our physician partners to make sure that this particular clinic is up and running in December of ne uh, next year uh, because of the demand. What we don't wanna do is delay care. And every day, every month that gets pushed off, we're talking about uh, delayed care. And that's, that's the challenge that, that gives me heartburn as, as a chief operating officer for the, uh, for the KP Santa Cruz, San Jose region, um, is making sure that people have access to care when they need to, and access to care to a high quality uh, environment and in a very convenient way, uh, which is why we landed on this particular location uh, back in January. A uh, couple other things to mention uh, that I think are worth bearing. One is the um, adding us to the downtown environment of where we are, whether you're talking about Abbott Square or otherwise, uh, just further diversifies the economy. You've got, uh, you've got tech, tech, you've got retail, you've got a number of other businesses. Uh, having a thriving healthcare clinic is one of the two things outside of a good school district that any big employer or any employer generally looks for them before they anchor down into a community and decide this is where they <coughs> want to plant. This is where they want to build uh, and, and grow. Um, so we think, again, from that perspective, it's, it's a net benefit to the community at large. The other pieces too is, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a jobs ad. These are really good, well-paying jobs. This is an opportunity for folks who are both blue collar and early white collar from EVS workers to security to nurses to a few folks who want to be future physicians. Um, an opportunity to connect with the UC Santa Cruz community to be able to provide that access uh, and, and pathway for them so they can see what the future could be like in a, in a healthcare environment, whichever path they choose. Um, so there's lots of other uh, you know, impacts that come from this particular project that we think again would be a net benefit. What I'd refer you to is there's a study by the American Medical Association from 2018, a national study that they conducted that they looked at the economic impact of adding a physician in a specific, in, in a community and did it by states. And if you went on their website, you, it's readily accessible, it's, it's publicly available. Um, there's, they, they accounted for the downstream impacts, everything from the immediate infrastructure that's needed to support a clinic from medical assistants to nurses, to radiology techs, to phlebotomists to what happens to the businesses surrounding it and the, and the city and the, and the county in terms of taxes. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at that because I think that's, it, that's pretty eye-opening in terms of the ripple effects that a 13 provider office clinic uh, can provide to their downtown area in terms of when you, when you talk about folks coming to downtown and creating a vibrant downtown to be able to have those businesses thrive as we thrive. Um, the other piece I'd mentioned to you is we talked about, I think there's some conversation about uh, the density and how the downtown area is congested. We're mindful of that because believe it, believe me, we're, we're one of the first folks to hear it from our members if they can't find parking. Um, 
and, and our physicians hear about it. So uh, even considering all those pieces, again, this was the best location we landed on, and we firmly believe that having invested the time and effort that we've had in this clinic, um, it is the best option to move forward at, at this given time. And I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Joyce Orndorff, who's our physician in charge for the Santa Cruz uh, downtown clinic, uh, to speak a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Watkins. Thank you, members of the council, for having us. I'm not certain what I can add to that, but I would like to speak a little bit more about what goes on in our clinic today and how we envision moving forward. I, as I was sitting there, I was quickly tallying up the type of visits that I get in a typical day. I was just looking over last week's schedule. There was one day when I had about 20 appointments. I had four physicals. People were just coming in for the well check, wanted to make sure that they were okay. They were of various ages and they just wanted to get their physical, make sure everything was okay, blood work, et cetera. Few of them had a few chronic conditions, rheumatological, some complicated things, and so we worked through them. I, we had seven chronic conditions come in that day. One gentleman with diabetes, out of control, blood pressure, 196 over 125. I don't know about you, but that's a really high number. Uh, overweight, the works. He was a heart attack about to happen, and I actually <laughs> didn't want to let him out of the clinic because I was so worried about him. But we got him taken care of, and well, he didn't have a heart attack that day, and we're going to keep working on him, and I... I know that we can get them better. So diabetes, <laughs> asthma, et cetera. We had five acutes. And what I mean by acute means I saw two, two abdominal pains, one back pain, one knee pain, and one lady with ear pain. And then I had two folks coming in for evolution of their conditions. And sadly, both of them just got newly diagnosed with cancer. So I was helping them arrange for next steps. So that's our clinic. I was going through this while passing by my OBGYN as she was getting her pap smears, making sure that we get our patients screened for several cancers. I was trying to persuade folks to get their mammograms and, hey, you want a flu shot? I have some, by the way, <laughs> if you like. I, I have plenty for you if you like. I, we, our pediatricians are working very hard as well, and I had some video visits. One person across the seas who's having some abdominal pain, and I'm actually really concerned about her. So we're coordinating her care as she's coming home so that I can make sure she gets to somebody right away. That's our clinic. That's our Locust Street Clinic right now. It's preventative care. It's contributing to the health of our members in this community. You cited some information about studies and whatnot. Well, I'm a doctor, I read medical type of studies, and the studies I show is that folks from 2000 to 2015 who have been with Kaiser Permanente have a 40, 48% reduced rate of heart attacks, 56% reduced rate of strokes. Our members are living and living well. I just wanted to provide you a little bit of an insight into what we do at this clinic. This is a wellness clinic. This is a prevention clinic, and we want to do better. I have lived in this community since, well, I came here right after the Loma Prieta earthquakes. I remember the dust. I remember Book Tent Santa Cruz. I remember how this community rallied, and I see where we are today. So as a community member, I am proud of all the work we have all done, and I think that being Kaiser Permanente will only make downtown better and to thrive. So just uh, adding one more thing before I turn it over to Fernando, who's a member of our team as well, is I think those stat statistics are important um, to anchor, partly because it's not, I think uh, th there isn't a question of whether Kaiser Permanente should be downtown, whether the question is whether it should be in this location. And what I offer in return is for you to appreciate that if we were to move forward with this location, we're looking at probably Q4, maybe Q, Q4 of 2020, Q1 of 2021. If we go to a different location, that timeline gets elongated by another year and a half. That's when, when you know, uh, Dr. Orndorff's talking about care, that's the deferred care. Those are the folks that over time will not necessarily have the access because our current office that's five providers is busting at the seams. So I'm gonna turn it over to Fernando and see if you've got any thoughts. Hi, um, my name is Fernando Avila. I'm with the uh, Kaiser Permanente Legal Department. And 
Um, could I ask that the motion that uh, Councilman, Councilwoman Myers had uh, presented that it be put up? Um, it wasn't until this moment that we saw on the Kaiser side what the proposed grounds were by which uh, our project could potentially be denied. So I'd like to run through those policies, if you can uh, advance it up a little bit more so we can hear, see the bottom. So um, I wrote a letter and submitted it to the council yesterday and I went through what the standards are for supporting findings of approval or denial for an administrative use permit. And those findings have to be supported by substantial evidence, which is facts, conclusions reasonably pr predicated on facts and expert testimony. It's not speculation or just opinion. Um, I understand now what direction this appeal is going in because I couldn't really tell at first what were the potential grounds for denial because it seemed like our application was just a you know really good fit for the code in terms of getting this use permit and putting it in this location. Um, this is a use that is by the code's requirements and by the zoning map, we're allowed to be in this place as long as we meet the conditions and the findings. And the findings are very simple. You know, it's general plan consistency. Uh, has the project been properly been conditioned? And also, uh, is it a public nuisance or is it a detriment to the general welfare, or excuse me, the public welfare? And so what I understand now is that the idea is, is that or the proposal is, is that our project is inconsistent with the general plan. And so I thought I would just kind of on the fly run through these general plan policies and, and uh, statements and let's, you know, see if there's a different way of looking at it. You know, policy land use 3.2, maintain lands currently designated for industrial and office use and land use designations that promote job creation and retention. Well, I mean, we're going into an existing building. We are commercial use. This is a medical clinic. We're not taking commercial or industrial land out of production and changing it to something else. So I don't see how that finding can be sustained, that we're inconsistent with that. Action land use 3.2.1, pursue the expansion of employment intensive uses that have long-term economic viability. Kaiser, you know, when, when we build a building, right now our horizon is that that building be sustainable for a five, uh, 50 years to 100 years. We are an institution, we're not a de commercial developer, we're here for the long term. Um, that clinic will be there for as long as we can have a, the lease go on. Um, and you know, as our, my colleagues have stated uh, I earlier in this presentation, the kind of jobs that Kaiser brings are good jobs. The doctors, you know, those are obviously highly educated professionals. Our nurses, our techs, they're well paid, they're union members. I mean, I just don't see once again how that Land, that, that land use uh, uh, general plan policy can be used to sustain a denial. Um, policy ED 1.7.1, provide continuing support for cultural events and festivals, especially during the off season. Um, Kaiser is great in community. Oh, your time is up, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're at the point in the process where we will have public comment, then we'll return back to the appellant who will have up to five minutes to rebut, and then we'll go to council deliberation and action. So any member of the community who is interested in addressing the council on this item, this is our item number 21, public hearing. And if you are interested, please line up to my left, and um, you'll have up to two minutes to address the council. Hello. Hi there. Uh, my name is Mark Davidson. I work for Product Ops. I'm on the second floor of 110 Cooper House. Um, I go to work every day, and uh, there's a few things that I, I don't like. But first of all, I do support Kaiser to come to the downtown area, but just not in the Cooper House building. Uh, part of the reasons is I just don't see how it achieves the goal of reducing the amount of automobile trips. Um, for one thing, um, sick people tend to have to drive cars. Uh, certainly <laughs> um, know from personal experience, my mother-in-law, of which my wife took care of her in the last uh, years of her life, had to go to a lot of uh, doctor visits and had to drive, had to find accessible parking as well. Um, fundamentally also, um, 
I don't like the idea of sharing the second floor uh, due to health reasons with the medical clinic. I'm concerned about getting um, sick from the shared bathrooms uh, and uh, elevators and what have you. But also just the traffic in front on Cooper Street um, is not conducive for um, a situation in which people are gonna be rotating in and out of a building at in you know 15 or 30 minute intervals. I just don't think that, that works. There's only one accessible parking. There's a, actually a pole right in front of it for, for, the, um, for the wheelchairs uh, if they were to, to be used. And also there's very little bike parking in front on Cooper Street as well. So anyways, uh, I do not support um, Kaiser coming into uh, 110 Cooper House. Thank you. I have our next speaker. I'm a Kaiser member as well as an employee at Product Ops on the second floor of 110 Cooper Street. I love Kaiser. Having broken my elbow this past year, I received excellent care, but I had to drive over the hill to San Jose because we don't have the facilities here. I would welcome Kaiser expanding in our town. But we're not here today to discuss whether Kaiser should or should not expand in Santa Cruz. Undoubtedly, they should. We are here today to determine specifically if the Cooper House is the right venue for a medical clinic. I believe a medical clinic in this location is a bad idea for those of us who work in the building. And it's a bad idea for Kaiser's members, particularly those with accessibility needs. I ask those of you in support of this plan to imagine if your place of work on the same floor was suddenly shared with a busy medical clinic. <coughs> I fear our greatly ex increased exposure to illness through the shared HVAC system, bathrooms, elevator buttons, etc. And I also fear for the loss of our front door security system. I ask the council that when you weigh the needs of the entire community in this decision, please do not throw the safety and health of those of us currently working inside the Cooper House under the bus or callously dismiss our concerns as just a landlord issue. We patronize many downtown businesses for errands, lunches, and business meetings. Many of my colleagues have school-aged children or are in school themselves. This is a public health issue. A sensible space for a medical clinic would have a dedicated parking for the sick, injured, and those with special needs. It would not share common areas with other businesses. I would love it if we can find a better space for Kaiser in downtown Santa Cruz. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. We have a next speaker. Hello, uh, my name is Maya Delano and I'm the general manager of Next Space Santa Cruz. I am directly across the street at 101 Cooper Street and I thought I would just share a little bit of um, my experience of what it's like to have a single entrance um, business on the second floor that is client based. So one of the biggest things that we deal with is parking, of course. Um, we have a lot of people coming up to our second floor just trying to get their <coughs> mail and the amount of frustration of just trying to find a parking spot is very difficult. Um, I also have folks like delivering groceries to me. Again, a lot of times I'm having to come downstairs uh, meet them, they can't deliver up because there's no place to park. So I understand we all know that parking is an issue. Um, the other thing that comes into mind is my current members, they all know the deal, they know where to park, they know how to you know, get themselves settled to get to work on time. Unfortunately, as much notice as they try to give their clients, their clients have a really hard time by the time they get downtown park to arrive on time. So generally, their clients for the first or second time are arriving about 10 to 15 minutes late. The reason I wanted to mention this is for those patients um, you know, who are trying to see doctors, they're most likely going to have difficulty finding parking, getting down there at least the first couple of times. Um, my concern leads to having been, um, first of all, I'm a resident of Santa Cruz, born and raised here. I started working downtown over 10 years ago. I fully support Kaiser coming down. Cooper Street is a gem. Um, I've been here my entire life and watching uh, Abbott Square grow and having the Cooper Street closures has been absolutely phenomenal. Um, as much as I run a community space now, I was an artist before that and so I used to support a lot of art spaces, art community things, um, and now I'm able to support community through Next Space. But one of our biggest gems is being able to roll out Really? <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> this is my first time. You're welcome to leave any comments, though, if you'd like to, and we can review them. Please, next speaker.
Mayor, Council Members, my name's Ruben Hellick. Uh, I'm with Cushman and Wakefield. We're a commercial, a real estate firm, global. Uh, and I work for the J. Paul Company, who owns the building. Uh, of course, thank you, all of you, for your diligent participation and service to our community. Uh, I wrote a script, so I'd stay under time. Uh, I represent, uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm here, of course, obviously, to support Kaiser Permanente and the new clinic at 110 Cooper, Cooper Street. Uh, Kaiser, obviously, has been a great community partner and a trusted organization here in Santa Cruz. And on behalf of J. Paul Company, uh, we believe this expansion will breed, bring much needed health care services closer to our Santa Cruz residents that are located in and around the downtown. Health care touches everyone. And in speaking on behalf of my client, we're excited that KP continues to invest in our city. We appreciate the, that they care about quality, accessibility, convenience, and remain dedicated to serving our residents. J. Paul Company is a major commercial real estate owner here in the downtown Santa Cruz and moreover throughout the Bay Area. They own and manage over 10 million square feet of commercial space. They're experts at running successful multi-tenant commercial buildings, and their tenants include Google, Facebook, Amazon, and many others. Uh, both my client and Kaiser know that this location will work well for all involved, including other tenants in the building, as well as members who will visit the KP offices at the Cooper House. Both Jay Paul and Kaiser are leaders and experts in their respective fields. This is an important location for KP and the people that utilize their healthcare services. I hope you'll consider supporting their expansion. And incidentally, I took this over uh, during the recession and it was vacant, 85,000 feet, all the tech left. Next speaker. Good afternoon, Mayor Watkins and City Council members. My name is Keisha Frost. I'm the CEO of United Way of Santa Cruz County, and I am in support of Kaiser's uh, office and uh, their office clinic at 110 Cooper Street, and I have full confidence that together, just as United is in our name, that we can work united and work together in making sure that this is a space that is conducive to all beings. United Way of Santa Cruz County is committed to creating a healthy, thriving, and safe community for all. <laughs> healthcare and access to quality health care are essential to the quality of life for our residents, and we truly value and deserve that. Kaiser Permanente is an important part of the healthcare fabric in our community, and as an employer that offers Kaiser Permanente's health plan to over 20 employees. Increased access to care is important to my staff. Kaiser Permanente is a generous community supporter and partners with Your United Way on several projects with the goal to increase awareness and access to quality health care services, including our county's 211 helpline, Jovenasanos, which is our healthy youth program, our healthy eating active living projects, and our community dialogues with our local law enforcement. Kaiser's ability to provide service in downtown Santa Cruz will provide valuable, will prove valuable in reaching more residents to offer them wellness services by providing more convenient, affordable, and comprehensive care. Increasing accessibility to healthcare services from a trusted community partner such as Kaiser Permanente is vital to the quality of life here in Santa Cruz County and for our residents. United Way of Santa Cruz County supports the expansion of a new Kaiser Permanente a clinic at 110 Cooper Street, and we hope that you will too. Thank you. Speaker. Hi, um, I'm here again. Hi. <laughs> um, so, looking around Santa Cruz, it's evident that they've invested in almost everything here. I mean, Abbott Square included. Um, their name is on the, the donators' plaques, also like the arena and so many other things. Even my girlfriend. <laughs> got a grant from them and has graduated from UCSC. Uh, so, and they, I think they give like $1.9 billion annually to all the communities or like charitably or to in improvements in the city uh, to the cities that they're in, which is like crazy, like holy crap. It's like government level stipends. And um, uh, I'm in a restaurant in the same building on the first floor. And so I probably get more 
uh, foot traffic than a clinic, or I would when I open, and most restaurants do, uh, Abbott Square included, and there was no debate as to whether they should go in. And so parking is just as much, if not more of an issue for a restaurant going in than a clinic. And so then the only valid argument seems to be uh, their bathrooms, uh, you know, cross-contamination. And it seems like the second floor is mostly executive offices, which is where product, product ops is, um, as well as a pharmacy. And so um, it seems like maybe there's some negotiation that can be had, or, I mean, that's just my perspective and my point of view. I just wanted to share that. Um, yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Karen Braun. I'm a Managing Director with the J. Paul Company. So I'm here in support of Kaiser Permanente's new clinic at 110 Cooper Street. So J. Paul Company has been a longtime property owner and has committed significant investment in the renaissance of downtown Santa Cruz since the Loma Prieta earthquake. Kaiser Permanente has been a great community partner and trusted organization in Santa Cruz. And we believe this expansion will bring much needed healthcare services to Santa Cruz residents that are located in and around the downtown area. Healthcare touches everyone and as a property owner in Santa Cruz, we're excited that Kaiser Permanente continues to invest in our city. We appreciate that they care about quality healthcare, accessibility, <coughs> convenience, and remain dedicated to serving the residents and employees of Santa Cruz. We hope you're, you will agree in supporting the, their clinic at 110 Cooper Street. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Mayor Watkins and esteemed city council members. Uh, I'm Doug Erickson. I'm with um, the executive director of Santa Cruz Works. I represent a 5,000 member organization for entrepreneurs and local businesses in Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz Works would like to express our support of Kaiser downtown, not, but not in the Cooper House. Um, we believe that there are many other op options now becoming available that they should review. And per uh, Bonnie Lipman, uh remarks about the general plan ED 4.6, 6.7, um, these offices really should be assigned to science and tech growth. And I don't really see how that plays into the current needs of say Looker that really is, needs to expand and is doing extremely well. So um, uh, I think that there's uh, places like the Galleria, like UTC Forever 21 that should be looked at. Um, I also think that Kaiser is an extremely valuable member of our community. We all agree there. Um, so please ask the staff to expedite their assistance in, in helping Kaiser find a new place, um, something that's long-term. And finally, uh, just a saying my dad used to give to me is, it's always better to ask twice or three times than to go the wrong direction once. Thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Chris Kodiga. I'd just like to speak about um, Kaiser and Cooper Street. I think the bummer that came out of this meeting for me, because I also went to the Planning Commission, it sounds like there wasn't a lot of upfront communication um, with the city, with city staff. So now we're sort of at this point. Um, people, some people want it, some don't. Uh, so. One of the things that I wanted to bring up with is, you know, the commercial real estate market is very dynamic. And like people didn't know Forever 21 was gonna go out, now they're out, all that. So things do change. What I'd like to say is just if you look at the PAMP clinic up on Mission Street, it has over 80 dedicated parking spots, including disabled uh, parking and access for it, so their patients and employees can park there. They have large patient drop off and pick up spot in front and they have good access for ambulances, medical providers, paramedics, et cetera. And also this process was worked through with the neighborhood. And so here we are on this. So if you look at the Cooper house, there's no dedicated parking spots. There will be 42 employees, 45 patients per hour. And if you look at their uh, plans for uh, uh, Live Oak, they have a 730 car parking garage for a larger building, 160,000 square feet. But if you sort of ran the ratio, you would get that they would need 100 parking spots. And Cooper Street is, is narrow. 
there's delivery trucks, there's a lot of activities going on and events, and I just don't think it's the right place, and I don't know where people are gonna get dropped off because most people who go to, the, a lot of the elderly people who go to the doctor or people who are sick are gonna be driven to the, to the clinic. So I just wanted to say that and thank you very much. Next speaker. Hi, I'm Stacy Nagel. I head up workplaces at Looker. Thank you so much for your service, all of you. Um, I also have a script. I'm here today to ask you to reconsider the location of the medical clinic. We welcome Kaiser to Santa Cruz. Looker is Kaiser customer. We love Kaiser. But we do know that they will be part of our downtown community for a very long time. So since we know they're that kind of a partner, let's make sure we put them in a location that is aligned with our long-term vision. The last thing we should do as a community is to take a wonderful community partner like Kaiser and put them in a location that just is inferior for them and for us. Um, I've talked to you before about the problems we have with parking for downtown employees. Our new employees, the wait list is two years long and that's with a really strong bike to work culture and a lot of people that walk to work. If you arrive after 10.30 a.m., many employees at my company just turn around and go home after driving around for 30 minutes. They just can't find parking. We tell our candidates to please arrive extra early to find parking. And a lot of times we have people late for interviews because it's that tight. So looking at a clinic that will see over 500 patients a day, not counting including staff to staff that clinic, I just don't think that's realistic. And the <coughs> infrastructure just can't handle it. I'm also very concerned about ill people as my mother is disabled and I don't understand how she could get to that clinic. It'd be way too much for her. I'm also here today as a member of the downtown business community, and I'm concerned that we're not being heard by the council. I really encourage you to notice the location of the speaker's offices that are here speaking in favor of Kaiser. Are they downtown businesses with office space downtown? Will they be affected by this large medical clinic in the Cooper House, or are they located elsewhere in Santa Cruz and just want Kaiser in Santa Cruz? I want Kaiser in Santa Cruz. I even want them downtown, but not on the fifth floor of the Cooper House. The city council has a responsibility to manage. Oh, you Thank you. Your next speaker. Hi, I'm Bob Cagle. I'd like to thank you all for your service. Um, whether something's legal or not is the lowest bar of approval, not the highest. And there's, uh, there's no way policy can be written to accommodate every possible nuance, every possible street, every possible building. And I don't have a large legal staff to help prepare me for these sorts of things, so i am kind of been winging it all along. The AUP uh, allows for all kinds of business. You look at page 43 in the plan, there's all kinds of businesses there, but there's particular language about compatibility of use. And if you just look at that list, you can, you can imagine that if you put any combination of a couple of those, you would say that's inappropriate. Now, I don't blame zoning or planning. They were simply following the letter of the policy, but council can exercise reason and see way beyond the limited perspective of the policy language, which is supposed to be supportive of the community as a whole, not the limited view of one dimension. The letter from the applicant's corporate lawyer suggested that none of the claims around parking could be substantiated. Well, let me provide some. We got some information from the parking department starting January 1st of 2018, 74 weeks. They were 97% or more of capacity in all but two weeks. So that's pretty substantive to me. As well, he talked about predictability. I'd like the predictability that when I moved into the building that I knew what my neighbors were gonna be and that they suddenly didn't have the front doors open. We talked about uh, communicability of, you know, communication, excuse me, communicable, communicable diseases. <laughs> if only 1% of the 10,000 people a month that come through there are sick, that's twice as many people as I have in the building. Council has an opportunity today to set an important precedent for the management of Santa Cruz. Uh, we're gonna compromise our long-term vision of our main street and our community square to placate one large corporation, or are we gonna have an opportunity to plan and manage for the future? Assuming Kaiser will be here for a long time and assuming they're truly a public service and not just a private business, let's make sure we find them the right place for everyone, not just them. Thanks. Thank you. Next speaker. I'm Patrick Riley, I'm a local patent attorney, I'm a member of Next Face. And being in Next Face, I uh, often look across 101, from 101 Cooper to what's going on at Cooper Street. So I have three comments. One is I greatly appreciate Kaiser Permanente's work. I have a friend, for example, who has a five-year-old daughter 
who very much wants to have easier access from the west sides to emergency services. So I think it's very important that Kaiser open up in downtown, but I'm opposed to it opening up at 110 Cooper Street for two main reasons. I work with a lot of uh, tech entrepreneurs and I would say the best of the tech entrepreneurs are good planners. They're both people who know how to be flexible and pivot, but they also need to plan. And if they don't see office space available for expansions, it's gonna affect their plans today as to how they manage their businesses. And I've personally seen more than one client struggle with planning on how to expand the business later. Uh, therefore, it can, moving to, uh, to the environs to the outside of Santa Cruz. And lastly, I would like to say that I would not like to see one on one, the Cooper Street area lose its ability to have um, pop-up events and pop-up festivals, which I s sincerely believe that having the medical clinic there will, will limit that significantly. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Hi, uh, hello council, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Jack, I work at Product Ops, um, 110 Cooper Street in the building. Um, I'm in opposition to Kaiser moving in for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, in looking at the legal wording for the um, parking, the, if a parking a word, a study on whether or not the parking would be effective, that it was whether or not 50 member patients or more per hour were to come through, and the numbers that Kaiser provided were about 45, which that seems kind of close, and especially since we're about to be losing, I'm sure as you all know, parking structures in the next upcoming years, um, it feels like that's kind of very close to the line of whether or not we should do, at least do a parking study to see how much this will impact us. Um, you know, that this is a big sort of fork in the road. We go down two paths. It's important that we make sure, as he said before, you know, we're making the right decision. Another one, um, as a, someone who works in there, works in that floor, the same floor that the pharmacy would be, it's a little alarming that we would be, you know, working in a pharmacy and working in a place, you know, with expensive computers and stuff. It's important to have, make sure you have a good security getting into that building because there are people who would break in and get to that, which as it stands now is fine. We have locked doors and, you know, we have plenty of things. But knowing that from seven to eight, which is pretty late at night, especially in the winter hours when the sun goes down at five and streets get dark and that, knowing that that's the door, doors just gonna be open for anyone to walk in seems a little, you know, feels like our safety is being compromised and we were not aware of this sort of permit being around or, you know, this, that this sort of client would be moving into the office before we moved in. So it feels a little like the rug is being pulled out from under us. Um, thank you for all your time and have a good day. Hey gang, I'm Drew Meyer. I'm a tech worker downtown, I'm with Amazon. We're on two floors in the Cooper building, <clears throat> but I'm not speaking as Amazon, I'm speaking as a, as a four year veteran of the tech cycle that's here in Santa Cruz after 20 years of commuting over the hill. It's extraordinarily impactful for the community to have an office space that I can walk to, that I can hire people into, that I can drive business results from being right here in town. Taking that opportunity away from the downtown by replacing that very limited space as the economic director described with a different use is I think a little bit short-sighted. And what I'm here to really ask for is not favorite treatment for different industries or opinions about who's right and wrong about being sick or not getting sick or security or parking is to inject some vision into the planning process and give us a future that's really gonna work for a lot of people as we bring new housing online. We need a variety of office space and retail space and medical office space scattered throughout the community. Please don't support this particular use case on the floors in the Cooper building. Reserve that class A office space for us to hire new people, for us to expand for uh, tech companies to start up and spin out and, con and re come back together and drive innovation here in this community. Um, please add the vision. It's unusual to have a case where the planning department has met, where the applicant has met all the requirements, the planning department has rendered a decision, but the council has felt it compelling enough to come back and revisit the decision. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Are you speaking on this item? Okay, please come forward and you'll be our last speaker. Uh, hi, my name is Elise Casby and I wanna thank Donna for postponing this item for further consideration, but I do have to say that I really like the idea of Kaiser being downtown. I think we need to open up downtown to more people in terms of more kinds of business. Um, I 
along with that, I want to ask um, that if you if you would consider Kaiser to be put in the building um, right there, I forget what what the address is on Cooper, 110 Cooper Street. The reason this is so important is that we really do need to have additional healthcare facilities in the core downtown area. I want to make sure, though, that as you consider uh, the design of this building and the environmental impact report, that there um, not be additional parking built downtown because as we heard from Patrick, I believe his last name is Siegelman, the consultant who is incredibly well versed and very professional in the parking area and did an excellent analysis, very presented with lots of pictures and very detail, very great amount of detail about the parking that's already here. But there's a perception that there isn't enough parking here. So day after day, weekend after weekend, parking goes unused in individual spaces, on many sites that are not necessarily right on Pacific Avenue or in the structures bordering Pacific Avenue, but just a few blocks out. And so I just wanna say that we definitely do not need an environmental impact of greater parking. Also, the city and the metro company, the, the um, Santa Cruz Metro, have picked a CEO who is trying to privatize our bus company and has cut bus lines and we need to reverse that direction and have uh, a robust um, public transportation system that brings people down here. There's much that the city has done well, including the employee employee parking passes, but we can do a lot more. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this would be the time now where we would have our appellant um, have a five minute rebuttal. Given that the appellant is on the council, I'm wondering if that would just be uh, appropriate to have this as part of the deliberation and action at this time. Yeah, I'll just look to the city attorney. I think I just cede that five minutes to council deliberation. That, that sounds appropriate to me. And I'll just remind the, um, the council and the community, we have a time certain item at 4.30 p.m., so we'll need to have this uh, figured out before then. Okay. Um, any further comments uh, as the council member? Uh, okay, council member Matthews Brown, vice mayor coming. Well, um, I would just say um, I intend to support the motion that has been presented. Um, I can make my comments now. Um, I think I share with everyone here uh, support for Kaiser's uh, presence in our community and the value of having them downtown. Every benefit that accrues from Kaiser, that would accrue from Kaiser at this location will accrue. Pardon? Can't hear me? Okay. Um, I do support uh, the uh, anticipated motion that will be coming forward. <laughs> I'll restate, I think everyone up here appreciates the uh, value of Kaiser in our community as a premier health provider and the value of having a Kaiser facility downtown and expanding its downtown presence. Um, I don't believe that the uh, location currently proposed is the best location. Um, I, will, I also stated that I think any benefit that accrues from Kaiser in one location downtown accrues to Kaiser at any location downtown. I also uh, step back and take the big picture. Uh, what does it mean for the long-term impact on the direction of our downtown? And I think this is particularly, especially for me, appropriate on the 30th anniversary of the earthquake here in Santa Cruz, which destroyed so much of downtown and the, the community went through um, a long engaged process of what do we want for the future of our downtown? And we envisioned a, a downtown that had a strong economic base, it had housing, it had community and civic activities um, in a fairly dense um, environment. Um, and pretty much we've been able to deliver on that. Um, one of the issues was activating our upper floors for office use. Um, and um, also, um, I think what this brings to me now is that Vision Santa Cruz looked far into the future and has, has been largely successful. It is important to realize that downtowns change. Culture changes, economies change, and downtowns change. So what we're looking at right now is a decision that our downtown will live with decades into the future. Um, Kaiser will be an economic engine. Um, I think my, mo my main objections um, to the current location, and I will say also, uh, we've, we've quoted um, general plan policies that might favor 
the presence at this location, many of those general plan policies would favor Kaiser at a similar downtown location. But there are other uh, general plan policies that have been quoted here that are different. And for me, the ones that are most important. And if I could, I just want, to, if we could just do briefly, however okay. you want to frame your comments, because we have a limited time. Here. I'm taking up too much time. Um, for me, the, the key issues are uh, taking prime office space that is essential to one of the key uh, economic factors downtown, the interference with the uh, robust uh, activity, closing of Cooper Street off and Pacific Avenue. That was a very core concept in the original downtown. I think we all honor that and the, the a concern for the access of patients and mixing uses. So. That'll, that'll be it for the short version. Thank, thank yeah. you. Sorry. Councilmember Brown and then Vice Mayor Cummings and then Councilmember Cohen. Uh, so this is a difficult decision uh, to, to contemplate in many ways. Um, I don't believe that the proposed location is the best location myself. Um, however, Kaiser does. And um, as a policy body, I think we have a relatively limited role in the management of uh, rental ag agreements in, in the private market. And um, this space has, been, has not been taken up by other potential tenants. Kaiser has invested quite a bit in, that, in the, their plans. Um, none of which uh, it, I'm trying to, to not include that in my decision because I believe that my decision should be based on um, what is allowable and our planning uh, department and our planning commission have acknowledged that um, the um, an, an environmental determination can be made to um, approve an administrative use permit here. And I think that is the limited role that we have to play in this case as much as I would like to um, have a a larger role in kind of orchestrating what goes where in the downtown, I think that our pol our land use policies are directed at that and it's kind of up to the private actors who want to make these arrangements to proceed, unfortunately. Vice Mayor Cummings, then Councilmember Crum. I had a question um, regarding um, some of the topics that were brought up. And the first one being, how long has, because my understanding is that the space that Kaiser's actually looking to occupy has actually been vacant for some time. And I just wanted to get a sense of how long that space has been vacant for. Oh, wait, sorry, we've had a, ch a chance to hear from the community. This is a chance for now our staff to respond if they have the answer to that. So it's okay. Go ahead. Do you have a response to that? I don't know the exact answer to that question. I do know that. Um, and ask folks in the audience to please keep your voices down and go ahead. I, I don't, I'll, I'll say it again. I don't actually know the answer to that question. I do know that it was vacant for some time. However, there was also an offer on the table. I'll reiterate one thing that I said earlier is that it's the last remaining office space in downtown larger than 6,000 square feet at a time when other tech businesses and other companies downtown are looking for active spaces. Those tech companies and other office users downtown will not have the same opportunities as Kaiser will. For many of the reasons stated here, Kaiser's a very desirable tenant. Um, but we have many locally owned businesses that are looking for office space downtown right now. Okay, and if you want to confer with the woman who may have an answer to that question, please let us know and you can come back. Okay, did you have another question? Um, and one of the things that is a little bit troubling is that, you know, I feel like if this space had been desired by some of these companies, the question I have is, you know, why aren't those companies currently there? Um, the thinking about, you know, in the future, the potential for people to move into these spaces, but if we leave these spaces empty for long periods of time, there's no guarantee of who's gonna move in there. Another thing I'd like to point out is that there's a lot of proposal for development in the downtown in the near future, and if office space is limited, then that should be one of the, the things that's taken into consideration when we're thinking about what are, what are we developing in our downtown. Um, we know that retail is on the decline, and um, we know this to be true, especially because of the fact that 20, um, Forever 21 is going to be leaving. And so a lot of these spaces have the potential for being repurposed. And um, so 
the idea that we're not going to have space for um, these tech companies downtown is it's a bit it's a bit question you know it's something that I, I question a bit. Um, we've you know, I mean with the old Good Times building we were able to repurpose that into more office space, um, and so it's just concern a concern for me knowing that Kaiser's um, they've been able to. Uh, make deals to take on this space. They've invested in the space. They invest in the community. They think that this is a good space for them and their clients. Um, and so I'm not very comfortable right now uh, with the proposed motion, especially since it's been approved by the planning department and uh, the planning commission. So, Councilor Burke. Well, um, I'm just going to say that uh, I'm feeling rushed. I think that we should be at this. I have a bunch of, if I was, if I could ask questions, I'd say how many docs are gonna be there, how much staff, how many uh, patients we're gonna have per week. Um, why aren't you worried, why aren't you Kaiser worried about parking if we hear so many concerns about parking? Um, but I won't ask that because I think this is being uh, rushed right now, a decision, uh, because we have another item coming up after this. Um, and in the interest of time, I will uh, make the, I will move the recommendation, the resolution upholding the Planning Commission's acknowledgement of the environmental determination and the approval of the administrative use permit based on the findings listed in the draft resolution and the conditions of approval attached to Exhibit A. Okay. We have a motion by Councilmember Crum. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings. I had a question. My, um, one of the things that I, um, for me, it feels something that's a new development since this happened was the fact that the Forever 21 building is going to be vacant and could be a potential single story site that would be probably more ideal. I mean, the split site, I kind of had, so I don't know if there's a place here in this process to say, can you exhaust that before moving forward in like a one to two month time frame, as opposed to kind of this all or nothing at this moment. I'm not sure if there's an answer from staff on that. Well, I think the, the motion that was put forth by Council Member Myers w would do just that um, because otherwise, if you adopt the motion that's currently on the floor, there's an active permit and they have three years within which to begin construction to, to vest it. Okay. So, but the motion on the floor would be that they have to reapply within the year. But I'm thinking more of just like a kind of, we have maybe a one, one month min window. We've learned that Forever 21 was potentially um, going to be an, uh, maybe a more uh, optimal space that could be looked at. I'm not sure if that's already been looked at before coming to the conclusion of Cooper Street. Um, just to interject one point, I believe that the motions on the, f the motion on the floor is to uphold the Planning Commission's approval of the, of the project. Um, Council Member Myers put forth uh, some motion language, but I don't think the motion is actually on the floor. No, I know. I'm just wondering in terms of just specifically, is that what that would look like if it was a one month time frame? I mean, what would that what would that be? Is it you either adopt it or you have maybe a month to go explore this option? If not by default, they'll go to Cooper Street. I don't know if there's a potential solution in, in the middle, I guess I would say. I think maybe they can explain what uh, den denying without prejudice means and the timing or associated around that. Sure, so um, Lee Butler, planning director, and um, there are two different uh, approaches, I think, that um, you would be seeking, uh, excuse me, Mayor Watkins. <laughs> The first could be um, the motion that Councilmember Myers laid out would achieve that. The second um, would, and, and that uh, denial without prejudice, I should note, um, allows for reapplication um, within at, at any point in time. If it's just denied, they couldn't uh, reapply for the same project for a year. Um, another option would be continuance. Um, so you could continue an application and uh, say, you know, seek information on other um, uh, on other options during that time. Um, they would still be able to um, come back to the council and have this particular option on uh, uh, under consideration. And so, you know, different options for you to consider. Okay. 
So I think I'll just sort of state my preference. I know we have a motion on the floor. We have a limited time frame just because of our council policy um, to honor Yom Kippur. And so, um, you know, if we could do a continuance of maybe, you know, a few months to now look at Forever 21 as a potential option, which I don't know if was made available before um, now, kind of learning that they're gonna be um, going out of business or was looked at, I think it's worth to look at it before we go ahead and move forward. And if not, then, um, and Cooper Street proves to be the best um, fit or the only fit at this time, then I, I think we can go ahead and, and have that move forward. That, that would be my kind of overall preference. But maybe knowing this or learning this new information, we can um, potentially <coughs> exhaust that before making the decision. So uh, Council Member Glover and then Vice Mayor Cummings and then Council Member Matthews. Thanks, I saw some, um, un, some disapproving head movements from different representatives from some of these conversations. So I would be curious to know about Kaiser's thoughts on uh, the proposed alternative location at Forever 21, if that's something you've already looked at, assessed, if uh, it's something that you don't feel is something that's viable and kind of go from there because um, I can understand the perspectives from both of the different uh, groups. Essentially, it sounds like we have tech versus medical here with regards to the, the prioritization of the space. It was brought up, and I do agree with um, Vice Mayor Cummings, that if there was a laundry list of uh, other tech organizations that were avidly waiting to get into the space, then I would be like, well, that would be something to consider. But since there's not, and uh, from the property manager's perspective and from the representatives from Kaiser as well as the United Way and other groups that have come up and spoken. Um, if there's not a, you know, if, they're, if they don't feel the other spot is tangible and there is a, an outpour of support from some very um, important stakeholders, is what, not to say that the Santa Cruz downtown business stakeholders is a problem, but we also heard from someone who also is housed in that building and does not concur with the issue of parking uh, being an issue, and also brought up some pretty fantastic points about the aspects of Abbott Square and other amenities that have gone in and have not received the resistance as this medical facility. Also, I'm a little concerned that we would postpone the potential of high quality health care to people for the fear of individuals that they may get sick because of a shared bathroom. I understand that that's a concern and I'm sure there can be uh, negotiations that can take place between the two organizations to cohabit the building instead of just uh, striking them from being able to participate. So I would be interested in hearing Kaiser's perspective on all of this. And I will agree with Councilmember Crone as well that I think it is uh, inappropriate, irresponsible, a uh, variety of words to rush through this uh, because obviously there's a lot of uh, things that can be impacted by this and I understand the interest of some of my colleagues to get to this next agenda item, uh, but at the same time, I really think that we should be putting some attention uh, into this really important decision that could impact, as Councilmember Matthew said, the downtown area for a generation. I think, well, I'll just speak to the fact that I think a motion con of continuance could allow those conversations to take place, essentially. But, but it would slow down the process. If it was even in within a short t time frame, it hopefully wouldn't be too detrimental. To to count Vice Mayor Cummings and then Councilman Matthews. One thing that has come up that I've been just looking at throughout this conversation is the proximity of Cooper Street to um, parking in the downtown and just looking at the map of the downtown, there's the SoCal Front Garage, the Cedar Street Church Garage, and the River Street, the Riverfront Garage, which are all within about a block and a half um, from the proposed site at Cooper Street. Uh, my understanding too is that you know, Kaiser's all, Kaiser currently is on Locust Street and um, it's not that far from where they're proposing to change. So um, I think that there's a, you know, there are a variety of issues of parking downtown, but uh, the other point is that by moving it to Forever 21, I haven't heard any conversations about how moving it there is actually going to improve um, their um, clients with, with regards to parking. So um, I think that, you know, I, I also feel like this is, is a bit rushed, um, seeing as how we're going to be making a decision on where this is going, but it apparently appears that Kaiser feels like this is a good space. I, w you know, would be happy if they can work with um, our staff over the next month to two months to identify a new space, if that's su sufficient enough time, I think that that would be okay. And if they can't find the space, then we move on with the application as it's been proposed. Um, but that's just where I stand right now on this. Okay, before we, maybe could we get an answer to that? Cause that's sort of where um, I'm at too. Could, is that possible, would you say? 
one or two months to have those conversations to exhaust the new kind of understanding of Forever 21. I will say on the on the alternative sites, there's more than one alternative site, um, but that does take some time to find out if that is a good fit from Kaiser. I haven't heard specifically back from them on some of the sites that have been presented to them. Um, I will say I'll turn it over to Lee. Um, the question did come up um, on the Forever 21 site and the suitability. In general, it being a ground floor site, being able to have ground floor access for the pharmacy and the medical clinic is preferable to a second story secured you know, uh, access point in the Cooper House. So overall, it's a better location, I think, from the user and for the downtown. And I'd just speak to the process in terms of the timing. It's, uh, uh, we target 90, day, um, 90 days to get these types of projects to hearing. The first hearing that this came to was 75 days. Um, we can cut that down slightly, um, but uh, that's sort of the timeline to, to get to a public hearing. If it's a greater than 16,000 square foot ground floor space, then that would require a council hearing, um, meaning it'd go to planning commission and council, you roughly add 30 days to that. So, um, you know, then we would be in a three or four month timeline as okay. uh, the, sort of a fast process. Three to four months is a fast process. Okay, council member Matthews, <coughs> council member Myers, council member Glover. Uh, I will just say it's my understanding there's more than one potential site. Uh, I think there was an unfortunate lack of communication by Kaiser to the city very early on in the process. I would support a continuance for up to three months uh, for exactly the reason that others have suggested that we have the chance to um, seriously explore those other sites if they don't pan out. Count, Council Member Glover? Oh, I'm sorry, Council Member Myers. Yeah, I, I, I guess I, the other thing I would add is that in conversations with uh, some businesses downtown, I do understand there is there is um, interest in the Cooper House. I'm not going to divulge who those businesses are, but I'm not sure that, that it's correct to say that those spaces would be sitting empty if Kaiser doesn't move in. Okay. Um, so I just want to clarify that. Council Member Clever and then Council Member Crump. Well, I don't know if operating on secret potential deals in the future is a good way for us to make this decision. I've also asked a couple times, I'd love to hear from Kaiser with their thoughts on that uh, location. Um, so if the chair that would, would be, be the a, conversation a, a, that would be having if we continue the item, we don't have time. If for we that continue time. the item, but I'd love to hear from Kaiser now regarding the space so that we don't have to, if we maybe we don't need to continue the item and we can just hear from Kaiser. Yeah. We don't, we don't. I, I would second that if that's a motion to. A motion uh, to hear from Kaiser. Well, my ruling is that we don't have time to open it up for the process of the public, and we have a 4:30 time certain item. A motion and a second, right? And so I'll, you can I, you can appeal my ruling, apparently. But my motion. Okay, so you made a motion. Is that a, to appeal the ruling that you would like to now change the agenda to not have a time certain and to a motion to hear from Kaiser? To hear from to Kaiser. See if they can. There's five minutes information. left. Okay, so you have a motion by Councilmember Glover, seconded by Councilmember Cohn. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. 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 Okay, that passes with Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, Crone, and Glover. I don't know if a Kaiser representative wants to come forward right Can now. Can I just confirm that was to, post, to postpone the 4.30 time certain to finish this one? To hear from Kaiser, which will then likely delay lead it. to the delay of the 4.30 time certain. So uh, thank you very much. We appreciate the opportunity to respond. Um, we've considered the Forever 21 site uh, when it was brought up to us, and it is not uh, an appropriate site for us. The other piece to consider too is it, we don't have control over 110 Cooper. From the timetable, the way it's laid out, we owe them another, we've been paying them just to keep them on hold. If we walk away from this, it's a three quarters of a million dollar hit right off the bat, just to walk away from it. And it's all non-refundable. So continuance is just in effect uh, a way that would basically f uh, put us in a box, to, be, to put it lightly. Um, we would owe them another, another tranche of money just to hold the site going longer, um, which I think is an issue for us. So I'll let you respond to that motion. Well, I, I, I guess the point I wanna make is there's been a lot of discussion about you know the site search and we've done extensive searches. Uh, from 2011 to 17, we looked at 43 different sites uh, before we landed on Locust and we came back in 2018, re-examined those same sites as well as every other site that's come up. So we put a lot of time and effort into this and we didn't land on 110 Cooper lightly. So there's a lot of reference here about just, you know, let's go pick another site. We're not finding them. We've looked and we continue to look. 
Council Member Hunter. Motion to call the question. Second. Okay, we have a motion to call the question. There's a second on the floor. All those in favor to call the question? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. 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 Okay, that passed with Councilmember Crone, Glover, Brown, and Vice Mayor Cummings in support. Um, so now we have the mo main motion on the floor to debate, to not to no have any further debate to take the vote on. Okay. May I ask a procedural question? You can ask a procedural question. Is it possible to make a substitute motion at this point? Is it possible to make a substitute motion at this point? It's not. Okay. Okay, all those in favor of the motion on the floor, which is to per approve the uh, Kaiser permit, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. No. Okay, that passes with Councilor Crone, Glover, myself, Vice Mayor Cummings, and Brown voting in support, mm -hmm. Matthews and Myers voting against. Okay, we'll have a moment. I was brought to my attention that we're at capacity. We're gonna need to sort of cl clear out this item and then bring forward um, anybody who wants to be here for the next item. I think so. Well, don't you think? For safety purposes? Okay. Be harsh. Pay rent as they go through the. to go along with our safety measures. Um, we are on item number 20, excuse me, 22. And this is the re-agendizing of a motion to table item that took place at the last meeting. Before we start this item, I wanna just um, remind the community um, our rules of decorum and my role. So my um, role as the presiding officer is to ensure that everybody has an opportunity to speak to us without fear or intimidation. And I uh, take that responsibility seriously. We want to hear from you. We have um, a time certain item because we have limited time this afternoon. We have to conclude our meeting by 6.30 p.m. and to honor Yom Kippur. And so, um, although there will be limited uh, uh, um, opportunity in terms of our, our time frame today, we hope to be able to hear from everybody who wants to speak to us on this item. I ask that you respect your fellow citizens while you're inside and outside of our chambers. You can disagree with each other. You can fall on different sides of the issue. Um, that's okay. That's how our government and democracy works. But it's not okay to um, interfere with our ability to govern, nor is it okay for you to um, intimidate another uh, resident in our community. I will also ask per um, those that have signs to please keep your signs below your shoulders as to not obstruct the view of those behind you as in respect for your other citizens who are here to participate in today's proceedings. Um, I, I know that I, I appreciate in advance your respect in that matter and I think um, and I think the others who are here would also appreciate your respect in that, in that matter as well. If there is a interruption throughout today's uh, meeting, I will give a verbal warning if I'm able to see the person who interrupted. If I see uh, somebody who continues to disrupt our, our proceedings this afternoon, I will go ahead and ask that you um, leave. And uh, that's not uh, what I want to do, but it's the responsibility of the presiding officer to ensure that we can have a decorum in our meetings. This item was brought to my attention by numerous uh, groups and community members who are asking to have the item um, come forward. And I will uh, say that the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women took the item up the day after we had this motion to table the item without further discussion or community input. We also heard from our Democratic Women's Club and a number of other organizations asking that I put this item back on the agenda. And so I feel that the community um, wants to at least have an opportunity to speak to the item and, um, and that's what precipitated this coming back to the agenda today. Before I invite up the commission to uh, share their perspective as our Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women, I'd like to ask our city attorney to weigh in on a, um, an email that came before us in regards to how the procedure took place last um, meeting with the motion to table. And then I'll go ahead and um, ask our commission to come on up. I wanna be careful because um, 
there have been some attorney client privilege communications that i've shared with the council on this issue um, <clears throat> the day after the last council meeting the city manager and i were copied on an email from uh, a member of the community to council member myers um, which forwarded a message sent by council member crone to supporters in advance of the last council meeting um, the community members email raises a question of a possible Brown Act violation, uh, suggesting that the outcome of the vote on the censure item was a foregone conclusion. Um, based on the fact that the message speaks to the proposed censure of council members Crone and Glover, but asks supporters to attend the meeting um, and, and quote, stand with Drew Glover, Sandy Brown, Justin Cummings, and me. Um, the <laughs> member of the public raised uh, a concern or at least um, uh, an inference that uh, because the request was to stand with four council members that, that there was a preordained decision to table the item. Um, <clears throat> I'm not opining on whether or not that was the case, but I do think uh, given that the motion to table was made before public comment, um, in the event that a, a legal claim were made under the Brown Act, um, the first step in so doing would be to demand a cure. So um, while um, this is a, a business item that's come back before the city council, in my view, is also an opportunity to, to fix a potential Brown Act issue um, by having a do-over. Okay. So essentially, if I am understanding you correctly, you're recommending that we um, not have that happen again per the legal considerations or the do over being we have the item proceed forward and then council can make their motions after public comment. It would be um, appropriate to, should a motion to table be made again and it can to do it after public comment. Okay. So that would be um, my preference. And before I see my colleagues with their hands up, I'd like to hear from the public. I respectfully ask that you, um, <coughs> recognize that you'll have your opportunity to speak after the public is able to weigh in. And I will acknowledge Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Crone immediately after, but I don't wanna acknowledge that right now. We were unable to hear from the public at the last meeting and that did not settle well. I'd like to invite up our Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women to come forward to share their perspective before, as our commission, before we open it up to public comment, at which time I'd like to bring it back for um, acknowledgement of council members. So at this time, I'm not um, prepared to do any uh, sort I would of like to, motion. I'm making a motion to appeal the, the ruling from the chair, because um, he just, uh, the city attorney just spoke about me, and I'd like to respond. Is it, okay. I'll second that. Okay. All those in favor of the appeal, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, go ahead and respond if that's the, the, the discussion. Uh, my motion originally was gonna be to go right to the public tonight and listen to them and, and, and hear from them. There's n nothing that I know about the Brown Act, and in fact, the city attorney just said it, but I, uh, there's communications all the time going out, and um, I'm happy to communicate with the public uh, and uh, I, I do would make a motion that we go right to the public to, uh, to hear them. I'll second that too. Okay, before we do, we'll go ahead and invite up the, the commission who's gonna speak briefly as our commission, I think under five minutes, and then we'll open it up to public comment. So go right ahead. Oh, motion. Okay, we'll go ahead and, okay. Are you saying that you'd like to not include the, re the responses of our commission? I'd like to go right to the, to the line, to the public. I mean, that's. You know, but and, and not hear from our commission? Of course, I want to hear from them. Okay, so the commission like, will hear like every first. member from the public I want to hear from. Okay, so the commission will have you here first because your your uh, letter was uh, impetus to having this item beforehand. And then we'll go ahead and open it up to public comment. Is that your motion? So to have the commission speak first. That wasn't, my, that wasn't necessarily my motion. I, I said, the, you're, you're saying we didn't hear from the public last time. We, we did hear from, from the commission, I believe. We didn't hear from the from the public, and that's my motion was to go right to the public, that the count, that the city council doesn't weigh in right now. What we hear from the public okay. first. Okay, Councilmember Matthews. There's a motion on the floor. Um, my uh, understanding would be if we voted for the motion to go to the public, the CPVAW could come as representing an organization, which we commonly do. 
and so they could go first. The city organization. I'm t I'm, that's fine. That's fine. I, you know, I just wanted to recognize the fact that you heard the item beforehand. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay. okay. That passes unanimously. You'll go forward. You'll have up to four minutes. We, we took the vote. We'll go ahead and ask that you um, go ahead and we'll, we appreciate your respect as we have our commission speaking now. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Mayor Watkins, Vice Mayor Cummings, and council members. My name is Leila Kramer, the Vice Chair for the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women. And we're here again to affirm our commitment to the women complainants who came forward with regard to the pattern of abusive and disrespectful conduct of council members Crone and Glover. We are here to reiterate that we came to say what we came to say to you on September 24th. As a commission, we start by believing those who have the courage to come forward and share their stories of harassment and abuse. That night, Vice Mayor Cummings, Council Members Brown, Crone, and Glover moved to table the censure item. This decision prevented the public from speaking directly to the issue and ended the possibility for the council to use the only tool it has to publicly acknowledge this pattern of abusive and disrespectful workplace behavior and to make a formal statement of disapproval. The commission strongly believes that accountability is required on behalf of council members Crone and Glover. Council member Crone attended our September 25th commission meeting and when asked why he didn't attempt to stop the public victim blaming and shaming that went on at the previous council meeting, he said, I didn't realize it was going on. Acknowledgement that there is a problem and that these two council members are at the root of the problem, not the women complainants is a necessary first step on the path toward reconciliation and working towards improving relationships amongst council members and staff. You had an opportunity on the 24th to denounce this pattern of behavior and to let current and future city staff and council members know that we all deserve to work in a safe and respectful environment. Tonight, we ask you to do the right thing and not compartmentalize your sense of equity and justice because it may be politically dangerous to do so. This censure is not about a recall. It's not about just cause evictions and Measure M. It's not about the homelessness and affordable housing in our community. This censure is about believing people who have the courage to speak up when they are afraid to do so because the stakes are high. It's about supporting those people through an already difficult situation and it's about speaking truth to power. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and open it up to public comment. Those who are interested in speaking to us on this item can please line up to my left. Before we have you go forward, we'll go ahead and see if there's anybody who wants to just briefly address the council in one minute. Is there any, any community member who wants to briefly address the council in one minute? If you're interested in doing so, I'd like to ask you to please come forward first. We'll go ahead and start with the one minute um, input and then we'll hear from those who want the two minutes in the interest of time. So go right ahead. Thank you, members of the council. Uh, the very next day following uh, this council meeting, uh, I had the opportunity to hear again and then reflect on what happened the previous night. And then I asked, why didn't this go to the union? And I was told that the union would not hear it. And I'm wondering why it didn't hear it, because a lot of this could have been dealt with. We wouldn't have had the stalling on hearing this. Thank you. Thank you. Other members who want to speak for the one minute time frame, please come forward. Hello, my name is Shalom Dreampeace Compost. Um, I'm here in support of, of uh, Christopher and Drew, but I also want to say that, doc, that Mayor Watkins um, didn't want to recognize uh, Council Member Brown at uh, the last time we discussed this in the interest of getting public input. Um, Yom Kippur starts very quickly, uh, deadline for people to finish their last meal before a 25 hour fast is 6.53 or 6.23. Um, keep it below minute. I just, I'd ask you, Mayor Watkins, if you think that it's fair that you shut down tried to shut down, you did, unsuccessfully tried to shut down Sandy Brown at the previous discussion in the interest of hearing the public. And I think we should be in the civic auditorium and have time for everybody to talk. There's also no rush with this censure. Uh, someone's gonna time me at one minute, there's no rush. <laughs> Thank 
Thank you. I just have some questions. Um, and so mainly, why was the press release about the commission, the commission for the prevention of violence, why was that released on next door before the commissioners, all the commissioners had a chance to review it? That seems odd that we're to, um, making a private platform our official channel of communication for the city. Also, I was present at the last meeting and a lot of angry words, very angry words, were exchanged about what people say on Facebook. And I just want to say, you may see who you see as supporters of Drew, a, saying unkind things on Facebook. I see Cynthia Matthews, former web uh, designer of her campaign website, calling women a dumb C word, making all kinds of abusive statements. I've never seen a disassociation of that fr uh, from her. So yes, we do associate your supporters with what they say to people on Facebook and they can be very, very abusive and also anonymous blogs. Okay, next speaker for one minute. Hello, I just wanna say that conflict is not abuse. I have witnessed you guys basically take into bullying Chris and Drew now for weeks. Um, for very minor things, you guys have wasted money, $18,000, um, and for things that I have never ever seen Chris or Drew behave the way that I witnessed Donna Myers behave at the last city council. She was screaming, she slammed her he hand down, and we're here discussing a censure of two people that have done way less than that. Um, I think that this is ridiculous. I think that you guys should follow the Rose Report. It said not to publicly do this to one another and to deal with this in mediation. And I think you really should be ashamed of yourselves for putting this back on the agenda. Right. Yeah. Jackie Griffith, one minute, okay. Um, I support Drew and Chris. I. I I support the, the Commission for Violence Against Women, but I think that they've been pushed into, tri this is trivializing it, and as she just mentioned there, not everyone even got to speak to it. I've served on city and county boards. I want you to know that that is really outrageous. If not everyone was even consulted. We have in this town, NBC, nonviolent communication. I just feel that this should have been, there were way better ways to handle this. And if you were in taking over my meeting time, I don't think I would have probably been any nicer than, than Drew was at that point because it's taking up his people that are waiting to meet and his needs as well. Uh, the, this whole thing, it just. Uh, okay, your time is up. Next speaker. <laughs> I'm Nora Hawkman. I'm the former executive director of Women's Crisis Support and Shelter Services, now uh, Defensa de Mujeres. <clears throat> when I was 17 or 18, I co-founded a rape crisis center, which is now the second largest in the country in Santa Barbara, California. So I am speaking with those hats on. This is very painful. When we start comparing the hurts of women to the hurts of African Americans, there is nowhere to go but bad. And that is under the mayor's leadership happening here. So let me just say this, since I only have one minute, everybody got punked on this except Council Member Myers. And the person doing the punking is your city manager. You gotta think about that. He punked you on homeless services, he's punking you on development deals, and he's punking you on disliking each other. My name is Jane Becker. I wanted to address um, the issues surrounding uh, council member Donna Myers, who I feel has been unduly uh, shot, um, uh, spoken rudely about, uh, defamed uh, on, on Facebook and other locations. I happen to believe that you have accomplished a great deal with your life and that I, as the grandmother of two young uh, granddaughters, I would want them to look up to you as a role model because I think you are a role model. And all this other stuff is shooting the messenger. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Jeffrey Smedberg. 
i believe the women and i think the city institution did believe the women took into consideration their concerns their allegations spent six months and eighteen thousand dollars uh, seriously considering uh, what they claimed, found uh, that the claims were unsubstantiated. This uh, all but some very minor things. The, uh, this whole censure procedure is a big waste of time. Why don't we move on to uh, the mediation and conflict resolution? It would be wonderful if our council members could work together for the benefit of the city residents. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, um, I just wanted to start off by saying that you can still be a lesbian and be racist. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, <laughs> and um, so I feel really nervous to be up here right now as a, as a woman of color, I'm terrified of like the kind of rhetoric that Donna Mayer said. Oh my gosh, I, I don't even know about the crowd behind me, I'm terrified. Uh, this isn't about believing women. A recall petitioner assaulted me when I tried to read the petition. Recallers have been harassing me online since that incident in July. This is not about protecting all women or believing all women. And honestly, Mayor, you should be ashamed of yourself for bringing this back. Um, you want the public comment before a, a vote on tabling the censure? This isn't tabling the censure. I guess I got it in uh, a minute. Hi, I'm Brett Garrett and I'm feeling a lot of pain both because I believe women have been hurt and I believe progressive council members have been hurt. Um, my great hope is that the reconciliation process will improve the situation, that people can all hear one another. I don't think it's helpful to kick off reconciliation with punishment. I strongly encourage to, to practice compassionate communication and listen to one another a lot more before considering any punitive me measures. Um, this agenda item, no matter how it's decided, I think it just fans the flames of the recall effort. It exacerbates the divisions in our community. Um, I believe tabling the motion was the right thing to do last time because it allowed a very constructive process on reconciliation. And I think tabling it could be good again tonight. I, I just don't think it's the right time to be even considering the censure motion. Yeah. Toward anybody, thank you. Hi, my name is Alex King. Uh, I want to echo my uh, my uh, fellow constituents uh, message that what happened to mediation and conflict re resolution? Why, why are we bringing this up again? I, th I think this whole issue started back in January when the mayor declined to put Drew and Chris on uh, their requested committees and she's exhibited a uh, abuse of power uh, pattern ever since, since that time. I just witnessed the last meeting when she ref tried to refuse to recognize uh, Sandy Brown's uh, appeal of uh, not being able to table the resolution. So I'd just like to say, please work on uh, city business. Stop trying to tear, tear the city apart and do your jobs. Yeah. Yeah. I'm here to speak on behalf of women, women public servants in the city who their public service does not mean that they get to be abused by community members. They are public servants. They are not servants to be abused. Let me keep repeating that. That is not part of their job description to take abuse and bullying from politicians on a constant daily basis and their followers who they have no problem private messaging on Facebook. Th things like bitch bag, all fuck you up the okay, ass with the razor. Okay, okay, let's keep the language appropriate. This is the reality. We'll okay, okay. This is the reality okay. of what the public we'll has we'll to deal with. We'll go ahead and start the time again. With that, okay. This is what the public has to deal with. The people that serve you, the commissioners, the people in this community who do the work, the nurses, the firemen, the law enforcement, the city staffers who actually do the work. Start showing some respect. Okay, next speaker. And I'll remind those who are here to, to adhere to the, uh, to the rules of decorum, please. You'll have one minute. Daryl Darling, uh, probably the uh, least known 
of my claims to fame is that I was the Merchant of Venice in the senior class play in Rock Island, Illinois. Uh, what the soliloquy uh, that uh, of Portia has been uh, burned in my brain and has been a guide for me uh, throughout all of my life, uh, even before uh, the senior class play, but that one is particularly poignant. Portia leads off the quality of mercy is not strained. We have been fighting over our piece of flesh from the time that the election was decided, the day after, actually the day the night of. Okay, your time is Let's up. Let's not do it anymore. We all Next suffer. Speaker. Okay, thank you. So is there any other member of the community who wants to address the council in one minute? If you're interested in addressing the council in one minute, we have one more coming forward, okay. Hi, Laura Lee Martin. Um, I first wanna say that council members Cummings, Brown and Glover, I've written you emails. I'd love to chance to meet with you. I've sent twice to you and one of to each of you. I totally get that you don't see the bullying that others see. And I'm talking to you, Mr. Crone and Mr. Glover. Even though my husband was arrested for domestic violence, everyone thinks he's a really good guy. So I totally get that. The claims were from credible women and they were brave enough to step up. I would suggest that the two of you learn from this. Don't dismiss it. Acknowledge we have a problem and work to heal. In fact, I'd love to see you vote for the censure. It is just a statement that we're gonna change how business is. You could heal and Council Member Cummings, I ask you to step up and help with that. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna go ahead and open the item now for two minutes. If you're, anybody else is interested in the one minute time frame? Did you have one? Do you want to do the one minute? Please come forward. You'll be our last for the one minute. We'll then go ahead and open it up for two minutes. You have one minute to search? Okay. Thank you. My name is Catherine Herndon. I've been a feminist since the golden years of women's liberation movement. I believe that this has been a misuse of feminism. I hope if you haven't already read Jillian Greensight's um, statement on Bruce Bratton's website that you will, because when I read it just last night, it absolutely captured brilliantly and exactly how I think and feel about this. This is not the first time that I've experienced a misuse of feminism to uh, co-opt something for another purpose. I moved here about 20 years ago after having visited for 10 years before that and wanting to live here. I was a school nurse in Los Angeles and I took early retirement. Your time is up. Okay. Okay. Sir, so you'll have one minute also, is that right? You're wanting the one minute? We're on the one minute time frame. Okay. Yeah, I asked for four minutes and I got an email that said you weren't giving anyone four, but you just gave somebody four. You go ahead and pause the time. They were part of the original presentation as the impetus for the item coming forward. So they were not in part of the, commu the communications. As our commission, they were gonna bring forward their position as to why I they wanted that it. As a, they were, as you said, that they're public they, groups, I got so they over got four ruled to do it. So I'm not doing group presentations and I hope you can understand as to respect of the others who want to speak here tonight as to why. And so you'll have up to one minute or we can okay. transition to two minutes if you like at this time. I'll take two. Okay, we'll go ahead and transfer to two minutes unless you wanna go right after Mr. McHenry since he was waiting in line. Go first? Okay, you'll have two minutes. <laughs> okay. um, there's been a lot of talk about wanting to hear the community and I really respect that and just on how things go, they should. Um, yeah, I can speak into the mic, but it's, it confuses me that um, it was you who cut everything to two minutes when you started your tenure and you often leave the room to get water and to get a drink during oral communications. But on this, it's something that you really want everybody to speak about, which is fair. I think people should be allowed to speak about everything. Um, the official investigation and report didn't have any substantiated findings and coming forth and there's frustration about that and people wanted something 
wanted it to say something, that it was substantiated or not. But instead of having some specific thing that was wrong with the report or wrong with the investigation, the, there's this claim of last time the claim was nothing was false. And we all said false isn't an option in these kind of investigations. And so now the resolution says nothing is unfounded. Once again, I'll push back and say that's not an option in these kind of things. Unsubstantiated, substantiated, and withdrawn are the only three things that that investigator was looking at. So I think it's fine for you guys to talk about how you don't get along, and I think there's four of you that are pretty negative towards each other, and you guys do have to learn to get along. But on the specifics of those frustrated guys mouthing off a little bit, well, there's been a whole lot of stuff in six months, nine months that's gone into them being frustrated. <laughs> one apologized, one could apologize a little more, but there's some more apologies that could come out of this room. Like, I have to apologize when I mouth off at people too. It's just something we all have to do. Um, so for me, the censure thing that on the resolution of unfounded, well, that's, that's just not true. Next speaker. I think a number of you were at the federal court case with the temporary restraining order to block the uh, eviction of the people at Ross Camp without creating a safe alternative. And those of you that were there heard a number of women testify that before Ross Camp, they had been either raped or in one case raped and killed, according to one of our, the testimonies, the, the, her friend was raped and killed before she went to Ross Camp. And I know from personal experience that every weekend I run into women who want to know where the women's shelter is because they have been sexually assaulted or afraid of being raped. And those numbers of women are growing that many of them lose their vehicles to being towed and are now like having to go into doorways. So as you probably have already heard, we have to set up men who we trust with women to sleep in specific doorways on Front Street. So I, th I was wondering where the uh, women's uh, group was at Ross Camp to defend the women who are now, as we speak, tonight going to have to face the possibility of being raped because none of Drew's and Chris's um, questions were, would be agendized. And so, Mar you know, Martine, you have a direct implication in the violence against these women, as does Martin Bernal, of course, and Tony. Um, so I think we're speaking out of, you know, it's sad if anybody disrespects anybody, man or woman, but the disrespect that, that the mayor has shown in this chambers is outrageous. There's also supposed to be a law about how you bring up censure in a, in a public hearing. There's supposed to be attorneys on both sides. There's supposed to be a conversation about it, and that time is not up. happening here. Your time is up. Next speaker. I have been healing from abuse for the last 24 years. It was psychological, emotional, and financial, and there was definitely physical abuse. I've studied it, and I know what I'm talking about. Cynthia Matthews, you said so long ago that you wanted to end divisive politics. Please start being sincere and stop the divisive politics. We elected uh, a majority of people who are liberal to progressive fairly over the last several years, and all of this is an end run around all of that. There is a difference between conflict and abuse. Many hundreds of experts assert that thousands of studies have been done, and the women that claim last week to have been abused are confused. They are white privileged women. They earn enormous amounts of money per hour to plot and to divide this city. They are paid to divide. So the Seppo, the Seppo study, which was a stakeholder study that involved our entire community, that man came up and he said he felt sorry. Do you remember that, Martine Watkins, how sorry it was? And you said that we had to be somber. Well, I am somber right now, and to say this is an outrage. It is an end run around the two studies that were ordered at large expense to our city. Mr. Seppo said that there are Trump-like national issues happening right here, and they are being waged by Donna Myers, Martine Watkins, and Cynthia Matthews. They are extremely 
being cynical. So I want to talk about a Trump-like thing that I heard happening. I have not substantiated this claim. It is right now a rumor that a certain council member has a vacation property in Mexico City, that she built a wall from her property to the beach. But we don't know why. Maybe it was so her dogs wouldn't go onto the property next door. Maybe it was so that she didn't have to look at the hovels, if there are hovels, on the other side of the wall. But this same person is claiming that she wants to not be seen as a racist, but at the same time, she's using her white privilege and her status and her enormous wealth. Your time is up. Next. The Mexicans are asking. Your, your time is up, Elise. Donna Trump. Okay, I'm what is ahead. Donna gonna, Trump doing with her wall? Ask you to turn. Thank you. Next speaker. Next speaker. I'm going to go ahead and ask you to be this, keep your voice down. We're going to go ahead and try to get to as many people today during public comment. Go ahead. You'll have two minutes. Good afternoon. I think I share something with everybody here. This is not very fun. Not for me. I don't think for anybody here. So, and I just want to say this is, this is a me too town. It really is. I mean, we have a super majority of people who support the me too movement. I don't blame victims. I don't. I support the ladies who have complaints. But who should have fixed this before it turned into a civil war? Who should have done that? I just browsed through the budget. The person at the top at $259,092.94 a year is the city manager who could have said, okay, children, we're gonna do this differently from now on. Easily, easily. Could have said, okay, between any two meetings in a conference room, we'll have five minutes of dead time for the transition so that this doesn't happen again. I can't stop Christopher from coughing, I'm sorry. Um, I don't even think the city manager should do that. That's all he did was cough. I listened to the tape several times. <laughs> that was the two substantiated charges. The others are not substantiated. So why are we here in this misery if anybody should and could smooth these things out before they happen, it's the city manager who could take people aside and say, okay, here's how we're gonna fix this. I hear your complaints, I hear your concerns. As many times as it takes so that people are satisfied that they were heard, everybody. I'm annoyed at our city for having a civil war. It's wrong. It's hurting everybody who lives here. And who's doing it? People who are misguided. Good afternoon, I'm here uh, unusually as both Phil Posner and Rabbi Posner. As reported, as reported, today's meeting is to end early for those city employees, I gather, who observe Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. When we are asked to consider our actions, and if we have hurt someone, we are expected to ask God for forgiveness. No accusations, just ask forgiveness. But not before, according to Jewish tradition, we go first to the person or persons we've hurt. In that context, the vote to censure Councilman Crone and Clover seemed particularly egregious, especially since, as reported in the Sentinel last Wednesday, this council is spending $11,000, quote, for professional mediation and conflict resolution training, close quote. Now, some of you this past year have suffered hurt feelings regarding abuse as have many of us fellow human beings. However, especially when Councilman Crone has written a letter that was described in the Sentinel as, quote, a, beautifully, ex a beautiful example of self-responsibility and reconciliation, I want to suggest that on the eve of Yom Kippur, and hopefully the rest of the year, that forgiveness and magnanimity will accomplish far more than censure and reprisal for old hurts. And may everyone in our community likewise be ready to forgive and reconcile differences, each observing atonement in our own meaningful, beautiful way. Thank you.
before we before we get started, I'd like to get a sense of how many more members of the community want to address the council on this item. Okay, in the interest of trying to get to everybody, I want to hopefully have or, uh, public comment concluded by 10 to six because we have to reserve time at the end for oral mm -hmm. communications. So we're gonna go ahead and go to 90 seconds <coughs> to hopefully be able to hear from all folks. Go ahead. <laughs> I, hope, I hope I can still have two minutes because that's what I planned on. I'm gonna, in the interest of having so that others, I hope that you could understand as well as those that were waiting for the two minutes that we wanna hear from everybody. So we're gonna go ahead and move it to 90 seconds. Okay, well, I, I see that everyone here has been hurt. I think the community has been hurt as well. And I would like to ask everyone, ask Donna, Martine, all the women who've spoken, Susie, um, is center really what you want? Is that really what your deepest need is? Or perhaps your deepest need is to be heard, to be completely heard, to be completely understood. Because that's what my sense is that people want. I, that's what we all want. And I don't think there's been a process for that to happen. If that process had been in place, as was just said, I think all of this could have been dealt with. And I wish, my wish is that that would be what happens from now on. When Marshall Rosenberg worked with those warring tribes in Nigeria, it, uh, the reason it worked was because he made space for that to happen, for everyone to be deeply heard, for their needs to be heard and understood by both sides. I mean, it was quite amazing to listen to him describe how that worked and quite beautiful. And um, it took a while, but you know, we have time. And I heard you all vote in favor of mediation a couple of weeks ago. And so I, my, my wish is also to see that go forward like really soon, not to wait, do it now. And, and maybe reconsider the center as, you know, just look in your heart and see if that's really what you want or is that gonna get you what you want or is that gonna lead to more resentment on everyone's part? Because I, I do care, what I, I really care what you need and I really wanna know, I'd like to understand what everybody needs. Um, and that, that includes Drew and Chris too, all of us, we're no different, we're all people, we all have feelings, we get upset, we have conflicts. Uh, I think if we see each other as different, it's a problem. Thank you. You as a council demonstrated at your last meeting that you can all work together. You rightly chose a path of mediation, conflict resolution, and the reform of personnel grievance processes. Tonight, I want you to reject censure as antithetical to that path. People in Santa Cruz are bearing witness to a deeply painful episode that has enveloped our government. The public has suffered too, both in the degrading of our public life and the deflection of attention from the serious issues that face our city. This is a sad chapter being written in Santa Cruz history, one etched in escalation of conflict and the amplification of chaos. And how will it end? That's the question you face. I ask you to act together to bring an end to the public trauma of this collective fugue, this dissociative pathological departure in which you all have wandered away from the ethos of public life. You are caught up in a disorder that is collective. Your fugue has taken you far away from thoughtfully engaging consideration of conflicting legitimate political interests. The public business of the city council should be the business of the city. Personnel and behavioral issues certainly have to be addressed, but in forms very, very different than public city council meetings. Censure is antithetical to the spirit of reconciliation that must be the foundation of mediation and conflict resolution. Thank you. Okay, when I came home from Germany, I stopped by a friend's house. They had two kids, another adult coming over with an impossible child, and uh, they wanted a babysitter. I said, hell no, I'll take care of them. Don't worry about it. So they all left for the afternoon, and I took the kids, three to seven, got them all together, and I said, you guys go out and play and have a good time. And if anybody comes to me with a complaint, you will all receive the same punishment. Interestingly, I had a very easy time babysitting and the parents didn't believe me. So in that spirit and in the spirit of atonement, I make a motion from the floor, from the people, 
that this censure motion be for all seven of you and the eighth member, the city manager. And I would invite you to allow the city manager to vote. And in the spirit of atonement, you should all raise your hand and say, I agree to this censure and let's move on. Every one of you, well, not everyone, but right here and right here and right here, you are as guilty or more guilty of any of these trumped up, and I mean Trump in the capital T, Trump, trumped up charges that you have leveled against these two fine gentlemen. My honor to stand before you. Some of you know me. I haven't given up. I'm 82 years young. Richard, if you wouldn't mind moving a little bit to oh, the over here. Thank See? You. Alzheimer's. Uh, number one, I'm here because of friendship. A 10 year old kid was asked what a friend is. A friend is someone who knows you and still likes you. <laughs> Two people who sit there are very, very close to over the years, at least listening. I've been told I talk a lot. My purpose is the same as our mayor, youth voice and student empowerment. It's an international human right. I'm also a graduate of Landmark. I'll never forget this. That's a magic wand to all of you. It takes the right wing and the left wing for a bird to fly. I'm looking at city manager and the people here. What could be some concrete next steps beyond whatever the action is going to be? I cannot tell you that as we, we try to empower student government locally and beyond, that if you as our leaders of this city council, the greatest city in the state of California, progressive, but also with that right and left wing. If we can't make a better Santa Cruz, it's gonna happen with the people back here and people like me. Thank you for blah, blah, blah. Thanks, Speaker. <laughs> Hello, I'm Ann Simonton, and I'm on the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women, and I didn't realize I was jumping into such a horrific hornet's nest when I uh, became a member of the commission. I'm um, feeling extremely torn by this situation because I didn't come to the 24th uh, meeting that was held and I didn't see uh, what had happened there. And I can see this community is falling apart. And that makes me really sad. <laughs> and so um, I wanna start by believing because I, I think that that's the, 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 what they're saying. And I have never stated that I didn't believe any of these accusations going forward. But what I've noticed is that the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women, their bylaws actually state that we're supposed to be dealing with rape, domestic violence, and sexual harassment. I called the HR department, I said, please tell me, were there any, was there substantiated anything? Was any of these uh, coming anywhere close to sexual harassment, rape, or uh, battery? And no, that was not the case. And so then I had a question. <laughs> I thought, well, gee, what am I supposed to do? And I, I voted to censure because I, they were using terms like victim blaming and they were using very inflammatory uh, language, which again, are, is language you use about rape victims and about violence. And that is something that is really important to, to, to distinguish between. As a survivor of multiple rapes in my life, it's something I think that, you know, I really want to focus on anyway. Before you get started, I, I want to remind those that when the person who's speaking, they can speak to us hopefully without interruption. If I see you interrupting, I'll go ahead and give you a warning. I want to be able to get to everybody, so I hope that we can do that. Um, so please let the person speak whether you agree with them or not. Go right ahead. You'll have 90 seconds. My name is Carol Fuller. I'm, I'm president of the Democratic Women's Club, and we wrote a letter to um, you, Mayor, Mayor Watkins, asking you to put this back on the agenda, which you did. Thank you very much. I'm speaking as an individual right now, but um, I'm relieved to see that nobody's trying to say that the women didn't experience the experience that, that they say they had. So in this, and that's, that's very encouraging. And I agree with the woman who said people want to be heard. 
And I think that what I would like to see tonight is I would like to see Councilmember Crone and Glover apologize. I think in the spirit of atonement, as Rabbi Posner said, that's, that's what it means. You may not know how you offend, but clearly you do. And I think that it's time for you to acknowledge that. And that will go a long way towards probably mending a few fences around here because it's pretty discouraging to see what's happening to the council. I feel like you're not getting the council's, the city's business done because of all of this. It's a big time sink. Um, I noted that in addition to the people that made the official complaint, reading over some things the last week that council member uh, Cynthia Chase said that the reason she didn't, one of the reasons she didn't run for second term was because it was very difficult dealing with, with council member Crone and his uh, antics and that she commented on his habit of talking over her. So going forward, I hope you'll apologize. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, next speaker. Hello, my name is Maggie Duncan Merrill. I'm a lifetime resident of Santa Cruz and I stand here today appalled by the actions taken two weeks ago in this chamber. The act of silencing our community and disenfranchising your fellow council members and city staff who were booed, shouted at, disparaged loudly in front of their children, spouses, coworkers, and friends was so overwhelming to take in. I had to leave the room in disgust and hang my head in sorrow at what has become of our local governance. So-called progressives claim to be feminists, but they claim to believe these women felt abused, but they normally would stand with women, but they think these points may be valid, but the victims were even offered old fashioned advice to simply talk to their abusers and, and let them know the hostile environment they're forced to work in was somehow their fault, if only they had handled it better. I watched Council Member Brown stomp behind her fellow Council Member Myers, complaining loudly to the city attorney, refusing to give her counterpart the decency of simply hearing her out. Had she not caused such a stir, perhaps some in the audience would have heard Donna say she did speak with Drew multiple times before the final straw. When she filed her complaint. Donna was then lectured by some women claiming to be feminists who said if she had just taken a moment to talk nicely to the man yelling at her in front of her colleagues, this whole mess could have been avoided. I'm guessing while San Sandy was attempting to shut Donna up, she must have missed that vital point. The reason given for the tabling of the censure by Council Member Cummings was that he was ready to move on. The man poised to be our neighbor, our mayor next time, next year, decidedly shut down the discourse of the women looking for recourse in a clearly hostile environment because he was over it. This is what we can expect from Justin next year. Rockier roads are ahead. Thank you. Next speaker. My name is Drew Lewis. It appears to me that the real reason that the three members on the council and their supporters are not interested in reconciliation and mediation on this issue is because the real the real goal of all this is to create as much negative PR as they can for council members Glover and Crone and support the recall petition. I think that the developers and big money interests are very upset that, their two count, that these two council members listened to their constituents in the city and neighborhoods and voted against the corridor scam plan and the drive to dr turn Santa Cruz into San Jose by the sea. This agenda is doomed to fail because the hypocrisy and double standards are very apparent for all to see. I know that if I was in city council member Glover's place when council member Myers acted out shouting and pounding her fist on the counter next to him, I would have very, felt very intimidated indeed. I do think that mediation, nonviolent communication and arbitration are good for this issue. But first we need to acknowledge the elephant in the living room, which is the blame, shame and preposterous allegations screen by the developers agents and their agenda to recall council members Drew Glover and Chris Crone. City manager Martin Bernal, without perhaps meaning to do so, has become a powerful and dictating institution and influence. He and his staff heads every Wednesday 
before a city council meeting, they meet behind closed doors with the mayor to preset the agenda. Over the years, they have prioritized the Seaside Company, the Downtown Association, Santa Cruz Neighbors, the Police Department, real estate and developer interests, and expanding their own bureaucracy. Renters, students, workers, the disabled, the elderly, and the homeless have taken last place. For the homeless, Brunel staff has solicited state and federal monies and used them to support limited and preferential services for a favored few. Reactionary council members regularly shift blame to state and county authorities for the flood of people sleeping in doorways. Council members Watkins and Matthews prefer to discuss, plan, and concoct endless timetables, goals, and procedures rather than take substantive actions. When a newly elected progressive majority moves to act on long-delayed promises, they grow alarmed. For homeless people locally, the key issues are shelter, services, and equal treatment under the law. City councils under Watkins and Matthews and those before them have delayed, ignored, and masked the city's failure to address these issues. Through Assistant City Manager Susie O'Hara, will be speaking soon. They've created a false narrative claiming the city is prudently and adequately addressing the snowballing situation. So when Crone and Glover come along with a potential new majority seeking to stop a library dismemberment, address the up. forbidden third rail of just eviction protection okay, and rent control, and seek to democratize city council you're taking procedures, your time from your other they budget. cut off time yep. for the speakers. Your time is up. Okay. Before you get started, um, I will go ahead and, and if, if there's nobody else interested in speaking who's not lined up, we'll go ahead and end after Susie and we'll keep the 90 seconds. Oh, you have one more? We have more people. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and reduce the time then to one minute in the interest of being able to hear from everybody. And that's because we have a we have an we have a time certain to be ending. If you want to share your time, you're sharing it with others who want to speak. So you'll have one minute to speak at this point. Hi, I'm Nancy Crusoe. Go ahead and, go ahead. Um, well, I would like to point out that whatever you are feeling, the other side is feeling it as well, all of it, just as deeply, just as painfully, and you have to be able to understand and acknowledge that. That comes so far before censuring and apologies and all of this accountability. You need to understand feelings go both ways. Matt Taibbi, journalist, has a new book out today called Hate, Inc. We, we are at risk in Santa Cruz. If you've seen public media, there's hate talk. We need to pay attention to that and we need to move on and do work, the work of the city. Mayor, City Council members, my name is Gillian Greenside. I was one of the founders of the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women. I was its first chair in 1982 and chair again in 2004 and 2005. The charge of the commission is rape, sexual harassment and domestic violence. And while I have no doubt that the complaints that the women brought forward were serious in their eyes and thoroughly investigated, they had nothing to do with the commission. And it's very sad for me to see the commission come forward and that it's and, and, uh, in this manner and that the only article op-ed in the paper that I've seen from the Commission on October, which is Domestic Violence Month, is basically an attack on Council Member Crone. I would say the complaints were well investigated, the Rose Report is out to move forward without a censure and to follow those recommendations would be in everyone's interest. Thank you. Next <laughs> I'm Sally Gwen Satterley, and uh, I don't even know where to begin. I helped campaign for Drew Glover, and his name is Drew Glover. Correct, Drew? Okay, I just, I, I, everyone keeps mispronouncing it. Anyway, and Chris Crone, I, I adore both of them. I campaigned for each of them. We were tired, we were campaigning, we were doing things, you know, over and over. They were never rude or disrespectful. I understand there are women who have complained about them. I feel bad for them. I am a retired registered nurse. That is my job, is to help people. And I feel terrible that these women felt bad. Please, all of you, 
care for each other, do what was recommended, which was conflict resolution. Please work together on this. Get past this and end this, please, for the good of the city. Thank you. Speaking on behalf of myself, I will say that I'm offended that public time and money is being used to further the recall efforts. I'm mostly here though just to read a statement from my friend, Micah Posner, who is unable to be here tonight because of uh, family, family business. He says, as you know, I was the last person censured by the city council. I voted for my own censure, and I think that gives me a certain perspective, hoping you will listen to it. Before I came to an opinion about this issue, I carefully read the report on potential violations on the part of Crone and Glover. I tried to be open to the idea that people I know could have a pattern of misogyny or other clear violations of ethical behavior. After all, I'm a good person, and I made a mistake worthy of censure. I am inclined to inclined to think that the report was at the least objective. After all, the report was supervised by senior staff who have no great love for the two of them. The report found a couple of instances in which Glover and Crone did not act perfectly as council members. Even if other instances occurred at the up, same your, level your of offensiveness. So others can speak, thank you. Next one speaker. minute is really not enough. Next speaker. Continuing uh, Micah's letter. Um, even if other instances occurred at the same, the report found a couple of instances uh, which they did not act perfectly as council members. Even if other instances occurred at the same level of offensiveness, these behaviors, while regrettable, are common among council members. Council member Matthews, for example, has been known to make somewhat patronizing remarks during council meetings. Council member Robinson was repeatedly rude to me in the hall and conference rooms, etc. Her behavior was passively supported by council member Bryant. The idea that I would try to censure them or other council members for slightly rude behavior would never have occurred to me. Everyone should do the best they can to be respectful. It doesn't always happen. Mayor Watkins is also called out in the report for publicly accusing another council member of a serious offense prior to talking to him privately. I do not think Mayor Watkins should be censured, but I think she should try to emphasize, empath, um, empathize with others' imperfect behavior. Uh, what is more noteworthy about this report is that it does not substantiate serious allegations of misogyny directed at the two council members publically by Mayor Watkins. It is unreasonable okay, and clearly subjective to ignore You're taking an your time from your fellow residents here at this point. I'm gonna go ahead and ask that you other council stop. members. Your time is up, please stop. Would put it okay, mildly. I'll go ahead and ask, Perhaps you've been warned you if you're gonna not stop, Cronin I'm gonna go ahead and ask our Sergeant of Jobs. I came here an hour and a half ago and I got in line when you said we had two minutes. Your time is up and respect for the council policy to honor Yom Kippur. Please Steve, if you wouldn't mind, I would ask that you please go ahead and We'll go ahead and ask that you exit at this time. Okay. We, um, we're gonna go ahead and resume uh, public comment. I'm gonna go ahead and say, we're gonna need to have this finished up with about five minutes before 6 p.m. So if we aren't able to get to everybody, that is um, not the intention. If we have extra time at oral communications, which we have to have before 6.30 p.m., then we'll go ahead and allow for you to speak to us at that time. But I'm trying to honor our council policy to honor Yom Kippur, and we have to have it completed. So we'll go ahead and hit, as soon as we hit, uh, 555, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up public comment. Go ahead, you'll have one minute. Um, it was my understanding that time was dropped. Wait a minute, this is not on my time. The, the mic, clock please. said one minute. I thought I had a minute and a half. No, we were into one minute, so others can speak. Has go it been right dropped ahead. to one minute? Yes. Cut the time down. I didn't know that, okay. In my opinion, and that of many in positions of responsibility, it is the responsibility of the city manager to intervene when there are difficult interactions among staff or between staff and public officials whom he oversees. I do not support censure, but if you believe censure is due, then the city manager who let matters get to this state without intervening, without protecting the back of his staff it is the city manager who should be censored for failing in his responsibility, especially as I said, because his responsibility to his staff and to have a good working environment is not a place where he seems to have ever stepped in. Thank you.
Good afternoon, council members. My name is Rick Longinati. Um, on the 26th of this month, I'm teaching a workshop called Pol Politics and the Art of Communication. I invite you to come. Uh, my last workshop, one of the council members came. Thank you. Um, I, you know, wanting to reconcile is just native to us. We all want that. And we all have the experience of that. And I invite you to think about a time when someone you loved, you know, you and that person got into a really, you know, very angry conflict and you said stuff that you didn't mean and then you went away and then you, when you came back, one person said, you know what, I regret what I said. And then almost immediately the other person says, you know what, and I'm sorry for what I said. You know, that's the experience we, we want to invoke here. Uh, censure doesn't do that. That's just more shaming. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, city leaders. We have a backlog of civic issues, many of which have ended up on the agenda for deliberation in the past, and that's terrific. But what happens when these discussions hit a dead end? They get tabled for a short period, sometimes indefinitely, or so it feels indefinite. But today, here we are, airing the dirty laundry that is HR affairs within the council to the public, less than a month from the last attempt at doing such. It is very disappointing to see how internal affairs within city staff take priority over the real issues and policies that affect us, the folks who subsidize your payroll. What's more is that one of the city leaders who are in favor of this topic of censure has also engaged in unprofessional behavior on this same stage previously. I understand we have our off days, myself included, and it's completely valid to be upset over this collective mudslinging, but failing to acknowledge their own wrongdoing while also trying to ostracize two other council members, in my view, displays an attitude of trying to have it both ways as well as sheer pettiness. What I'm trying to state is that if this censure passes, that either council member Myers acknowledge her table slamming outbursts or also face censure as well in order Your time is up. to to ensure accountability for all council members. Thank, Thank you. you. Next speaker. All right, I thought I had two minutes, but I have one minute, so let me make this short. My earliest memory is my mother on the floor asking me to call the doctor because my stepfather had just hit her. That's my earliest memory. <coughs> so I hear the stuff, believe woman, yes, I'm right there with you. Believe woman, believe victims, believe victims of violence. Here's the thing though, I've only been hearing the Take Back Santa Cruz crowd be responding with that believe woman rhetoric recently, very, very recently. And the same crew back there that applauded fervently at the outraged woman that came up here spoke out against the perceived misogyny, the unsubstantial misogyny, they laughed when another woman out here said that the recall petitioners assaulted her. They laughed. This isn't about believe women. This is clearly not about believe women. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Susie O'Hara and I'd like to reflect on public comment. Dozens of people have addressed the council opposing the censure. Not one person has said these are good men and they did not behave badly. Not one person. What okay, they said pause was, the time, pause what the time. I'm gonna go ahead. We're gonna go ahead. We we will he try. To, we want to hear from everybody whether we agree with them or not. Without disruption, I'm gonna go ahead and ask that you please respect your fellow council colleagues. I would, I would just also say, you know, we've been trying to listen to each other all night, and um, this is one of the people who's come forward. And I think that'd be really respectful if we all remain quiet during when she speaks. Please. What they said was. Bernal, this is your fault. Watkins, this is your fault. Myers, this is your fault. Matthews, this is your fault. Capfall, shame on you for even talking about this. This is a waste of time and money. Shame on you for even considering a censure. So it sounds like everybody who's against the censure um, basically thinks that everybody except for these two council members is responsible for their conduct. All of you, except for those two. So I wanna say I'm not responsible for Drew's behavior. It is not my fault because I'm a white woman. It's not my fault because I'm a, a public servant. It is not my fault. Justin, was it your fault when Chris screamed in your face in the public after you took an opposing vote? Sandy, the same question goes for you. Was it your fault? Okay, so I wanna say is what I want, somebody said, what do we want? I want the victim blaming and shaming to stop. It is retaliatory and abusive. It must stop. It must stop, and that is true for your constituents as well. Go ahead. 
I want to just leave it very much on a personal level. I am part of this community, as you all are, and this whole thing is just tearing through the community. It's tearing families apart. It's tearing friendships apart. This cannot go on. And there has to be a way to come together and heal, for God's sake. Thank you. Okay. Next speaker. My SEIU t-shirt is an artifact. I, it's, it's chance today. I'm not speaking for SEIU. I'm just speaking for myself. Um, I wouldn't want your jobs. Honestly, I'm impressed with all of you. I think you're all good-hearted people. And I think you all behave a lot the same. And I've seen that in the last meeting when there was an attempt to shut down communication one way and there was an attempt to shut down communication another way, one of which I supported and one of which I opposed, but they really weren't very different. And I think that's the main point that I draw from the report, the really well-researched and documented report, which said this behavior is basically what council members do. It happens all the time. Men and women do it to men and women. So thus, all of, the, all of the sexual discrimination charges were not substantiated because there's no sex dis discrimination going on. I am a little bit embarrassed, both for my friends on the council and for my not as much friends on the council by your behavior. Next speaker. Hi, I'm going to attempt to read the rest of Mike Posner's, but I don't know where she en he ended, so what is more no noteworthy about the report is that it does not substantiate serious allegations of misogyny directed at the two council members publicly by M Mayor Watkins. It is unreasonable and clearly subjective to ignore an, ob an objective report and continue to try to punish or shame or reprimand other council members. Unprofessional would put it mildly. Perhaps some of you actually believe that Cronin and Glover are more guilty than indicated in the report. If so, you need to remind yourself of your lack of objectivity and rely instead on a report that you commissioned. It also behooves you to remember that a move to censure will be used as part of a recall effort that will, if successful, serve your political agenda. Whether you are purposefully timing the two together or not, you are responsible for the reasonable public perception that you are inappropriately using the censure process to move your political agenda. While some of the other, some of the people attempting to censure me were also involved in raw politics, the difference was that there was a definable breach of city rules on my part, which an objective party could time identify. Your time is up. We'll go ahead and have um, public comment end after the woman with the hat, and we'll have you all be heard for the last remaining time. So with the hat, you'll be our last speaker. Beverly, they show here. Um, I made a mistake in something I said last week about um, having been a therapist and that people can't do it even when they work together. That's actually was a mistake on my part. I, what I meant to say is it's very difficult even pe for people who want to do something. Um, and, and I have a degree in women's studies. I'm for women. So women need to have a place to have their uh, issues addressed. What happened, what was presented by HR is just more rules. People, there's, there's a conflict going on. It needs to be resolved. There needs to be something coming from HR. What is the channel when a person has an issue? If you have an issue, you need to have it addressed and not have it go on and fester in the community and tear the community apart as this is doing. So I meant to call the HR person and I didn't, but I say that to you all. Please have a way that people can address it instead of tearing the city apart. Thank you. Next speaker. Next speaker. Good evening, Scott Graham. Um, the Rose Report said to have mediation. It didn't say anything about censure. And in the in the uh, spirit of mediation. This censure is actually creating a bigger chasm, whereas mediation is a bridge. So instead of creating this chasm, let's build a bridge. Let, let's uh, have people come together. Even if you don't see eye to eye on everything, which is almost impossible to do with anybody, there's gotta be common ground. There's gotta be somewhere where everybody can see, see things 
the same, and there's gotta be respect. Everybody deserves respect. Uh, uh, you know, Aretha Franklin said respect, you know? And so, in the words of Rodney King, can't we all just get along? <laughs> Uh, I'm not gonna give one whole minute. <clears throat> uh, we who will pay the 29,000 in bills for the Rose Report and its recommendations feel that we should fully understand why these personnel issues were not first handled privately and immediately, but were allowed to fester, as she said, and grow until they became a public spectacle. If the same overzealous attention we see now had been utilized at the very beginning, the public may not have had to be paying $29,000 to resolve issues that should have been addressed earlier and between all of you, not with us. We deserve a full report from the city manager explaining why and how these personnel problems were not controlled and managed in the prescribed methods that already existed. Thank you. Hi, Pat Malo. Um, I just want to say really quick that, um, you know, unfortunately, I think we've reached the point where censure, mediation, any of the things that are on the table are not going to help this situation. Um, I personally don't have a way out of it. Um, all I can really do is acknowledge that, you know, this thing may have started in some ways as political, and for I think every single person involved, everyone in this room has gotten at some degree personal. Um, I don't know how we you know, each take responsibility <coughs> and forgive and move past this point. Um, I hope that it doesn't escalate, but I think that this we're watching it escalate right now. Um, you know, All I can do as an individual in this community is say I'm sorry to everyone. I'm sorry, Susie, I'm sorry, all of you. I'm sorry, everyone, um, but I'm just one person, and um, I plan on living here forever. I plan on doing politics with everyone here forever, and we're all gonna have to live in the same community, you know, if we're lucky enough to be able to stay here. So thank you, and uh, one second, thanks. <laughs> Good afternoon. I've heard talk of a fugue, talk of conspiracy, talk of moving on here this afternoon. I haven't heard anything about accountability, but it's far simpler than that. Allegations have been laid, they've been investigated, and some have been substantiated. None have been determined unfounded. There has also been talk of reconciliation. Censure is a simple public acknowledgement of wrongdoing, nothing more, nothing less. If anyone is sincerely in, is sincere in wanting reconciliation, a public recognition is where it starts. The wrongdoing that was investigated and substantiated was by two council members, not the whole council, not the mayor, and not the city manager. I'm glad that at a minimum people have been heard on the question today, but every time someone says we're in a fugue, that it's all conspiracy, that we need to just move on, they're saying that the allegations, the investigation, and yes, the victims don't matter. Hey, we'll go ahead and ask you please keep your voices down. Next speaker. Crazy. Okay, so I feel like I've been in here. Mm. Pause the time. I'm gonna go ahead and remind the community we've tried to hear from everybody. We're gonna go ahead and listen with respect to the person who's speaking at the podium at this time. Go right ahead. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I've been in here enough times to know that like people will say all sorts of things and have dozens and dozens of really compelling arguments to you know, call this out for what it is. And it really doesn't matter. Like people on the council who are voting have already made their decisions. There's like a very clear cut division between people. So um, we've heard from the community and I think the case is clear, but um, instead I just wanna talk about this little thing. I read this thing in the article a couple months ago in the Sentinel about how um, it's been a GOP tactic and conservative tactic across the country to um, instigate recall effort because uh, conservatives win when there's lower voter turnout, which happens in special election. And um, I think it's clear the censure is like a political tactic to reinforce Next the speaker, recall. Okay, we have one, so Kathy, you'll be our last speaker. Go right ahead. Uh, 
Marilyn Garrett. I've known Chris Crone from the time he was on the city council several, two decades ago. And I feel like Chris Crone and Drew Glover are some of the council members who most represent the public interest and not big developer interest. And it appears there's a lot of money to recall them. And I'm looking into where that's coming from. So yes, I support Chris Crone and Drew Glover. And uh, that's it, thank okay. you. Please lower your sign. I'm going to ask you to please, please lower your sign to not obstruct the view of the person behind you. You'll be our last speaker. So my name is Kathy Agnum. I'm a community member for more than 60 years. I'm city staff for more than 29. <clears throat> I spoke at the last meeting from a city staff point of view, and I had more than 50 city staff thank me. And I was very scared, but I knew I had to say something. Same thing happened tonight, I'm not prepared. I was very touched by what Rabbi Posner was talking about, atonement. And I must say, as city staff, I'm so demoralized at the lack of accountability. That's, it's hard. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah. We'll go ahead and bring the item back up to the council for action and deliberation. I'll just basically say, and then I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Councilmember Brown, that this item to table is just a table. It's to, to bring it back at a future time. And having heard from the community, it felt um, like it was a left open kind of place where we didn't have not only community input or any type of council direction. And it felt it was appropriate to have that take place. And I feel that to have some closure on this will help propel us to move forward in a way that's gonna lead to more healing. Accountability is part of healing. It's part of the restorative process. It's part of the conversation. That's what this is about. We had two council members who felt inclined to bring this item to us for consideration. And I think that it's appropriate for us to hear their item and to hear, their con to consider it. That's um, what we do. And so that's what's before us today. I thank you for being here. I know these conversations are difficult. I'm hopeful we can move forward in the best interest of our community and city, but also in terms of creating a workplace that's free of harassment as well. And so I'll bring it back to the council for hopefully action and deliberation. And we'll go ahead and have to hope, reserve at least about 10 minutes at the end for any oral communications. Councilmember Brown. Yeah, uh, I'd like to make a motion that the city council finds that the evidence for censuring two of its members is inadequate based on the findings of the Rose Report as it relates to procedural order 2-1B of the City of Santa Cruz Fair Workplace Policy which states that a single act shall not constitute disrespectful conduct unless especially severe and egregious. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Councilmember Brown. We have a seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember Crone. I'd like to call the question. Is there a second to the call the question? Second. Okay, all those in favor of calling the question, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay, that passes with Councilmember Matthews voting against. Okay, we'll go ahead and call the question. Any, all those in favor of the motion to not censure Councilmember Crone and Councilmember Glover, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Oh. So that passes with Councilmember Crone, Glover, Brown, and Vice Mayor Cummings voting in support of not moving the item to censure. <clears throat> Mr. Kondati. All right, thank, we'll go ahead and we might need to hear from our city attorney. I'm gonna ask for you to please keep your voices down. We've had an opportunity for, to hear from you. We'll go ahead and ask that you keep your voices down and we can hear from our city attorney. Go ahead. Just wanna remind the council that there's a second action item uh, uh, associated with this agenda item concerning uh, updating APO 21B, uh, Respectful work Workplace Conduct Policy uh, and City Council Policy 25.2. Okay. Um, for your consideration. 
All right, does any, do Councilor Matthews? I'll go ahead and move that part of the recommendation, motion to direct staff to review and update as necessary the APO. I'll also just mention for the interest of the public here that we have already engaged in the conflict resolution process and we have in the course of the afternoon engaged in several unanimous votes and several split votes in which we disagreed civilly. Okay, well, second. we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, second by Vice Mayor Cummings. Any further discussion, Councilmember Glover? Thanks, I just wanted to um, clarify that the staff review and update of the administrative policy will come to the council for authorization before it gets finalized. Yes, it has to. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Okay, so um, that concludes this item. I think at minimum we deserve to hear where the council stood on this, and I appreciate the motion coming forward one way or the other. We need to have some of these moved aside. Councilmember, Ma I mean, um, City Manager Bernal. I just want to clarify, the, the council policy will come back to you. The APO is an administrative procedure, mm -hmm. so that technically doesn't right. come back to you, but it, they're linked, so obviously you'll, you'll see the correlation there. Okay, Councilmember Glover. Thank you. Um, so thank you everyone for coming out tonight to speak. I really appreciate everyone, but especially uh, Rabbi Posner and, the suggestions around there. So, you know, I was just thinking about it and uh, I think it's important, uh, especially an observation of Yom Kippur to offer my deep apology to anyone, male or female, that I may have inadvertently or unintentionally hurt through disagreements or various interactions um, as a person that advocates for mediated conflict reconciliation and someone has been asking for it for months. I'm really happy that we were able to close this chapter of what's been going on in the council and hopefully move forward together to not only build the relationships and come closer together as a team, but also to be able to more effectively use our time to serve the community and especially address some of the prevalent issues that we face like homelessness, affordable housing and other kinds of things. So I extend uh, my hand to my council fellow council members as well as to staff and other council or community members so that we can meet, uh, combine our efforts and figure out how we can move forward to a more prosperous future for everyone. So we'll go ahead and conclude this item. Now is the time for oral communications. I'm wondering who here is uh, to present to the council on items not on today's agenda. That's for items not on today's agenda. Okay, if you could please line up to my left. And if we have additional time and others who are here to speak on this item that didn't get to speak, we'd be happy to entertain that until 6.30. I'd like to do, well, let's see if, we'll just do the two minutes, yeah. Okay, we'll go ahead and ask you to keep your voices down as you exit the chambers, and we'll ask you to come forward if you're here to speak on today's items that are not on today's agenda. And you'll have, let's do 90 seconds to be on the safe side to try to get through everybody. Good. Okay. Thank you. We'll go ahead. If you're not prepared, we're going to go ahead and ask that you, if you could, keep your voices down as you exit the chamber so that we can have oral communications begin. If I could have you keep your voices down as you exit the chamber so we can have oral communications begin. I'm going to say it one more time. If you could, please keep your voices down as you exit the chamber so we can have oral communications again as we have to conclude our meeting by 6.30 p.m. You'll have 90 seconds. Please go ahead. Hard to hear you. What did you say? You have 90 seconds. Go right ahead. Oral communications items not on today's agenda. Okay. How much time? Oh, 90 seconds. Uh, Marilyn Garrett and... Go ahead and please keep your voices down as you exit to respect those that are here to speak us at oral communications. And everybody in the chambers, please keep your voices down to respect the person here who is wanting to speak to us at oral communications. You'll have 90 seconds. Those who want to speak to us, light up to my left. Go ahead and close the doors. Okay, go right ahead. Okay. I'm looking at the sign, housing is a human right, health is a human right, and the right not to be microwave. Uh, I'm going to pass out these half-page flyers. The picture on here is near where I live, Freedom Boulevard and Redwood Heights Road. It's a picture of a Verizon 4G antenna that is emitting 
radiation that is known to have severe biological effects. And you've been provided with the data on the adverse health effects. A promotional I saw by Verizon and AT&T showed that they just come and put their 5G devices on these poles and on your city light standards everywhere. What is going on with the 4G is a precursor to the 5G. I gave you copies of the documentary called 5G Apocalypse, The Extinction Event. And thank you, Sandy Brown, I know you viewed that. It starts out, it's important to understand uh, what the 5G is doing and what they say it's doing. We're told, now this is off. You go ahead. Talk. No, it's on. We're told on the IEEE beam forming document that this technology cooks your eyes like eggs in World War II. We all need to understand these are military weapons. Your time is up. And we We're, need to stop it. Your time is up. I have a hard stop time at 6.30. I'm gonna go ahead and have one minute so we can hopefully get to everybody. Go right ahead. Hello. We are volunteers at CRI Cobb Research Institute, a nonprofit all volunteer organization that has existed since 2008, working with universities and professional labs testing the physical properties of Cobb, also known as sculpted adobe, and developed a safe, modern Cobb building code that meets current seismic and thermal requirements. The Cobb building code provides us with an option to build our homes with Cobb, which is durable, lasts centuries, is affordable, is non toxic, and does not place a burden on the environment, doesn't burn in a fire, and would not be destroyed by an earthquake. This October 23rd through 30th, U.S. building officials will gather in Las Vegas for the ICC public <laughs> comment hearings to vote on proposals for ICC's 2021 International Model Building Codes. This important vote will decide if CRI's efforts to include Cobb in the 2021 International Residential Code will succeed. The list of supporters includes elected and appointed officials, chief building officials, building officials. Thank you. Your time is up. Next speaker. The list of supporters include elected and appointed officials, chief building officials, building officials, architects, fire experts, and other professionals from different jurisdictions. Specifically, we have found strong support amongst those who are wildfire vulnerable, destroyed by and damaged by uh, communities. Many communities already using CUB building code, including New Zealand, Australia, New Mexico, Arizona, England, Germany, and France. There are CUB structures all over the world that were built and still function after hundreds and thousands of years. We ask that each council member individually support the CUB code and that the council collectively vote to support it. We ask also that the council instruct the Santa Cruz building official to support the CUB building code. We request that you review the information we have provided you and uh, contact CRI to express your support. Next speaker. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm here to thank you for supporting the Climate Strike Week. And particularly, the police did a wonderful job of expediting the marches. I'd like to very quickly show you this uh, quilt that was produced by the children. Um, the kids get it and we deserve it, and they deserve the most, the best action we can possibly put into this. Tiffany Wise West is doing a good job. She needs thorough support from you all. Um, we have been collecting signatures only since the 20th, and we got 465 signatures from people around the county in support of um, zero carbon by 2030, reduce vehicle emissions, limit single-use plastic, facilitate food waste reduction and other steps as needed. There is huge public support. Thank you. Next speaker, please. <laughs> 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 
Hi, my name is Jessica Chewiden Ingersoll. Um, I'm here to inform the council about the reality of retaliatory evictions and rent increases facing tenants here and all over the state due to AB 1482. While this bill is promising, there are many tenants who have received no cause evictions or rent increases during this gap period where landlords are aware of new protections, but have the unlimited ability to hike up rents or evict before they begin. In fact, around five section eight elderly and dis or disabled tenants in Lower Ocean are currently facing eviction, and they live in one of the last few below market rate complexes in Santa Cruz, and more notices are expected to come. Many of these people have nowhere to go. One tenant's already living in their van. Others are trying to get in touch with homeless services, which are already at capacity. What are we going to do? Clearly, many landlords are urgently acting to get as much profit as possible before these protections go into effect. I ask the council to have similar urgency by considering interim tenant protections to help those who have received or will receive these notices before January of next year. Please, if you can. Please, lo please lower your, excuse me, for the person in the front, please lower your side as to not obstruct the view of the person. If you want to hold it, you're welcome to stand up in the back. If you want to hold it up, you can stand in the back. Go right ahead. You have one. Hello, I'm Ron Williams on behalf of uh, the eviction, uh, lower income, and on housing. I am, uh, I just got to receive an eviction notice. The first was 60 day, now it's a 90 day thing. And I, I'm a senior citizen. I'll be legally blind. They said, uh, about eight months ago, six months, I'd be totally blind. Just that, well, now I got a couple months left, I'll be totally blind, homeless. <laughs> if I fall, my, I could be paralyzed from my back down, my neck down. Also, I found out that also my hearing is going. So what do I do? Where do I, where do I live at? You know, I can't afford nothing. And all of a sudden I got an eviction notice. For what? Because a, complicated, a bunch of people put in to buy some uh, land that has pro uh, problems with it, and they're evicting people that's been there 30 years, me, 10 years, 20 years, senior citizens, and people with handicaps. Where are we supposed to go? Thank you. What is real reform and what is required here? It has to start with the replacement of the city manager and the department heads. Unelected, powerfully paid, unaccountable city officials without oversight and the creation of a regular oversight process. The city attorney also has become a key player. An increasingly authoritarian mayor calls on him for helpful rulings. This is on top of interrupting council members, refusing to recognize others, confuse wavering council members, and if necessary, throwing matters into closed session, which further gags the progressive majority. Council members Cronin and Glover themselves and their allies are not without blame. By not holding public meetings, press conferences, and taking independent action to educate the community, they essentially allow themselves and their constituents to be muzzled. Frivolous recall and censure actions, loud cries of uncivil echo. We need change. Let's do it. Good evening, Council. I just want to congratulate everyone in this city on a wonderful uh, climate strike and the week of uh, climate change awareness activities and the young people especially. I just want to say that right now when we are going through a reconciliation process and understanding, we need to shift our values and the faster, the better. So I just want to say Santa Cruz is a town that is extremely wealthy, one of the most expensive places to live in the world. I heard the fourth most expensive. For example, I would like us to start doing things like partner with cities who are cities of color, cities whose places to live have already gone underwater because of climate change. Uh, like Santa Cruz, we are fighting uh, rising sea levels. Uh, we're pumping out a lot of water, Cynthia said uh, a few times. So I'm just asking that in every single council agenda item that we really look at the impending crisis and how it pertains to that particular item. Thank you.
Hi, uh, my name is Margalita Ezekiel, and I'm a mom, I'm a long-term resident in Santa, I've lived in Santa Cruz since 1982, and I'm also, well, I was until recently when I retired, I was a teacher for 33 years, and I wanna really urge all of you to take the move to, to get to carbon zero by 2030 very seriously as a mom and as a teacher of 33 years worth of students, you know, this is their future and we don't have enough time to waste. We need to move forward boldly and take decisive action. And I wanna see, I wanna see our city council taking the lead and being innovative and being strong and leading the way for other communities. Thank you. Hello, City Council members. My name is Owen Thomas. Um, I'm speaking also in support of the um, tenants uh, who are going to be impacted by um, the slew of evictions um, with the upcoming Assembly Bill that's going to be passed <coughs> on January 1st, providing rent protections and a rent cap. Um, so. I think of city council members, if you're supportive of tenants remaining housed, also if you're supportive of, of you know, folks, of houseless residents as well, or of houselessness as an issue, um, it would be in your interest to pass some form of <coughs> eviction protections and some form of rent cap um, to protect the folks who are um, most vulnerable at this um, like very crucial window. Um, being unhoused during fall is a, potentially disastrous time for anybody. It's getting colder, it's gonna start raining. Um, this is a very, very easy thing that you could all do to um, support a small handful of people. Thank you. Hi everybody, uh, Danny Drysdale, lifelong resident, current city voter. Not here to talk about needles today, despite my really cool t-shirt. Um, actually here also in support of some stopgap tenant protections to get us through until AB 1482 goes into effect. I think we're seeing right now, as much as we can see about the like retaliatory evictions that are happening, there's probably a lot we're not hearing about. Don't have a lot to add, but I will ask that everyone in the room who supports tenants and supports the council passing something around this, please stand up. Yay, thank you. Hi, council members. I'm Cynthia Berger with Santa Cruz Tenants Association. A year or so ago, you sold free land in Scotts Valley for $8 million. And I think that you could have bought that property where those people are living for 500,000 of that, or maybe less. And I think there are other properties in this town, such as possibly the one owned by Joe Gio, who doesn't seem to have any apparent family, um, that you could be negotiating and trying to buy and having in a uh, community land trust. And I don't see, uh, I see your eyes are glazing over, so thank you. Hi, I'm Nancy Crusoe speaking on behalf of the people who are being currently evicted uh, and speaking as one of the elderly who could be in that situation, I would like to see you do something to protect this vulnerable population by next time you meet. That's what we're asking, thanks. My name is Kyle Davenport. I was here to encourage and try to help with solutions for homelessness. Um, I realized that I need to be a part of the solution and that I need to be the solution myself. And I've been trying to figure out what that means. Last night I was reading my AA book and I realized the solution for me, for me to be the solution is in the AA book. And a part of that is the 12 steps, which is making amends. I'm here to make amends with the city of Santa Cruz, an institution which I have abused and uh, when I was drunk. <laughs> and uh, kind of had a grandiose, um, self-righteous attitude against a lot of people, emotional abuse, um, some bullying, bullish behaviors, intimidation, and I, that was me five years ago, and I'm here to commit to this city and all the people, wonderful people here that I'm changing and I'm gonna do better. Um, and uh, that's all I have to say, thank you.
I don't remember the first time I talked to the city council here, but it was more than 30 years ago. I ran out of things to say. I'm humbled by our last speaker. I would like to use the re remainder of my minute for a minute of silence in memory of all of those who've died due to their vulnerability and lack of housing and all those who will in the coming year. And you don't have to say it, Martine. We're saying it. Time's up. Hi, Mayor, Council, Brent Adams of the Warming Center Program. I have super good news. Of course, not one person has to sleep outside on the coldest, wettest nights of the winter. Warming Center Program. Um, what would you do if you were uh, managing a warming center program and people with wheelchairs or people who were terribly smelly couldn't come in uh, to the regular shelter? We actually have a cleaning program. We put a highest priority on people who sleep outside, uh, people with uh, physical mobility challenges and mental health challenges. We go out into the community and bring them in. Uh, I just want you to know that last year, uh, there was only 60 beds at the Salvation Army starting at the season, and finally you, you upped it up, uh, opened the, the Salvation Army in March, and that, and that uh, 60 beds were, was eclipsed by the encampment, so really at a net of zero beds last winter. We doubled down, warming center. Every time you talk about winter shelter impending, we have to talk about warming center. Um, we're all volunteer community supported program. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, City Council. My name is Jeff Howe, and I'm also here in support of the folks at Lower Ocean who are in danger of being evicted. I wanna let you know that you have a whole council uh, full of people who are here in support, and I think that that's a sign that this is a part of a much bigger issue that needs to be addressed in Santa Cruz. Um, it's come up time and time again. Um, sounds like that it's time for you to step in, especially in this situation where folks are in danger of being houseless in as someone has said, one of the worst times of the year when it is cold, when um, people are unfortunately suffering in the in the weather. Um, and yeah, so please step in, do something. Um, don't add more folks outside who have to rely on services like the one we just heard about. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, Council. My name is Tao. I think when it comes to housing, we talk a lot about housing providers and good landlords, but um, a person's livelihood, whether or not they're going to be living on the streets tonight, should not be dependent on a single person. You have to pass some kind of policy because before this AB uh, 1482 is passed, a lot of landlords are going to find that as an opportunity to raise rents to evict people to profit, and that's just the reality of the situation. So do like you did back in February, I forgot what year, 2018, and pass some protections right now before you know the homelessness issue gets even worse than it already is. Thank you, our last speaker. So um, that concludes oral communications, Councilmember Glover. Thank you. Um, so appreciate everyone coming out. I'm really disconcerted about uh, some of the stuff we were just hearing about with the evictions taking places separately with some of our most vulnerable community members, both fa facing uh, age and uh, physical um, uh, disability issues. So uh, I would make the motion that we prioritize an action item on the next meeting agenda to address emergency tenant protections. Second. <laughs> Seconded by Councilor Cohn. Mr. Condotti. <clears throat> yes, uh, Councilmember Glover uh, spoke with me before making the motion during the oral communications. Uh, pertinent uh, provision of the Brown Act states, no action or discussion shall be taken on any item not appearing on the posted agenda, except that members of the legislative body or its staff may briefly respond to statements or questions made. Uh, 
Uh, questions posed by persons exercising their public testimony rights under section 54954.3. That's what just happened. Uh, in addition, on their own initiative or in response to questions posed by the members of the public, um, a member of the legislative body or the body itself subject to rules uh, or procedures of the legislative body may provide a reference to staff uh, or other resources for factual information, request staff to report back to the body at a subsequent meeting concerning any matter, or take action to direct staff to place a matter of business on a future agenda. So we can't talk about the content, but this was That's brought right. up. I have a question for you, Mr. Condotti. Yes. One of the things that was also a motion to table was a second reading of just cause evictions. Can I ask for clarification as to whether or not that's the direction that this would be, or is this a new potential uh, directed item that would come forward in a different direction? Maybe that would be so, a clarification. Uh, good for question. As I recall, um, there was a motion to table the just cause eviction item. Uh, I think that could be seen as an opportunity to uh, place that back on the agenda because it sounds like that's the sort of thing that council member uh, Glover might have in mind. Uh, can I respond to that? Yeah. Uh, uh, my interest is in the uh, protection of the people that just came up to speak about their, in, uh, their imminent removal from their places of housing and with no other place to go that are going to end up sleeping on the streets of Santa Cruz. So we're, whatever that it may be, I think it should be a broad agenda topic of exploring all of our options around emergency tenant protections to ensure that we limit or uh, eliminate the displacement of our low income community members, especially in reaction or in retaliation to the potential passing of the uh, state legislation. So it could potentially include that if that's what it includes. Is that correct? I, I believe it could. Okay. Based on the, the statement that was just made, yeah. Okay, Councilmember Crum, without discussing the item in detail. Very, very nice try, Mayor. Um, I would. Um, my second was only about the tenant protection, of, uh, the issue on Bixby Street, and that that's a very narrow focus that this council needs to take it up. And that's what I was seconding. I don't know if that's what the motion was. That was not the motion. Well, mine was to address uh, emergency tenant protections, whatever those might be. So uh, I would imagine that the situation on Bixby Street is not unique <coughs> to Bixby Street and that there are other tenants in the community that are potentially facing the same uh, threat of being displaced. So I'm not saying that one way or another what we should bring back, what we shouldn't bring back. I think that we should have an actionable item on the next agenda so that at least within the next two weeks, we can do our own due diligence and then come back with some ideas on some tangible solutions solutions to prevent displacement. Is that, are you still seconding that motion? I'm gonna withdraw my motion, my second. You're withdrawing the second. Okay, so we have a motion, is there a second? There's no second, okay, so that motion will die. We'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting at this time. <laughs> Welcome to my life, everyone. It's a trap to justify and try to protect people. I don't care if it's a trap, come and get me. Like, I'm here to protect the constituents that we were voted to protect. Thank you.